Geoffrey Moore says and I quote without data you're blind and deaf right in the middle of freeway sounds intense right so is the potential of data these days every ad you watch on your mobile devices every stock you invest in every recommendation you get on your next travel plan is made by going through your past data the data trails you left behind while making on online booking browsing or your activity on social media hence your suggestion is decided by data crunching tools and ai to assist you make a better call this procedure is called the data driven decision making today the it industry has a great demand for professionals with skills to handle and analyze data to carry out data driven decision making one of the most important of all the skills is microsoft excel today we from simply learn bring you this full course on microsoft excel we have curated this full course in collaboration with real time industry experts and organized the syllabus to help you get the right skills to match the current industry standards we will start with a brief introduction on the microsoft excel proceeding ahead we'll walk you through the basics of microsoft excel where we'll cover spreadsheet fundamentals data sorting and filtering data validation conditional formatting and other preliminary technicalities around excel up next we'll walk you through the basic inbuilt functions that will assist you to carry the day to day operations on data and then we'll dive into the advanced excel concepts that will cover excel vba and macros data analysis and data visualization this tutorial will also include time series analysis some of the top trending data analysis projects using microsoft excel to help you build a strong portfolio of data analysis and then we'll also cover most frequently asked data and business analyst interview questions based on microsoft excel so without any further ado let's get started what is microsoft excel so Microsoft Excel is a software product designed and developed by Microsoft for storing data in an organized way, that is rows and columns. And Microsoft Excel is also capable to manipulate data through some mathematical operations. Followed by that, Microsoft Excel is also used to extract the insights from the data and represent it in the form of visually appealing graphs and charts. Now we have a basic understanding or an overview of what a Microsoft Excel software product is. Now moving ahead we will understand the fundamentals of Microsoft Excel. So following are some fundamentals that you need to know before getting started with Microsoft Excel. So basically when you install the Microsoft Office in your computer you will have various Microsoft products out of which Microsoft Excel is one of the products. So we will be dealing exactly with that particular product that is Microsoft Excel. So when you get started with Microsoft Excel, this is what you will see in the first page. So this particular page is called as Microsoft Excel homepage, where you will be having various varieties of sheets. Microsoft Excel will give you some suggestions based on the type of sheet you want to work with. We will see this in a better way through the practical session. So once you get started with the sheet, you will have some more options. So this particular option is called as the toolbar menu. You will have the file, home, insert, draw, page layout, formulas, data, review, view and help. So these are the tools that you will be using to work on your data using Microsoft Excel. Furthermore, we have a toolbar ribbon. So when you select some or the other option from the file, home, insert, draw, page layout, formulas, data, review, view and help buttons, you will have a ribbon. So for example, you can see that I have selected the home tool here. So when I press on the home tool, this is the ribbon which Microsoft Excel gives me. So this ribbon has some options in it which can perform various operations. Now in a further more detailed way, we will have toolbar groups. So when you see in the previous slide, we have a complete toolbar ribbon. So this particular ribbon is segmented into groups. So you can see the first group as paste, cut, copy, format, painter, etc, etc. And the second group is the font the size of the font and to increase the size of the font to decrease the size of the font bold italic underline etc etc and here you can see the text alignment so each and every group has separate functions so each set is called as a group and i think you can see a small arrow option over here so this arrow option is used into the toolbar groups when the group is not able to fit all the operations or all the functionalities in one single provided section. So when you click on this particular arrow mark, you will have another dialog box. So this is called toolbar more options. So you can see that when I clicked on this icon, you can see a new dialog box which opens me 
a new set of operations which are not able to be fit in this particular group. So we will also see more about this in a better way in the practical session. Now moving forward, we have cell and address. So when you open a Microsoft Excel sheet, you can find boxes. So each and every box is named as a cell and each cell has its own address. For example, the highlighted cell over here has an address B3. So B is the column name and 3 is the row name. And apart from that, you can have the sheet tracker in the bottom left corner of the Excel sheet where you can navigate through different sheets. And in the bottom right corner, you have an option of increasing or decreasing the sheet size. So these are the basic fundamentals of Microsoft Excel that you need to keep in mind before getting started. So we will have more on this in the practical session. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. So now we enter the demo inventory in Microsoft Excel. So we will be using Microsoft Excel to create a sheet of the employees in a company. So basically an employee in a company has employee ID, name and designation, salary, etc, etc. So we will be trying to create the same table using Microsoft Excel. But before that, let us understand the fundamentals of Microsoft Excel through the practical demo first. So I have started my Microsoft Excel and this is how the home page of Microsoft Excel looks like. So you have a blank workbook over here. If you want to create a new workbook, you can select new option. So Excel will provide you with various variety of sheets. You can see money in Excel, adjustable meeting agenda, streaming show list, small business cash flow, and many more. If you're not able to find what you're looking for, then you always have an option of selecting the particular type of sheet what you're looking for. So you have various options. If it's business, if it's personal, if it's planners and trackers, lists, budgets, charts, etc., etc. So let's imagine that you wanted something from business. So just by clicking at business option, the Excel will load a variety of sheets related to business options. So this might take a while. So you can see that the Excel is loading few types of sheets. So you can see that Excel has provided us with some online varieties of sheets. For example, any calendar, business expenses, channel marketing budget, budget summary report, blue product list, etc, etc. You can see construction proposal, invoice, you name it, Excel has got it. So Excel will provide you with some variety of options based on your requirement. Now for this session, let's get started with a blank workbook, which looks something like this. Since this tutorial is based on the fundamentals, we'll go with the blank workbook. Now over here, you can see the toolbar that we discussed earlier that has the file, home, insert, draw, page layout, formulas, data, review, view, and help. So this is the toolbar and under the toolbar, I have selected home and you can see this is the particular ribbon what we discussed about. This particular ribbon belongs to home page. And when you select file option, you'll get back to home. And if you select insert option, you'll have another different ribbon with different groups, etc, etc. So every particular tool has different ribbons in them. And remember the extra options that we discussed when you press over this arrow key, this is it. So when you press the arrow key, you'll have few more settings which cannot be fit in this particular section of groups. So you can have some variety of options over here of changing the font, changing some effects to the text, font size and font style, etc, etc. Apart from this, we have also discussed about the cells in every sheet. So this particular cell has an address. So you can see the address over here, which is B3. So B happens to be the column name and 3 happens to be the row name. Now we also had a discussion about the sheet tracker. Right now we just have one sheet. If you want multiple sheets, you can just feel free to select on the plus option, which will always create you some extra sheets. And you can navigate through sheets just by pressing on the sheet name. And when you get back to the bottom right corner, you have an option of increasing and decreasing the cell size or the sheet size. Now let's keep it default with 100%. Now these are the few fundamentals that you need to keep in mind before getting started with Microsoft Excel. Now that we know the fundamentals of Microsoft Excel, let's get started with a practical session which is about the employees details in a company. Now let's select this particular cell and let's type in employee details. Yeah, we have the cell. Now, an employee details table will have the information related to employees. So, the information will be about name. It will be about employee number. It will be the designation. And 
and uh, maybe salary. And maybe blood group as well. And uh, let's take another one, which is phone number. Yeah. So, so far, so good. And uh, you can see that we have some problem with this particular column. The designation, uh, the name, uh, the, the name of the designation is practically good, but it is not visible. So when you uh, when you're not on that particular cell, you can see that the name is incomplete over here. So you can always fix that. You can just you know manually change the size of the row or cell, or you can also feel free to you know double click on that cell, which will automatically you know set the size of that particular cell. And same goes to the blood group. Just let's try to double click on that, and same goes to phone number. Great. So you can see that the employees details are just confined to the first two cells. It's supposed to be somewhere in the middle, right? So no problem. We can do that as well. We can select all the cells and we have an option of merging them. You can just select this one, which will help you with merging and centering that particular data to the center part. So that's how we do it. Now let's get started by adding the names of the employees. Uh, let's add the names Joe, John, uh, Mary, Mark, Susan, and then Jennifer. Let's type in Mike. Let's type in Tim, Jeff, Jeffrey. Yeah, we have a couple of employees. Now let's type in the employee numbers. Yeah, we have the employee numbers now. Let's type in the designation. Okay, let's choose uh, Joe to be the CEO of the company and John as the software developer. And Mary as tester. Mark and finance. Susan also in finance. And Jennifer in testing. And Mike in uh, marketing. Same goes for Tim. And again, Jeffrey into software development. And uh, Morgan into testing again. Now let's click on a C so that it gets you know resized according to the length of the text. Now it's done. So let's get into salary. Uh, Ten thousand dollars. Fifteen thousand dollars. $19,000. Let's increase the salary of a CEO. So let's keep it one lakh dollars. And finance again, 20,000. So yeah, the salaries are allocated. Again, the blood group.
Yeah, we have the blood groups. Now let's type in the mobile numbers. Yeah, now we have typed in some random mobile numbers as well. So, uh, yeah, this is how you can add in some data into your table. And now, let us imagine that you forgot to add or uh, remove a column. So, let's imagine that we wanted to add a serial number as well, but somehow we forgot to add it. Now, you can always add a new row or column. For example, here we wanted to add a new column. So, we just have to right-click on A, select the Insert option. Here we have a new row now. Now let's type in serial number. And let's type 1. Now can you see the small box option over here? If you just drag it, you can you know copy paste all those over here. And now let's right click and fill series. Now we have the employee number starting from 1 to 10. That's how you do it. And apart from this, you, you can also uh, you know change the font of the entire row you can change the font to say uh, our only and you can always also change the font and same goes to the employee table you can select it bold it and you can also increase the size and again select a color for the text maybe a different color green would be better and uh, you can also select the entire cells and align them to the center looks more good and you can select or double click the row names so you'll have the proper spacing between all the rows and columns so we have double click on the column right yeah so basically that's how you make things happen now let's save this so i'd like to go to the save option and uh, amp data let me save this in my local location and just save it's done so that's how you work on your excel file with some basic data and to learn more don't forget to get subscribed to simply learns youtube channel and don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated so you are the first person to get an update on any technology not just excel now let's get back to the practical mode and now we are on our excel spreadsheet so here we have some text boxes on the column a and on column b we have lower and upper okay so um, we have a mix of uh, uppercase and lowercase in our text so first we'll try to convert them to lowercase and then we'll try to convert the entire text into uppercase so for that you need to press on equal symbol and select the lower formula tab and you selected the function and now click on the cell a3 that's your cell address and press on ok now all the letters are converted to lowercase so we had j in the uppercase which is converted to lowercase now all you can do is drag the formula to all the cells and it will be applied to all the cells right now let's similarly try to convert into uppercase and tap space and there you go you have selected the formula now the cell address press enter and drag the same address i mean drag the same formula to all the cell addresses and there you go all the cells are converted to uppercase now that's how you convert the cells or data in excel to uppercase or lowercase in excel now we are on the excel spreadsheet now here we have some sales data based on a store now what we are going to do is we are going to add some multiple rows or a single row in this particular data. So here you can see the region wise, category wise, state wise, subcategory wise and their sales and quantities, right? Now let us imagine that you must start to add a sale data here, right? So let us imagine that on the row 7th, you were supposed to add some detail, for example, some technology related sale happened on that day and you missed out to add it right so how do you create a new row now so for example if 
multiple sales happened on the same day like three to four and you missed out them so how do i add three to four rows in between the existing data right so don't worry about it it's completely simple all you have to do is select the row and right click and press on the option insert now this will insert one single row if you wanted to add one single uh, row or a uh, you know, tuple and if you wanted to add multiple rows for example you wanted to add three rows all together then it's also simple all you have to do is select three rows and right click and press on insert and then you have three rows so there you go so that's how you add multiple rows in a excel spreadsheet or that's how you add one single row in an excel spreadsheet now we have started our excel worksheet and here you can see we have employee details on our worksheet now all of a sudden uh, you wanted to add employee second name as well or a last name right so you're a beginner and you don't know how to add a column or you know you might be a little ambiguous right so instead of using this simple step you might end up creating a whole new sheet or maybe other approaches as well which are time consuming so let me give you this simple step all you have to do is select the column so here you wanted to add a last name right so b is your column with the first name and here you wanted to add a second name or the last name which is in between the columns b and c so remember that excel adds a column always towards the left side of a column so here if I, if you wanted to add a column next to b then you want to select the column c and right click and select the insert option so that it can be added in between b and c which is adjacent to b so let's look at it right so you have added the next uh, column or a new column right next to the column B and it's in between the designation and employee name now you can add your you know second name so that's how you create a new column in Excel now in case if you wanted to you know create multiple columns all together so uh, here we have or here we needed a second name also here you have a designation and you wanted to add another column which you know assigns managers to the employees right so let's delete it uh, delete the second column and let me explain you how what i want to do so here you wanted to add the second name of the employee and also the manager of these employees right so here you wanted to add two columns all together right uh, and now you might be wondering could i add two columns together uh, or will it work only for the one column thing right no it, it works for two columns and also more than two columns altogether so you wanted to add two columns here right so select the two columns you can you can select or you can click on the column c and hold that left key and drag it along the right side okay so here i have selected two columns and here it's three right so you can see here uh, it's one zero four eight five six seven six r cross 3c that means you have selected three columns if i navigate out of the four you can see we have selected four columns right now right click and select on insert and you'll have four columns in between employee name and designation now you might have to add your second name manager's name manager's employee id you know and the department everything or you can add anything or any number of columns in between the existing columns now we are on our excel spreadsheet now you might want to you know add uh, some extension to your data since we have sales here you might want to add the dollar logo right so if you have like five to ten rows then it's easy but if you have multiple rows then it might be a little time consuming in such scenarios you might want to select the entire column right so how do you do that in a shortest method so there are multiple methods to do it so the easiest one the first and the easiest one is clicking on the column number or column name so here we have the column name that is e and if you click on it the entire column is selected and here we have numbers so let us imagine that you wanted to select the row number two click on number two and you have all the rows i mean the entire row selected all the cells are selected right so this is one way and again there is another way where you can just you know uh, click on the first table header and press control spacebar so the combination key is control spacebar for columns and if you want to select the entire row it is shift spacebar so this is the method two 
and another method so you might have a doubt here right so when you click on the column name or when you click on the row number the entire row or entire column gets selected right and you wanted to select only the cells which have data so we have another way for that so you can select the cell now hold the control and shift key and press the lower arrow key to select the entire column with cells having data so there you go you have selected all the cells in one single column with only data and all the cells which do not have data are not selected same applies to rows as well control shift right arrow key or left arrow key based on your rows and all the rows with data will be selected i mean all the cells in a row are selected not the entire row and uh, coming back to the first question that is adding the dollar symbol so here we have general so go to the data type and add currency so you have rupees here so currently we are in india so we have rupees now what is the advantage of selecting the entire row when you don't have any data in the 57th row or the next cell right i'll show you now let us add the number 100 and press enter there you go let us add another number like 1000 and press enter so the data formatting is automatically applied to all the cells so most of the time your cells or the data sheet will be varying you might have to add or remove elements or numbers right so in such scenarios this will be helpful now comparing two different columns or multiple columns happens to be an important job when you're working in data analytics as you have to come up with some decisive decisions based on the data now if you had to do it manually then you might end up taking hours or even days based on the data set you're working with but if i say that you can do it within minutes then it would be interesting to work with right now we'll be doing the same now we'll work on our sample data set right on my screen so here we have column one and column two now our job is to compare the column one and column two and come up with the result now the first and the simplest way to do it is use the built-in condition formatting which comes with excel by default now all you have to do is select all the data and navigate to home and in the home go to styles group and select conditional formatting and in conditional formatting you can see highlight cells so in that you can use duplicate values when you click on duplicate values a small pop-up window will come on your screen and here you have an option of choosing whether duplicate or unique so duplicate means you're comparing the cells and you can see there are some duplicate cells which are present in column one are also present in column two now you can also check how to uh, you know find out the unique values which are only present in column one but not in column two so you can just press unique and there you go you can find it now you can also try to you know change the color by filling with green for the unique columns and duplicate cells with color red now this was the first method and you can also work out some different ones like uh, you can just directly uh, press equal to and select the cell and equals to and um, the next cell press enter and if there is a match it will give you true if there is no match then it will give you false now you can drag it down and see which all are matching and which all are not now you can also make some minute modifications to this so uh, if in case you didn't find the data then you can say not found so for that uh, you can try if and inside brackets and then you can give the value as not found if true it's found first you have to give the true values so for true you can write it as found and in case if it's not found then you can write it down as not found there you go close the bracket press enter and there you go if there is a perfect match you will have found and if there is no match then you'll get not found now so far we have discussed uh, comparing two cells using conditional formatting and also by using equals to operator and trying to uh, add some tweaks to the equals to operator by involving with if operator and uh, apart from those we also have another way to compare two columns in excel so uh, another way is using the lookup functions so we'll use a simple vlookup function to compare both the cells so for that let's type in equals to we look up tab space and uh, 
select the cell you want to check for and then the range of elements you want to uh, compare and then I'll press F4 to log them. Now uh, you want the data from column 1 and now you want the exact match so 0 press enter. So there you go. So the elements which are present in column 1 and column 2 are being displayed here. So but in case if the elements are not found you'll get an error. So let's look at that. Simply drag the formula to all the cells and there you go. So the elements which are matching will give you the proper result but the ones which are not matching will give you not applicable or error message. This can be fixed. We can make some minor tweaks to the same formula. So uh, we can add if error comma simply write in as not found. and close the bracket so that should do so we have closed the bracket and press enter there you go now simply drag this and soon you can see the data which is having no match is shown as not found now uh, there is another possibility okay let's get back to another different sheet so this should work so uh, we, we already have the formula so let's erase that first I'll erase the whole data and even this one. Yeah, now we have the clear column four. So here you can see we have Ford India and here you can see we have just Ford. And similarly, here you have Mahendra and Mahendra and here you have Mahendra, right? So in some situations, you might have to compare two different columns but the names might be a little different right so for example uh, if you're working with oracle and if you're working with oracle america and you have in the first case as oracle and in the second column as oracle america then those are one and same but you have some minor text changes right just like here you have fort india and here you have fort so what if you had such kind of issues so you can also make some minor tweaks to it so using the same lookup formula, you can add equals to VLOOKUP. And also the comparison cell, which is this one. And you're not, you're not stopping there. You're trying to add the wildcard here. So the wildcard is asterisk, which means if there is anything like uh, if you get the comparison between the first cell and the second cell, which matches and if there is anything extra rather than the actual cell please try to consider it so that's what we're going to do so after entering entering the wildcard symbol you'll select the range of columns which you have to uh, you know fetch the data from and then try to fix them using function key f4 you're looking from the column number one and then you're finding the exact match now you can close it and enter now let's try to drag it there you go so you have the data mahindra and mahindra hyundai india honda india so that's how you try to use uh, comparing cells in excel now you can see i'm on my excel worksheet and i have one table on my worksheet right now so you can, you know, uh, transposing or, you know, converting rows to columns is a very simple task. I'll explain you in two different ways. So the first way, select all the cells that you have on your sheet and press on control C. So it will give you the copy option. And then you can also paste in the same sheet or if you want, you can go to a whole new sheet and select the paste option over here but before selecting the actual paste option you can see a small drop down icon click on that and navigate to paste special and in this you can see transpose option click on that or you know make sure that it's checked and press ok now you can see all your columns are been converted into rows and all your rows are converted into columns so this was the first way and uh, what is the second way you ask me so it's really simple 
select a one cell somewhere and you know you can or let's create a new sheet as well so here you can you know write down the formula as transpose and select the array which you want to transpose so this is the array so transpose is basically an array function in excel so once you are done with you know selecting your data press enter there you go so all your rows are now columns and all your columns are now the rows now on my spreadsheet you can see some data which is the sales data of quarterly basis in the four different zones that is north west south east so you can you know make things look better by hiding these columns and if you hide these columns it's critical for the end user to identify which columns are exactly hidden right to make things a little easier for your end user you can select the columns and then go to the data option and in the data option click on the group option so this will group these columns and you will have the symbol of minimization which will help you hide these columns automatically and unhide these columns automatically now let's also try to group g h i j columns and there you go now similarly let's also try to group the rows of north and rows of west then you have the rows of south and rows of east right now all these rows and columns are been grouped now all you can do is just click on the minimize button and those will be minimized similarly the rows right and to unhide them all you can do is click on the plus icon and they will be unhidden you can also try to ungroup the columns and rows all you have to do is select the columns and click on the ungroup option similarly the rows as well and that's how you can group and ungroup rows and columns in excel now we are on our spreadsheet and you can see i have some sample data on my spreadsheet and it does have some blank rows now how do i eliminate these blank rows so one step is you can you know select the entire row and try to right click and delete it again this sort of method might take hours to get rid of all the blank rows and most of the time you might end up even selecting the rows with data in it right so if i want to select multiple rows then i'll be you know, selecting some rows with data as well which might be a little troublesome in the future now let's try to use the easier way now for that go to the find and select option select the go to special option and in that select the blanks option and press ok now hold control key and press minus key and you will have an option of deleting the cells now select the entire row now we are selecting the entire rows with blank data and press ok and the cells will be shifted now this was simple but let me show you another example so even here we have some blank rows but in between those blank rows for example take cell 17 or cell d17 or row 17 we have some data testing and here in the employee id we have some data in a26 and again in b39 we have some data that is first name right in such scenarios how do i eliminate data so we have a simple logic for it so all we need to do is add another row which is to count the number of cells in the row now that can be count now here equals to the function is count a let's tab and the cells will be from a2 to g2 press enter now you have 7 so now we are basically calculating the number of cells so if you apply the same to the entire uh, data set let's drag it and there you go so there are certain places where you find zero which are basically the empty columns right now let's do some formatting if you need
then let's try to add filters control a control d and now table will have filters and headers now here you can see the drop down icon click on that now instead of select all what you can do is select zero now you will be highlighted with all the rows which do not have any data select all those and press on delete or what you can do is the same way control minus there you go now clear the filter now all you have is the data without any kind of blank rows so all the rows that had some amount of data are retrained and all the data or all the cells or all the rows which do not have any data which are completely blank they have been eliminated so here you can see columns and rows so especially the fourth row and the column c right so uh, currently we have data on our uh, spreadsheet and it is exceeding the number of rows currently visible on our screen right so when you scroll down you can see that the header or the headers of all the columns are getting vanished or scrolled up along with the data right and you might want to keep that so that you'll have reference to every single aspect of or every single cell data you're referring to right so for that reason you might want to freeze this and also you might have a doubt what if uh, even uh, even i had this data in the column section right and what if i had to freeze that and you know when when you scroll this and keep that data uh, set on the column as it is right so we can also do that let's look at both of them so there is a simple process to do that all you have to do is select the cell or uh, for which you want to uh, you know set the or freeze the column adjacent to it or the row adjacent to it right so currently i want to let me expand it so currently i want to freeze this particular row right and this particular column so the cell i would be selecting is the first cell here that is d5 right so when i select this particular cell i can be able to freeze this particular row and this particular column so now you need to navigate to the toolbar and then select the view menu and inside view option you can see there is an option of freeze panes right so click on the drop down so you can see three different options as we discussed earlier we can either choose to freeze an entire row that is the second option or you can freeze the entire column that is the third option or you can freeze both that is the first option right freezing rows and columns so let's select this one and see if our rows and columns are frozen or not right so now let's scroll down and you can see our row is successfully frozen there right and similarly scroll towards right and you can see our column has been successfully frozen right so this is how you freeze rows and columns or you can freeze panes in excel now here on my sheet you can see we have some numbers that is ten dollars or ten point two zero dollars twenty two dollars fifty three point one two dollars twelve dollars and hundred and ten dollars now the task is to convert these numbers into word format that is representing the numbers alphabetically right this might be a little curious and we also might end up searching for a predefined method which is not readily available in excel but there is a way where you can create a function using excel vba or macros now again creating a macro is completely complex now identifying the trouble microsoft has already come up with a readily available macro code on their official website which will support the various versions of microsoft excel starting from Microsoft Excel 365 to all the way up to the older Excel version that is 2010. Now you can scroll down and use this particular macro function which Microsoft has readily made us available and use this to create our own macro in Excel VBA. Now let's get back to Excel and you can create a macro using the developer option. Now developer options will not be readily available in Microsoft Excel to activate developer option go to home and go to the options menu in the last and here go to customize ribbon 
and here in the second drop down menu you can see developer option by default it will not be checked click on the check option to activate developer options and press ok now you have your developer options ready click on developer options click on visual basic and here to insert a new macro click on the insert button click on module and a new macro window is readily available for you now control v to paste your code and your function is with the name number to text right now close the macro and here your function will be readily available equals to and the function name was number to text press tab to select the function and select the cell where you have the data close the function press enter now drag the same formula across all the cells and here you have the text converted from numbers so here we have ten dollars twenty cents and you have ten dollars twenty cents twenty two dollars and no cents fifty three dollars and twelve cents twelve dollars and no cents and hundred and ten dollars with no cents now that's how you can convert numbers to words using the macro which is predefined for excel in the microsoft website so for example uh, let us imagine that you wanted to create one single cell for all the employees in your company which stores the first name second name or last name including their email ids at one place right if you want to do so like let us let us let me show you how it looks like so let me copy this here then that's the first name now it's your second name along with the email id now let us imagine that you wanted to store all the employees in the same way right so you can do this by using combine operation in excel now all it takes is just a simple formula that is equals to and the first cell address that is a2 and you can use an ampersand sign now you can use the next cell reference that is b2 and then colon and the last cell address that is e2 now press enter so when you press enter or tab you will get this particular answer but this data is completely uh, in a state where you can't understand it right the first name last name and the email id has got combined all together so you want to use some spaces right so all you need to do is just make a little modification to this particular existing data so you can press another ampersand and include spaces and then you can separate the email id and the name with some colon so now we have separated the first two cells that is the first name and the last name with a space using the ampersands and then again we have used an ampersand to include the colon and see that we have also included a space between the colon marks that it gets separated cleanly and now let's try to press tab and see the result so there you go the first name and the second name is separated by space and the email id and the complete name is separated by a colon now you can use this to all the cells and there you go all the first name last name and the email ids have been printed here so that's how you use the combine operation in excel and you can see on my screen we have the sales data of one single employee in the month of january okay so this is the sales data of john in january sales now let us imagine that we have the same person's or same john's data of sales of all the three months okay so here we have the sales data of john for january february and march and you wanted to club all these three months and write it down as quarter one right so let us try doing it now you can see that uh, only january is replaced as quarter one and february and march are still uh, remaining the same so let us try to delete them so we have deleted them and i think now it looks like uh, this is the sales data of one single quarter that is quarter one but again quarter one is under column b and anyone who looks at it feels like this data is of january february and march 
and all the quarter one details are only present in v column but c and d are completely you know different from this one right so you don't want that kind of an impression on your uh, you know the one who are presenting to you so in those situations you want to merge all these three columns and make sure that the quarter one is present somewhere in between the cells so that all the data looks relevant and uh, it, it defines that these data elements belong to quarter one right so there is an option in excel to do that so select all the cells that you want to merge and go into home button and in home button get into the alignment group and select merge and center so you can do it directly also you have a couple of more options that is merge and center merge across merge cells and unmerge so we'll go through it one by one so first we'll go through merge and center so there you go the cells got merged and it has been aligned into center now again if your manager or anyone superior to you wants this to be you know independent like they want it to be in terms of january february and march so that they can have access to it in month wise so you want to unmerge it back right how to do that now so the same menu and select unmerge and there you go you have your data back in the original form again all you have to do is you know rename a few cells there you go and you have it back right so in a few situations okay you can also add down the borders so that it looks more relevant now um, you know now let's try to merge this again and merge in center yeah now again uh, let us imagine that you are going through an appraisal cycle and you also wanted to add some comments about the sales happening in your company uh, regarding uh, all the employees right so also we have that here now let me expand a little bit yeah there you go. so again let's merge and center now uh, you wanted to you know uh, you wanted to take a review of your level one level two and level three managers so you have all the three uh, rows here but you can see the cells are not merged and uh, you wanted to merge every single row so merging and centering everything row wise would be a little time consuming i mean three columns is okay but what if you had like uh, you had to take a review from a couple of more managers like five to ten right it, uh, or imagine a, you wanted to write some random comments apart from review you wanted to write some random comments based on month wise uh, sales or something like that so it would be time consuming right so apart from that you have another option where you you know select all the cells and come over here and select the option of merge across and all the cells will be merged all together at once and you will be having those individual rows where you can write down your reviews like review one and so on review two right so this is how the option of merge across works and we already have been through the merge and center and merge is completely similar to merge and center so this is how merge and center merge cells and uh, merge across and unmerge cells in excel work. now there are multiple ways to add date to excel spreadsheet for example equals to today this is a shortcut method and you can enter done you will have today's date but again there is some problem with this kind of approach so today's date is 4th of september 2022 now if you open the same spreadsheet after today that is tomorrow or day after tomorrow then you will have a concurrent date that is 5th of september or 6th of september right the date will always vary or get updated according to time now you don't want to change that or you don't want that to be happening with employee state of joining right it should be stagnant it should not vary right so there is another shortcut way apart from using the date time functions there is a keyboard shortcut where you can add date to excel that is control semicolon so this is the shortcut way to add date to your excel spreadsheet and this particular date will not change this will remain the same constant date throughout the time now there is a chance where you might also have to add time to your spreadsheet that is date of joining and time of joining right so there is another simple shortcut where you can add time by just pressing three keys that is holding control holding shift and pressing semicolon then you'll have the time so this is how you can add 
date to your excel spreadsheet and add a time to your excel spreadsheet and this date and time will remain constant it will not vary like the treaty function that we have used here so you can see on my screen we are on the excel spreadsheet and on my spreadsheet you can see date in column a and a different format in column c d e and f respectively now by default the data type or the data present in the a column will be considered as general and there are a few situations where even if you try to format the date in your format like you know the customized format you may not be able to do it because it's still under the general data type so for that for being on the safer side what we will do is select the data and navigate to the data toolbar and in that you have the text to columns option press that and remember to have the delimited icon you know you might be having the dash as your icon or slash as your icon for the delimited thing and select that and next next and here you can see right it's in general mode so you can press on date and dmi will be your date format that is date month and year now click on finish so it's been formatted now now let's copy the same data and paste it in all the four formats so that we'll see the different formats that we can change to or customize to right so there you go let's expand the columns a little bit now we have day month and year so now you might want to change a couple of things right for example you wanted to change okay let's see the menu so the way is to select the cells and right click and select the format cells option and in here you can see the date function and in here you can see different types of modifications that you can do to your data right so you might want to also change your dates based on the location so right now we are in india and imagine if you wanted to you know change something based on us or if you are if you are having your client in us and he wants the dates in us format you can also change that so here you can see english united states and press on that press ok and you can see it's been changed to us format where you have years in the first place months in the second place and dates in the last place right and now let us imagine that uh, your client does not want the dates all he needs is just months right you can also do that get back to the format sales option go to custom and here instead of uh, you know uh, month date and year you, all you can do is just write down month and year and select ok so you'll have only month and year not the dates now your client is being a little more you know he wants a little more detail and he wants you to add a lot of uh, granularity to your data which includes day time etc everything right so you can also do that so the same way go to format sales custom and here i think it's in date itself so let's navigate a little yeah here so you have the day date month and year press ok so there you go right so that's how you can do it and now let's try a little bit more if we have a few more options pending so go to format cells and custom and you also have timings so here you have date month year and the timings press ok and there we have all the timings as well so since these dates are you know i created them just a few moments ago to keep it simple so i did not have to add the timings here so if you are keen about adding the timings you can also do that for example if you wanted to add the timings of the employees logged in and logged out you can also do that using the same format and you can see now we are on our excel spreadsheet and you can see we have a column of dates and on the column b we have age now how do you calculate the age using the date of birth so this is completely simple all you have to use is the dated if function or if you also call it as date diff function based on your choice we also have a specific entire tutorial based on date diff in excel for further information that video will be linked in the description box below you can go through it or you can use the end screens and i cuts linked to this video to get back to the tutorial based on date diff in excel now let's calculate the age of these dates or these people with these date of births so all you have to do is type equals to and type dated f and open a bracket we need three parameters here that is the date of birth 
that is the first parameter now the second one is the today function because you are calculating the age of these people as per today right so we have a today function in excel press on tab to select it and give a close bracket now comma and if you wanted to calculate the age in terms of days you have to uh, you know give d as the input yeah here it should be d as the input and don't forget to use the double quotes here and if you use the single quotes there might be an error so use double quotes if you want it in the days part you can give days and if you want it in months you can give months for now we want in years so we will be giving y as the third parameter and press enter there you go you have the age here in 26 years you can drag the same function and you have the ages here as you want it right so this is how you calculate age in excel and on my excel spreadsheet let me expand it we have two different timings that is in and out so here we are considering a scenario where we are calculating the total number of hours worked by an employee in an organization so the in time will be the time where the employee logged in and the out time will be the time when the employee logged out so here we have made some minor cell formatting so when you right click on any of the cell you can get back to the formatting cells option and in that option we have selected the am pm so there is also another option of choosing the 24 hour timing that is 13 20 uh, 13 30 so this represents the 24 hour format but since we are you know working on office timings let's keep it as am pm okay so there you go so we have our uh, timings of in and out now to calculate the time difference between the in time and out time so this particular calculation is completely simple all you have to do is press equals to select out time minus select in time so there you go press enter and you have the total number of hours the employee has been working in your organization so here also we have made some minor cell formatting so usually it comes out as am pm right but instead of that we have made a minor cell formatting we have navigated into time and we have selected the 24 hour formatting so that we have just hours in our output so that's how we have calculated the time difference between two in times and out times of an employee using excel now dax in excel is a sophisticated formulas type language that comes in handy while working with relational data and extracting information via dynamic aggregation functions dax in excel stands for data analysis expressions dax functions are completely familiar to the general and default functions that are available in excel now DAX allows users to perform slightly escalated and advanced and custom calculations upon various data types like character data, date time, time intelligence functions and many more. And in DAX, there are a variety of functions such as DAX table valued functions, DAX filter functions, DAX aggregation functions, time intelligence functions, date and time, information time, logical, parent and many more. Now in today's session, we will look into one such type of DAX function in Excel, that is DAX date and time function in Excel. Now without further ado, let's get into practical mode. And we have started our Microsoft Excel. Inside Excel, we have opened a new blank worksheet. Now navigate to data option in the toolbar and in that go to the power pivot window now we have entered the power pivot window and inside that you can see the option of get external data click on that and you can see a variety of options that is you can get the external data from a database you can get from web servers that is from data service and you have also other forms of data sources and existing connections for now we will take other forms of data that is a microsoft excel data which is in our local system select next now provide the location of your folder just browse and we will select dax employee data open and there you go we have our data connected to our power pivot window click on next and there you go you have the selected table and views click finish and you can see the data getting imported into your power pivot window there you go by default if you want to add any DAX related functions 
into your Power Pivot window, you'll have an external added column over here, which looks something like this. If there is not an external column, you can also add the column. It's not a big trouble. Now we have some data here. That is the employee ID, employee name, designation of the employee, department of the employee, salary, and joining date, etc. Right, let's expand this view and see what's in, what's more in it. So this column is the date of birth and this column is the employee joining date. Right. Now we have so much of data. Now let us imagine that we want to calculate the retirement age of all the employees. So now let's rename the column to retirement date. So we have our new column that is retirement date. Now we will make use of DAX date time functions to calculate the age and find out the exact retirement date of that particular employee. So let us imagine that every employee will retire after the age of 65. So we have our date of birth of every employee and the joining date of every employee. Now we'll come up with a DAX date and time function and calculate the age and then we will find the retirement date of that employee. Now every DAX function starts with the same method or the same way as the simple Excel default method starts that is by starting with an equals to and then we will find E date. E date and And now our first parameter that is the start date that is the employee uh, the date where the employee joined the organization so our sheet name is sheet one now our joining date is in the f7 column select f7 press tab to select it and comma now how many months so each and every year will have 12 months so 12 months into the age that is 65 star 65 and now you can close the uh, function and press enter and then you'll find the retirement date of that particular employee so there you go so we have the employee dates that is employee retirement date for all the employees so the first one that is Jack has the retirement date of 19 February 2085 and similarly Jennifer has her retirement date at 15th of August 2084 so that's how we use the DAX functions in Excel. So this is one of the several DAX functions in Excel that is DAX date and time functions in Excel. So you can see that I've got some data which is first name of the employee, last name of the employee and phone number. And let us assume that uh, your manager has given you a task to identify all those uh, employees which did not give a phone number. So you wanted to identify them using a checkbox, right? Like you will be providing a check for all the employees that we have received the phone numbers and you will not be checking the employees which did not give the phone number, right? So let's try to do that. So to include a checkbox, you might want to get into the developer option. But for a few reasons, Microsoft has disabled developer option by default. To enable developer option, all you have to do is just navigate anywhere on the ribbon here and right click and then you can see customize the ribbon option when you click into it you will be redirected into the ribbon option and here you can see the developer option on the right side right this one so by default you can see that your developer option is not enabled to enable it you have to check in it and there you go you have it now so press ok and you'll have the developer option now go to the developer option and select the insert option and there you can see the checkbox now draw the checkbox anywhere i'll draw it over here and there you go you have the first checkbox right now if you want you can even customize this so carefully click it can edit the text and write it as done okay. 
Now you can even copy this to all the cells. Just select and drag and there you go. Now you can go ahead and check all the employees which you have received the phone numbers and you can eliminate the ones which did not provide you with the phone numbers. That's how you can do it. And there's also another option where you can use this to include it in a formula. Since this data is only of 25 rows, you can manually check in the data and you can leave the data which is you have not received. But what if you had 2500, right? Then you might need formula. So in such scenarios, you can use a formula. So how do you use that? So for example, uh, if this particular box is checked, then you will get a true value here. And if it's not checked, you will have a false value. Then you can use that Boolean value to include in your formula, right? Sounds interesting. Now let's try to implement that. You can right click the cell and you can find format control. Then you can see here, you have an option called cell link. Here, select the cell link. And press OK. So here you can see, if you have checked this, the value is true. And if you uncheck this, you can see the value turned false. Now you can use this particular cell reference for including this in a formula. Now let us also check how to include checkboxes on Google Sheets. In Google Sheet, it's really simple. All you have to do is get into the insert option and you can see a readily available checkbox. You don't have to use any developer options over here. And there you go. You can just check. And now let us assume that you're giving an important presentation and you're also requested by your manager to add the Excel document that you have used to create that particular report, which would be something like this. When you click on it, it will open a new Excel document or Excel window with all the data in it, right? So how do we do that? Let's look at the demo. Now let's have a blank slide and let's get back to the source where our Excel file is located. That is in my documents. So we are currently in my documents and we have the Excel file which we used for creating that particular report. Now, if we copy and try to paste it on our Excel document, it would look something like this. And clearly it's not visible and it's not accessible, right? So instead of this, there is another way where you can directly add the Excel document in the form of logo, which is a rather simple idea. All you have to do is just click on the insert option in the toolbar, then navigate to the text group and here you will find the option called object. Click on the object and it will give you a new window where you can identify which type of document or object you want to add, either create or create from file. So we have the file in our local system. So we'll choose create from file, browse, and from browse, we will go into the documents section where we have our Excel file. Click on the Excel file and click on OK. Now, if you want the data or Excel file to be displayed in the form of an icon, then click on the display as icon section and here you can change the icon. So you can choose any one of the given options. Let's choose this particular one and click on OK. Another OK and there you go. The icon will be now displayed on your Microsoft PowerPoint PPT which is completely clickable as the previous one. Whenever you click on this, the Excel document will be opened. So that's how you add Excel document into Microsoft PowerPoint. Now we are on our Excel spreadsheet and here I'm trying to insert some images onto my spreadsheet. So here we have company logos and company brand names. So since we already have the brand names, so what we need to add here is the brand logos. Okay, so how do I add such kind of an image into an Excel spreadsheet that you might be thinking that Excel spreadsheets are just for data, not multimedia image of files, right? So no, it's not, it's completely wrong. You can also add your images onto your Excel spreadsheets. It's completely simple. So click anywhere on the Excel spreadsheet, navigate to the insert button, select the illustrations option from the add-ins group. Click on that and you know, in the drop down you can see the pictures icon or the pictures uh, button. Click on that. And select 
from this device or if you have an online stock image you can take that or you can also check out from online pictures for now i'll select the device this device and here i have some images the images what we need are simply learn and simply code logos press ok or insert so here you have them now you can also adjust the size of the image using the small buttons here press it over here and done so you might be wondering is it all done is there anything more to do uh, or just adding an image is done no most of the times when you create or you work with excel spreadsheet you will not just you know add some data and uh, add a relevant image to it most of the time you add some graphs or you most of the time you will add some charts uh, to showcase the data dashboard right so it will be something like this so this is how you add the image or graph onto your uh, uh, dashboard and sometimes you might not have enough place to uh, display your entire dashboard during those situations what you do is you try to hide the row or column so now let's try to hide this particular row let us imagine that you wanted to show only uh, two uh, charts and there is no space for your third chart in such scenarios you might want to hide or remove that third chart okay so let's try to hide it and see if gets if it gets hidden or not when you try to hide it you can see the column a has no data and uh, the row number four has been hidden so we have three and five but what about the image it is still present right so if you want to make sure that the row also hides the image then you might have to do a little formatting with it so select the image go to picture format or you can also right click and directly navigate to picture format this opens up a set of options and here you might want to go to the uh, third uh, one which is picture format third and select the properties and here select the option of move and size with cells so when you select this when you try to hide this it will also i mean the graph or the image will also hide along with the row so that's how you do it so how to insert pdf in excel now there are multiple ways to insert a pdf into excel so we will go through a couple of ways first is here let us imagine that we wanted to insert some powerpoint presentation in pdf format into our excel sheet so that it belongs to excel basics now click on the cell where you want to add the pdf or just click any cell in the excel spreadsheet then go to the option of insert in the toolbar then navigate to text option click on it and select object and here you can select create from file and then you can browse and here you have your excel basics pdf in my documents click on that select insert so here you can just press ok and the pdf will be inserted now you can minimize the size of pdf to fit the cell there you go the pdf got successfully inserted into your excel spreadsheet now let's discuss about the second way now the second way is completely same the only difference is you can add some logo to your pdf so you can see it has been added in direct form of a pdf like what's the first slide of the ppt but instead of that if you wanted to highlight it as an icon then you can select the display as icon button here and press ok now you don't have to reformat the size of your ppt or pdf all you have to do is add the logo to your pdf and it will also include the title so this is another way of adding uh, you know pdf to your excel sheet now another way so a few times you don't want the first page of the uh, pdf to be visible or any kind of logo of that pdf reader to be visible on your spreadsheet sometimes all you want is some dedicated image or a dedicated logo right so this time let's try to add a dedicated image to our pdf so go to insert again here you can see the illustrations option click on picture and from this device so i will select the simply Learns logo and now you have to resize the logo a little bit to fit the cell there you go 
you can uh, you know click on the right click button and and select the option of link now uh, select the existing file or web page option so if you are interested to learn more on hyperlink in excel we have a dedicated tutorial on that please go through hyperlinks in excel by simply learn which will explain you everything about hyperlinks in excel how to insert them different types of documents to be inserted and how it works in real time for now let's try to insert the existing web page and uh, go to documents navigate to documents and inside this you have the excel basic pdf click on ok and it has been added to your image so when you click on it it will open the pdf document attached to it so when you hover over to the cell you can see it will ask you a permission do you want to continue or not just click on yes ignore the warning so you can see the pdf has been successfully opened convert pdf into excel now to do this let's get back to the practical mode and try to convert some pdf data into excel now you can see the pdf document which i am looking to convert from pdf to excel so this particular pdf document has a table so this is the state wise gst collections that happened during march of 2020 now we need to convert this tabular data from pdf format to excel format now we are on the microsoft excel now to initiate the process we might want to choose a blank workbook for this so now we are on the blank workbook and the complete sheet is empty. Now let's go into the data option in the toolbar. And in the data option of the toolbar, we have the ribbon of get and transform data. In this ribbon, you can see get data option. Select that and you can see various options here from file, from database, from Azure, from other sources, etc. Now we need the first option that is from file and in that we have a drop down and in that drop down you might want to select the PDF. If you have a JSON file you can also choose from a JSON and if you have the data from XML you can choose that and even you can extract the data from text or CSV as well. Now we need the PDF option so select the PDF. Now navigate where your file is existing. So my file is on the desktop. And now let me select the PDF document, select import. Now Excel will automatically analyze the tabular data in the PDF format and give you the results. Now according to Excel, there are multiple tabular formats, table one, table two. So basically this table is one and the same. So all the 29 states are fixed in one table itself. But since the PDF is divided in sheets, this particular document is considering the first table as a separate table and the table which is present in the third page as a separate table. So we have table 1, table 2 and there are a few more tables which Excel is assuming that it might be table but it's not and another table which is page number 002 it is a table and another one is right here. Now there is an option of selecting all the tables all together at once or you can select only one table which you want to select. So if you select multiple items, Excel will automatically give you an option of choosing your tables. You can just tick and select the tables you want. Or you can directly select the table you want on your Excel sheet. So right now, let's try to select multiple tables. So I'll be selecting 1, 2, 4 and 5. And this particular one is not a table, so I'm eliminating that. Now you might want to choose the load option. So Excel is now loading the data. Now all the data has been successfully loaded. Now, yeah, it is giving us a notification that all the data has been successfully loaded. And now just right click on it and here choose the option load to. And here select table option. And if you want the data to be, uh, you know, loaded to a new worksheet, you can choose that and select OK. Now you can see. All the data is being successfully loaded in the form of tabular format in the new Excel sheet. Similarly, let's try to load another page. In the table format, new worksheet, select OK. And 
and the third sheet. Now get ready to impress your boss by converting all the PDF data into Excel sheet just in a matter of few seconds with few steps. And there you go. All the four tables have been loaded successfully in the form of Excel in just a few steps. Now this is how you convert PDF to Excel. That is how to add tick mark in Excel. Now on my spreadsheet, you can see some employee data. So they've been assigned a task and they want to update the task status as done and not done using symbolic statements. That is tick mark and into marks. Now how to do that? It is really simple. We'll discuss two different ways. The first way is to do it by conditional formatting. So click a cell on the task status, go to conditional formatting, click on the new rule. Yes, of course we can use the icon settings, but we want to automate it. So click on the new rule, right? So here, instead of two color scale, select icon sets. Now go to the settings. Here we don't want the third symbol, so select no cell icon. And here instead of percentage number formula, let's add just a simple number. And the second one as well, just a simple number. Now, in the icon settings, select tick mark. You have various types of them. You know, the circular tick mark. And let's select the generic tick mark without any outer circles. And into here, generic X mark. And now let's set the values. When the value is greater than zero, it will be green. And when the value is less than or equal to zero, it will be X. And the reference value is zero. And here also the reference value is zero. Everything is okay. Click on okay and done. And here you cannot see the logos yet. We need to add some formula here, which is equals to if click on tab to select the symbol. And if cell address C2 is equals to done, then the value should be one else the value should be zero close the bracket enter right now you can see this particular logo here now drag the same formula it's done now you can see we do have numbers you can eliminate those numbers as well just edit the rules and here you can see show icon only click ok and the numbers will be removed also edit the second one and there you go the numbers are gone and only the symbols remain now what is the second technique the second technique is available in the developer options you can activate it by you know uh, going into the options here go to file and here go to options and here go to advanced customized ribbon and in here on the right hand side you will get developer options click on the tick box and it will be enabled now go into developer options and click into insert menu click on the form controls or active x controls select the checkbox and now just place it over here you know you can edit this particular checkbox delete everything drag it as checkbox as well now you can drag the same cell across all the functions and you will have the checkbox as well now you can click on it and say if it's done or not that is how to add watermark to excel now on my sheet you can see some data so here we wanted to add some watermark logo to your uh, excel spreadsheet so that it looks genuine and worked by you right so that's the overall idea of adding a watermark now go to the insert window and in the insert window go to the text option click on that select header and footer once you select header and footer you can see something on your screen like this so in this box which is highlighted by a cursor is where you're going to add the picture on my top in the menu bar you can see header and footer elements in this select the picture element and it will navigate to you to a different option window since we are adding the image from our local system select from file or if you are adding from your bing or any search window you can also add that or onedrive as well but now let's go with from file it will directly navigate you to the pictures folder in your local system so here is my sentilons logo click on it and select insert now you can see the image is added in this format which is ampersand and picture and you might wonder where is the picture it is actually present to view it, click on any cell in the spreadsheet and there you go, you can see it. Now you might be wondering the image is a little towards top and abnormally placed, right? So no worries, you can always, you know, format your picture. Just press enter and use enter 
to move your picture towards the center of your data spreadsheet. And also there is another option of format picture altogether. Here you can adjust the height and width of your image by you know increasing and decreasing width or increasing and decreasing height using the arrow marks also works. And apart from this, there is another option of picture formatting where you can choose your image to be washing out black and white grayscale or anything so currently i'm going with automatic which will automatically adjust the brightness and you know everything for your image it looks perfectly fine so click on ok and there you go right so now this should be fine right now everything is done and everything is automatically saved if you are having that auto save option on your spreadsheet and let's go back to the normal view from the header and footer view click on the view and go to normal you might be confused right where is the logo it vanished did i have to save it no it's already saved everything is fine even the image is there but you cannot see it in normal view to see it click on file click on print then you can see the logo it will be present only on the printed pages not on the normal view okay so that's how you work with uh, watermarks in excel and that's how you can add and customize your watermarks using excel how to modify or increase cell size in excel now most of you might probably want to increase just the cell size or you know just to increase the visibility of the text so one of the easiest way is just to press on the plus icon on the bottom right corner of your excel spreadsheet so this will automatically increase the text size and you can see the text more clearly now apart from that if it's just not that what you want to do you can also modify by hovering over to the line between two columns and right click which will give you the option of format cells or column width so either of these options will help you to maximize or minimize your column width similarly you can apply the same idea for your rows as well so you can either format the cells or modify the row height of your cell and this is another way and another simple way is to just hold that line and drag it so it improves your width of the column and another way is to just hover onto that line and hold it and drag it to improvise or increase your width of the cell and same applies to your row so this is another way so apart from that there is another way that is format cells from this particular option in the home button you can select this and here you have the row height auto fit row height column width auto fit column width for example let us imagine that you wanted to you know just by mistake you uh, you increase the cell size and you wanted to restore it back to the original thing right so you can just click on the auto fit height and click on the auto fit column width there you go it happens in that way and now coming back to another simplest way let us imagine that you are given a lot of data and you are told to auto fit all the rows and columns now we have already seen the format cell option where you will auto fit all the columns and width of the column and also the height of the rows etc right but there is also a keyboard shortcut to do this so all you have to do is select a cell and press ctrl a to select all the cells in the spreadsheet and once all the cells are selected all you have to do is press and hold alt key and then release it then the combination of keys that is h o i so your column width has been now adjusted now the same formula or the same shortcut key with a small modification press and hold and release alt key now h o and a to adjust the row height so this is the way where you can increase or decrease or modify or auto fit all the cells in excel now you can see that we have the first column that is a column and the first set of that is text and all the other cells are numbers but as a whole excel considers the whole column as a general data format so why are we discussing about this so to create a barcode in excel you have to make sure that all the elements in the column are of text data type so the first step is to convert this general data type to text data type so you can do that by going into the data type and selecting text and now all the elements in your first column a are type text 
Now the next step is to convert these elements into barcode. Now for that let's create a new column called barcode. Now our new column that is barcode has been created. Now the next step would be is to check for the barcode font. So the barcode font looks something like this. But let me remind you the barcode font in Excel is not available by default. Don't worry if it's not available, we can download it from open source. So let's go back to Google. So on the Google, you want to search uh, for barcode font for Excel. So the one that I would recommend is three of nine barcode font. Now you can download this font by just clicking on the download button over here. Now I've already downloaded this font on my local system. Let's now try to install that. Now the 3 of 9 barcode folder will come in the form of zip folder. You have to unzip that. And after unzipping you will get the setup file which looks something like this which is 3 of 9 new. Select that and you will be having the installer file over here. You can install by selecting the install button over here. So I have already installed it in my local system so it is readily available for me on my Microsoft Excel. Now we might want to create the barcode for this particular cell in A2. So let's create that. So to create a barcode, we need to write in a formula that is equals to double quotes star double quotes and ampersand symbol address of the cell that is A2 another ampersand symbol again double quotes star symbol and double quotes. So you can either use this or instead of star you can use brackets as well. So let's try brackets now select enter now this will generate another type of code in your resultant cell now we will change the font for this particular resultant cell and we will get our barcode now you can just drag all these cells so that you can apply the formula to all the codes now i got all the codes over here now select all the cells get into the fonts and here select the barcode font and there you go you have the barcode for all the numbers you have in your column A. So that's how you create barcode in Excel. Excel Flash Fill is a feature of Microsoft Excel where Excel can sense a pattern in a cell and apply the same logic to extract the similar resultant pattern out of the remaining cells in a table. Might be a little confusing, right? So let us simplify it. So let us imagine that you have a text in one of the cells in the Excel sheet and you wanted to trim a part of that text. For example, let us imagine that there is an assembly, an assembly where the car parts are assembled together to finish a car. So each and every part has a code, the serial number, the product code, and the assembly code, etc. Right? And you wanted to separate all those three. If you wanted to do that, you might want to use the trim function, which might be a little tedious to apply to all the cells. But what if, if I say there is a simple key format using which you can fill all the columns in the Excel sheet within a fraction of a second. Sounds interesting, right? So that's exactly the flash fill function in Excel does. Now, before we get started, let me tell you guys that we have daily updates on multiple technologies. If you're a tech geek in a continuous hunt for latest technological trends, then consider getting subscribed to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit that bell icon to never miss an update from Simply Learn. Now, without further ado, let's get started with the flash fill in Excel. For that, we might want to start the Excel to get in the practical mode. Now we are on the Microsoft Excel and remember the example we discussed. So this is a similar example. Now the first column in the sheet is the product detail. So this product detail consists of the product code that is 112. Next we have the product serial number that is 1002537. And lastly the assembly code that is A, S and X. Now we want to separate this product detail into three columns where we have the first column to be storing the product code, second one to be storing the product serial number and the last one to be storing the assembly code. So now if you want to do that using trim function you might want to apply the trim function here and trim out the left part and again for the product serial number you might want to use the trim function again which might go into a little complicated pattern. So to avoid the complications and, and decrease the time spent we might want to use the flash fill in Excel. Now let us help Excel about the pattern that we might want to generate. So the pattern is 112 and the next one is 
three two two. So now you can see that the text was highlighted. That was the intimation from the Excel that it understood the pattern. Now going into the next cell and holding the control key and pressing the E button will help us to fill the remaining cells in the column B. So that's how it is done. And similarly, let's try out for the serial number. For that, the serial number is 10025637. Now in the next cell we have one zero zero three six five eight two. Now we can go to the third cell and press Control E for Windows. And if you're using a Mac operating system, then you have to press Command E, and all these serial numbers will be filled. So this will reduce the time in separating the pattern and filling the columns. Now let's try the last column that is A. SX, which happens to the assembly code. Next, we have F, G, and V. Now, the shortcut method that is Control E, and there you go. Now, you might be wondering, will it work only for numbers, etc., etc., or the text which is properly aligned or separated using a hyphen? No, it can also be used for some random text which is like this. So, let us imagine that we have a text which is of length like 20 or 30 and you wanted to print only a part of it. So here I'm going to print the alphabets from position 4th to position 8th. So I've already tried the first one that is taking out the alphabets from 4th location to the 8th location or the pattern of the text that is I, F, E, R from Jennifer Lopez. And in the next cell we have the numbers starting from the location 4 to 8. So that is 7767. 7, 7. And similarly, we have the other cells consisting of the names of few cars, that is Alfa Romeo, Bugatti Veyron, and next we have Superman Returns Text. So now let's press the shortcut key, that is Control E, and make sure that all the remaining cells are filled. So that's how the flash fill works. So the flash fill in Excel will reduce the time consumed to fill all the columns by separating the text in your main cell, that is the column A which we have here in this example and it also reduces the complexity of using a trim function in Excel. There's hyperlinks in Excel. Now hyperlink is something which is clickable and when you click on it, it will redirect you to a different web page, to a different worksheet or a different location in your local system. So there are a variety of options and we will explore all of them using Excel. Now creating a hyperlink is really simple. We have multiple ways. Now let's write some text on the Excel worksheet. I'll write simply long. Now creating a hyperlink is really simple. You have multiple ways. The first simplest shortcut is clicking on the cell where you want to place the hyperlink and holding control key and pressing K. Now this will enable the hyperlink menu box or the dialog box. This is the first way and let me close it. Now again we have selected the cell. There is another option where you have to click on the insert menu on the toolbar and navigate to links group. Click on the link option and you will again have the dialog box of the hyperlink in Excel. And the third way is right click on the cell and you can see the link option in the last. And this will enable the hyperlink option in Excel. Now let's create a hyperlink. The simplest way again, control K. Now we have a variety of options that is existing file or web page, place in this document, create a new document and an email address. So we will address all of these one at each time. So first one, existing file or a web page. Now you can select an existing PDF file or any file in your local system and hyperlink or create a hyperlink to the text or you can select a website a link and place it over here and create it as a hyperlink. Let's uh, explore both the options. First, let's try to explore the web page option. So since I've written as Simply Learn, let's use the website link of Simply Learn and create a hyperlink. Let me open Google. New tab and let me type simplylearn.com. Let me copy the hyperlink. And now let's get back to the Excel workbook. Now here, let's place the hyperlink. Now you can press OK. And there you go. The hyperlink has been successfully created. 
Now this link is clickable. When you click on it, it will redirect you to a new Simply Learns home web page, right? So this is how you create a hyperlink to a website. Now we shall explore another option that is using an existing file, right? Let's create a new text box here. Let's name it as existing file and okay existing file should be good again the same you can either click uh, you know right click and select hyperlink or control k now let's select existing file or web page option now here you can see navigate key press on that and let's navigate our files let's select all files you have remember to select all files okay by default it shows as office files now let's explore our file option so let's select uh, fundamentals of computer programming option which is a PDF file press OK and there you go we have created a hyperlink so when I click on this you can directly navigate to an existing PDF file in your local system and it will be open as a web page click on it and you can see the PDF file now close now another thing when you navigate onto this you'll see the lengthier http uh, address and same happens here right so if you're a little uncomfortable watching this lengthier link you can also edit it you can choose the option of edit hyperlink and see the screen tip option click on it and here you can change the text to display option and write it as click here to know more press ok again press ok and now if you navigate onto it instead of seeing a lengthier hyperlink what you can see is click here to know more okay i think i made a spelling mistake so i think i forgot an e somewhere over here yes click here to know more and press ok right so here you can see click here to know more let's try this again over here so edit edit hyperlink screen tip option and instead of the lengthier text box or hyperlink you can write as click to open notes or PDF click ok and click another OK and you are done. So instead of seeing that lengthier hyperlink, you can see click here to open PDF. Right? So, so far we have explored two options that is existing file and existing web page. Right? Now let's try to explore another option. Again, uh, hyperlink, right click hyperlink, and here you have seen place this in document. Right? So, which is like uh, Okay, let me show this to you instead of telling you. So here, what it is doing is, you have the cell A5. And you want it to refer to A1 or any other cell in the same worksheet. So you can do that, right? So now, for your reference, let me cancel it and let me create a new sheet. And here, navigate me to here, right? Let me write it as navigate me to here okay so now what we will do is so here we will create that navigate link from using the hyperlink option place this in this document you can see the sheet to option and the cell reference is a1 where we have written navigate me to here so when i click this a5 cell okay let me also rename it write it as navigate cell navigating cell right now let's create that control k let me select sheet 2 and the cell address is a1 press ok now what did uh, what what's the change right when you click on this you will be redirected to sheet 2 cell a1 navigate me to here right so this can be like a shortcut when you have multiple sheets like 100 sheets then you can uh, you know have a separate, uh, different column over here and uh, add the navigation address to all those cell links you can just click on that cell 
and go into the different sheet and to the specific cell which you have given the address in our case i have given sheet to address cell a1 right so this is another trick now let's get back to the hyperlink thing again uh control k and another option is create new document so you might have been through you know option of uh, having let's say some cheat sheets or uh, clip on clipboards right so uh, let us imagine that you're working through uh, a huge worksheet and uh, you wanted to you know uh, have a, a track of everything and keep notes updating right so it might be a little complicated to understand so let me show it practically so let me write it down as clipboard or sticky note right okay i think it, this has a hyperlink let us okay this can be used no worries back to a uh, hyperlink option again create new document now here you can create a, a variety of uh, documents right so it can be a text document it can be an excel document it can be a pdf document right for now we'll create a text document okay uh, we'll name it as a uh, tracker dot txt so this should create as a text document and uh, the location can be anything so you can you know uh, take it as a desktop documents download so let me take documents here and select ok so i'll be having this tracker.txt located in the documents folder and uh, you can also choose to edit the document later or edit the document now let us select edit the document now press ok and there you go so you have your text tracker here so let us imagine that we have worked on the excel sheet and we wanted to write down as a sticky note uh, so that we can remember what we have done on the excel sheet so update one and uh, update two now you can close it so it'll ask for a save option save it and done and let us imagine that you did something else and you also updated something else on the sticky note uh, i mean excel sheet and you wanted to update that on your sticky note so click on it and you'll see a minor notice over here from microsoft excel based on potential security concerns you can select yes and you'll be having access to your text document again and write down your update again here update three what you have written right and the latest update what you have and you can save it and close so that's how you keep track of your sticky note and you'll have all your updates right now getting back to the hyperlinks again uh, the last one is email address so you can also try to add uh, okay let us imagine that you're working with a colleague and uh, every time you make an update in your excel sheet or anything and you wanted to send him out an email right so it would be a little time consuming that you open your email and uh, compose something and send it over here but what if you had a uh, one single click and access to the email compose option right that can be done so let us write down email colleague bear me with the spelling so again the control k and hyperlink select email option and you can write down your email which can be anything so you can write down your friend's email address so i'm just writing down some random email here friend at gmail.com and can write the subject about update and press ok this will navigate you to the gmail option or the mailing address options so click on it and you'll have a variety of mailing options outlook office 365 yahoo icloud google etc so you can select any one of those since we have written as gmail.com we'll navigate to gmail and all you have to do is log in you know all the formalities and you're good to go with emailing so let's get this for now so you're you know how to do the rest parts so so far we have uh, you know covered all the hyperlink options in excel that is existing file or a web page place this in the current executing worksheet or document 
creating a new document for your update thing and uh, also including the email right so so far we have covered everything around hyperlink in excel and if you have anything to know more about or if you feel that we have missed out anything important regarding hyperlink in excel you can feel free to let us know round off formula in excel now for this particular tutorial we will be using the student data set now let's get back to the practical mode and start our microsoft excel now we are in the microsoft excel and as you can see on my sheet okay let me expand this so as you can see on my screen we have the data set belonging to students so we have 10 students and every one of them has name roll number class blood group and marks etc and at the end we have the percentage and as you can see we have the percentage in terms of float values and we have a lot of decimal values like eight and above so what if you wanted to just have uh, one or two digits after the actual percentage like 80.6 or 80.66 right it would be a little bit more or good to read right so that's what a round off actually means so now let's work on having rounded off values for the percentage. Now let's create a new column. Let's name it as uh, round off percentage. Great. So to actually perform the round off uh, formula, we do have a predefined method for that. For that, you just have to type in equals to round and there you go. We have round up and a round down. So both of them perform the same operation. Let's select a round up and this is the end column and the row number is 3. So we'll have to press M3 and the number of values after the decimal point. For now, let's select um, 1. And there you go. Press enter and the value should be rounded off. Now, 80.66 is being rounded off to 80.7. Now, when you drag the cell to the all the rows, then you can see all the values will be rounded off. Here you can see 75.16 has been rounded off to 75.2 and 82.33 has been rounded off to 82.4 so we end up with having rounded off so first we will understand what exactly is standard deviation so standard deviation is a calculated square of variance now what is variance okay nothing to worry let us also understand what is variance now the next part variance so what is variance variance is a measure of variability it is calculated by taking the average of squared deviations from the mean. Now, what are deviations? So, slowly you can understand that we are getting into the topic of statistics and graphs. So, uh, before getting deep into it, let's understand what is deviation. So, the deviation is a measure that is used to find the difference between the observed value and the expected value of a variable. In simple terms, deviation is the distance from the center point. So, for example, when you are going through a graph, so you will be expecting some value, right? And if you get some difference that is above or below the expected point, that is called the deviation. What is the difference between the expected point and the obtained point? So, that is the deviation. Now, next is the observed value. So, the observed value is the value that you get in real time, unlike the predicted value. So, now you might be thinking... To calculate standard deviation, we might need a few more parameters and you are exactly right. So to calculate standard deviation in Excel, you need variance and then you need deviation and then you need mean, right? So all these parameters are supposed to be calculated first and then you will be having the final formula to calculate standard deviation. Now that we understood the theoretical and formula based explanation about standard deviation it's time we calculate the standard deviation using one of the most popular business intelligence tool that is microsoft excel so let's get back to the practical mode so now we are on the practical mode and we have some sample data on my screen right now let me expand it a little bit yeah there you go 
So, as discussed before to calculate standard deviation, we might require the mean, variance, deviation and deviation squared and then we can calculate the standard deviation. So, let's go step by step. So, the first one is calculating sum, right? So, to calculate average, we might need sum of all the scores. So, we have the index values that is 1 to 10 and scores of each index value that is 1 to 10, right? Now, let's calculate the sum of all values here. Press tab to select the function, select and drag these cells, press enter and then you have the scores. Now, you want number of indexes. So, clearly you can see we have 10 but still, let's count them. C-O-U-N-T, tab space to select and select the number of cells, press enter and you have count. Now, what's the mean? So, mean is simply the average of all the numbers, right? So, you can either divide the sum by count or you can simply use the average function. So, let's try to use the average function so that we also have an idea of how the average function works. Press tab to select it and select all the cells press enter now you have the average or mean value now we have the mean value and now after finding the mean value we are supposed to find out the deviation so remember the deviation that is the difference between the obtained value and the predicted value right so the obtained value is this one which is here in c2 and the predicted value is this one that is 82.6 that's our mean right according to formula we are supposed to eliminate the value of obtained minus the mean right so select uh, the cell equals to c2 minus the obtained value that is mean now press f4 to freeze the value and now press enter so that you can freeze the value and drag the formula across all the cells now you have the deviation right now the next step is to find the sum of all the deviation numbers so either you can apply the sum formula to all these numbers or you can just drag the cell over here and the formula will be automatically copied. Now similarly the count function to count all the values that is drag it and you will have it over here. Right. Now the next step is to find out the square deviations or the square of the deviations which is really simple. All you have to do is equals to select the cell and uh, see that small hat kind of logo on the number 6, use that, now into 2, press enter, we have the square, similarly drag the same formula across all the cells and you will have your square numbers, similarly drag this summation function over here, so you will have the sum of this and the count number as well, now comes the final formula. Now we have the mean value that is over here. Let's color it. And we have the variation square. Now that is which is this one. Let's color it in a different shape. And we have deviation as well. Let's color it in a different shape. Now we need to find the variance. And after we find the variance, the last step is to count the standard deviation or to calculate the standard deviation so what is the formula to calculate the variance so for variance you need the sum of deviation square divided by total number of values minus one press enter and that's your variance now the standard deviation so the standard deviation is really simple you need to calculate the variance to the power of 0.5 and that's your standard deviation so that's how you calculate standard deviation in excel i hope all the formulas and the explanation was clear so you can see that we have got started with microsoft excel and on the left hand side we have a simple table with all the teams in an it industry starting from it admin testing, development, to client consultant support. We have got everything in this particular table. Now, our main idea is to find out the index of these particular elements. For example, if you wanted to find the index of the element marketing, then how could you do it? So here, let's try to use the match function in Excel. For that, 
we want lookup value and position. So on the right hand side, you can see that I've created two separate columns as lookup value and positions. So in the lookup value column, we will be inserting the value of which you want to find the index. Now, for example, let us consider that we want to find the index value of team marketing. So I'll be writing marketing in this particular lookup value. Now, how to find the index value of the element marketing? For that, we will be using the match function in Excel. Now, after writing the match function, you can see that it is asking for three different parameters. So the first one is the lookup value, second is the lookup array, and lastly, we have match type. So lookup value is the value of which you are trying to find the index, that is marketing this particular cell. So we have selected the lookup value, which is the first one. Next, we have to select the lookup array. That is from which set of elements you want to find the index. So the set of elements are this, IT admin testing, the column which we have created, the A column. Now we have selected the lookup array. And lastly, the match type. Is it you're looking for less than, or is it you're looking for exact match, or is it greater than match? So for now, I want exact match. So I will be selecting the exact match that is zero. Now, there you go. You have the exact index of the element that is five. Now, we have selected all the 10 teams starting from IT1, Admin2, Testing3, Development4, Marketing5. So that's how you find the index of a selected element in Excel. Now, we just have like... 10 elements so we have got the uh, writing of the elements or you know uh, choosing the elements in a easy way but what if if you had like 100 elements right could be a little different okay so let me put it simple now you wanted to find the index value of finance so right now we have marketing and you wanted to type in finance and you missed out a letter a okay now you're not finding the right index to avoid such problems you can always take the help of data validation in excel that is using the list in data validation in excel you can see a small drop down icon here right you can choose that and here you can see all the teams that we have created in the left column right so here i can scroll down and choose the finance and there you go i have the index value Okay, again, we need to copy paste the same match function in Excel over here. Equals to match. Lookup value. Lookup array. And exact match. So there you go. That's how you make use of data validation in Excel and using the list you can comprehend all the list elements in this particular column into the list of data validation and you can choose the team whichever you want to find the index for. So this is how you can make use of match function in Excel or index match function in Excel. To sort data in Excel. So on my spreadsheet, you can see some employee data and on the column F and G, you can see employee date of birth and employee date of joining. For example, you wanted to sort the employee data in the form of earliest joining employee and the latest joining employee, right? That is, who is the employee who joined first to this company and who is the employee who joined last to this company? So for that, you just need to select the column of date. So let's select both the columns and go to home and check or verify if the data type is date or not. So generally the data type will be set to general by default by Excel. So we need to make sure that we have the proper data type, which is state. Now that we have the proper data type, select the entire column and go to the data option. And here select the sort option and in the sort option, select the expand selection, click on sort and here sort by employee date of joining 
and oldest to newest that's what we wanted the oldest employee or the you can also set it to the newest employee to oldest according to your requirement but we'll go to oldest to newest according to the case study right now just click on ok and that should be done so emily who's a manager is the oldest employee who joined the company and chris who's a trainee in it support is the latest employee who joined the company now that's how you sort date in Excel. now on my screen you can see the sales of four quarters from different regions that is east west south north and central now you might want to calculate the sum of sales happened from all the regions in q1 or you might want to calculate the sum of sales happened in one region of all the four quarters that is either you want to calculate the sum of all the regions from quarter one or you might want to calculate the sum of all the quarters in one region right so to do this you have some simple functions in excel so you might say me you have some function etc right for that you might want to go into the you know equals to mode and fetch some option and subtotal or some else you have to select the function from here but what if i tell you that there is one simple easy shortcut where you just have to make one single click and you'll have all the sum right so that seems interesting so on the top in the home bar select home and in on the top right corner you have the editing group in editing group you have aggregation function that is summation so you have different aggregations here some average count numbers maximum minimum more functions here you might want to select the sum and you can get all the summation numbers here so i'll select one cell so the second query where we wanted to calculate the sum of all the sales happened in east region with all the quarters included that is this one c2 to f2 right so let us select g2 and select the auto sum option and here it will automatically select the range for you that is c2 to f2 if you want to change it can also you know change it like minimize the number if you just wanted to calculate the sum of three quarters you can do that so now we want four quarters so select enter and there you go you have all the sales of all the four quarters of east region now if you simply drag it you will have the sum of all the four quarters of all different regions now let us calculate the summation of q1 of all the regions that is this one select auto sum and it will automatically select all the cells for you that is from c2 to c6 right press enter and you'll have the summation similarly you can you know drag it and you have the numbers here of all the q2 sales of all the regions q3 sales of all region and q4 sales of all region now let us try to change the colors if you can have a reference that is it's different it's it's this total sum or right you just have a reference to identify it now similarly to this one as well so that's how you implement auto sum in excel now we are on the excel spreadsheet so you can see that i have five different sheets of the same data so why do we have that so i'll be explaining you how to sort data for multiple parameters so firstly we will try to sort data in the form of numbers right so uh, let us imagine that this data is being shared with you by your manager and he wants you to sort this data based on the salary numbers so he wants you to arrange the data in the form of ascending order or descending order maybe which will help him find the employee with the highest salary right so how could you do that so it's really simple you could sort the entire data just within a few clicks so how would you do that so since you're focusing on salary select any cell from the salary column only right select this particular column and select any cell in the salary column get into the sort and filter options and here select this sort of arrangement you need that is largest to smallest or the smallest to largest since the problem statement was to find the highest salary click on largest to smallest and there you go so you have tony and the designation is senior and he works in it support and he draws the highest salary of 80,000, right? And there's also another one, which is Pepper, and she works for the analytics team. And now, the next sheet. Let's get into the sheet too. 
and this time let us imagine that you wanted to you know uh, arrange or sort the data based on the employee date of joining or date of birth right again if you wanted to arrange the data in which you find the youngest employee or the oldest employee of the organization you can do that click on any cell in the date of birth column and go back to the sort and filter and here you will be seeing the options sort oldest to the newest or the sort the data from newest to the oldest so since we want the oldest employee select oldest to newest and there you go so the oldest employee is alfred who is an associate designation employee and he works in the admin department and he's drawing the salary of twenty five thousand. so that's how you can sort the data when you are trying to sort the data based on date wise so first we try to sort the data on the number wise so you can apply the same for your employee id salary and if there is any possibility you can do that as well and if you want to apply the same sorting based on dates you can do that as well using the sorting function in the same way now let's get back onto the third sheet and here now uh single column wise is perfectly fine there is no issues with that now you wanted to you know uh, let us imagine that you have two columns okay let's eliminate a few columns here maybe we can eliminate the employee id and uh, okay let's keep a few uh, columns so we'll just keep employee name and employee salary okay so here we are trying to demonstrate if you are uh, trying to sort the data using one cell in the column b will it maintain its relationship with the cell a okay uh, that's our query right so let's see i'll go a little detail so let us imagine that you wanted to sort this data based on highest salary okay so when you do that will it also impact the cells in the column a so it will basically impact but just uh, it's a query right any of you viewers might have that query will i uh, if in case if i try to sort the data based on this will it affect the cells on the rest of the data set okay so in basically it will impact so i'll try to you know sort the data based on ascending order so this is the smallest to largest and you can see uh the tony and pepper so since i selected the cell in the column b it also impacted the change on the cells of column a so that's how the sorting works now we'll get to a little advanced uh, sorting techniques so here we try to i mean already we try to sort the data based on numbers based on alphabets based on uh, you know uh date date of birth right so i think we forgot the uh, ascending or uh, you know or sorting based on alphabets let's do that as well select any um, cell in the column a and go to sort and filter try selecting a to z or okay let's try to z to a okay so here you can see the uh, names have been sorted based on the descending order from z to a right so so far we tried on alphabets so far we tried on numbers date of birth and a couple of more things so let's dig a little deeper and try to sort based on colors right so for that you don't uh, you know find that uh, extra setting here in the regular sort and filter so you might want to get into the data option and here you'll find another sort function which is a little advanced so that's how you do it so since we have colored in the cell or column of salary select that salary and we are going with cell value so in the cell values uh, section select the cell color and here on the cell color options you'll have green blue and yellow that's what we have used in our uh, cells so let's keep green in the first position which is on top and press ok now you'll see green has been sorted to the first position now yellow and blue are left out so why is that so because you didn't provide it right so you can do what that as well uh, i mean you can always add uh, the setting to it right select any cell go to sort and add a level and then again select the salary and cell values to cell colors and now the cell color in the second position would be blue and that will be on bottom and they can add another level the same salary the cell values will be cell color and uh, cell yellow will be somewhere in between or bottom okay 
So based on hierarchy, uh, it will be selecting. Press OK. And there you go. So you have cell yellow and blue at the bottom and green at the top position as per your suggestions. Now we are on the last sheet. So here in this last sheet, we are going to, you know, um, dig a little deeper into the advanced sorting methods. So previously, we tried to apply the advanced sorting methods for colors. Now we'll try to apply the advanced sorting methods based on the data set we have here. I mean, the data we have in our data set, right? So select the sort option and let's add a few details, right? So firstly, let's sort the column employee ID, okay? So let's have the smallest to largest or, yeah, now that would be good. Now let's add another level where we will sort. Okay, uh, I think we will sort based on employee name. That would be a little better. So let's try to uh, sort it on employee name here and here will be employee salary. Okay, now the cell values and this would be from A to Z and the salaries will be from the smallest to largest. So basically what we are trying to do is we are trying to sort the employee list based on employee names from A to Z. So the employee's name starting from A to Z will be ordered first and another subset of the sorting will be done based on highest salaries that is smallest to highest. So let us imagine that we have three employees with names starting from A and their salaries are 10,000, 20,000 and 30,000. So how would it sort? So it will sort basically uh, in the alphabetical order first. So first three names will be sorted and then it will also have another condition to sort the data with keeping the lowest salary on top and highest salary in the last, right? So uh, this is how the algorithm works for sorting. Now let's press OK and see the output. So there you go. The names are uh, Alfred and we have the highest salary here, smallest to highest. So this is 25,000. Next we have Banner, Barnes and Ben. So here you might be seeing why we have Ben in the third position despite he has the lowest salary and name starts with B, right? So here it is trying to work based on the alphabets in the order, right? So B, A and B, E. It's not just comparing the first letter, it's also comparing the following letters as well, right? So N comes first, R comes later. So Barnes is pushed to the second position. A comes first and E comes later. So B, A letters are push to the first position and Ben is pushed to the third position. So that's how it works, right? So accordingly, the set for B, A is created here, 35, 40. Next, Ben, 12. And next, you have Bobby, Brian, Brock, Chris, Clark, right? So that's how the data has been organized and sorted based on multiple levels of parameters you provide for sorting. So that's how you use sorting in Excel, slicers and filters in Excel. So slicers in Excel are software filters used along with Excel tables or Excel pivot tables over a large amount of data. Not just filtering out data, but slices also help you with an easy understanding of the information being extracted and displayed on the screen. Now, Microsoft Excel slices are compatible with Windows and Macintosh operating systems. Now, let us understand how to implement slicers in Excel. So for that, we might want to get back to the practical mode, that is starting our Microsoft Excel. Now we are on our Excel sheet and as you can see on my screen, there is some data available on the Excel spreadsheet and this table is not just any table. This table from Microsoft Excel has been converted into an actual table. As you know, by default, Excel considers all the data which has been inserted into the spreadsheet as a database and to implement the slices in Excel, we might want to create or convert the format of database into a normal table. For that, you can select all your data and just press Ctrl T and that will allow you an option called convert the data into table. Now, since this table is already converted as a table, we can directly start implementing or inserting slices into the spreadsheet. Now for that, select all your data. Then go into the insert option and in the insert ribbon, you can see the filters group and in the filters group, select the option called slicer. Now you will be provided with multiple options. 
since we have the columns employee id employee name zone designation department salary employee's date of birth and employee's date of joining so we can choose any of the options available according to our columns and create the slices now let me select the first one that is zone next designation department and let's also select employee name now press ok and there you go we have our slices now let us try to rearrange these slices all you can do is just select and drag them up and done now let us imagine that we want to see or take a look at the employees who are working in the east zone then we have all the information displayed on the screen who are working in the east zone they are jack tony banner fred etc and their department designation etc etc all on one single screen so this really helps you while you're presenting your data in a presentation now for a change let's try to select the department now if your client wants to select the data from only analytics department then you might want to select on the analytics key on the department slicer and there you go you have an employee called luke hobbs who works in the east zone and his department is analytics and his designation is contract based and the salary he is getting is sixty-five thousand. now similarly uh, you can see that we have only selected analytics and your client also wants data from IT support. Now you can see that analytics is gone. But what if you want both analytics and IT support? Then you have an option called select multiple. Then you can select analytics and IT support. And if you want HR, you can also do that. And in the zone, if you want west along with east, then you can do the same east and west. And you have all the employee details. And in the designation, let's try to select uh, senior, trainee. Okay, select multiple, senior, trainee, and manager. So that's how you do it. So that's how it's done, and that's how you implement slicers in Excel to simplify the filtering options using slicers during a presentation. It is really simple to add filters in Excel. So we are on a practical mode right now. So on my screen, you can see an Excel spreadsheet of sales data. So here you have various columns, regions, category, state, subcategory, sales, quantity, and much more, right? So now let us imagine that we want to add filters on the region part. So we have south, west, east, etc., right? So we want to, you know, let us imagine that you want to extract the data of only west region and you wanted a filter. So doing it manually could take a lot of time. So using filters will be helpful. Now select one cell on the headers part and select the filter option in the data toolbar you can see the data option in the toolbar right so click on the data option and navigate to sort and filter uh, group and in that select the option of filter now you can see the filters are been added to all the column headers region category state subcategory sales quantity right now we wanted the west category so when you see or when you click on the drop down icon you can see all the options are selected right the central east west south every everything right but now we just want west one so click on west and select okay there you go so you have everything from the west region now let's imagine that you wanted to look into uh, office supplies only or technology only right you can do the same with uh, technology and press okay and now you'll have all the technology related sales in the west region right so that's how you use filters in excel or that's how you add filters in excel yes. goal sake in excel so for this tutorial we'll be considering the students database now let's get back to the excel so now we are on the excel sheet and you can see that in this particular excel sheet we have some student details we have the serial numbers names role numbers class blood group and some subjects like math science computer statistics social gk and the final marks obtained percentage and total marks right so let us imagine that uh, a company has come for an interview so all these students are going to attend an interview and uh, the minimum percentage to attend the interview will be like 75 percent so you can see that we have 75 here and all the students have got above 75 except for the one student which is mike 
right so for mike to attend the interview he needs 75 percentage or above so uh, he can make some modifications in one of these subjects right so there is always an exam after the exam called as improvement exam so if you can uh, like to score some extra marks in the subjects which you have scored less so that you can make up to the percentage what you're expecting you can do that so here in this particular sheet uh mike has six subjects right and in six subjects you can see he has scored 76 91 45 71 94 and 62 so out of these he have scored less in one subject compared to all the subjects one subject is really low that is computers so what if he can give an improvement exam and increase his percentage to 75 right so that can be done so if we can do some brute force methods like we can change the marks like 55 and then check this particular one so it's getting 74 right so using the brute force method will be a little bit lengthy so you can do this because it is just a small uh, table which has least number of data and you just have one single cell to modify so that can be done in small tables but what if you had some table with hundreds of rows or thousands of rows that will be time consuming right so for that we have some inbuilt functionality in excel that is called goal seek in excel so for now let's eliminate the marks here so we have eliminated the marks and the upgraded percentage is 65. Now we need the target as 75. Okay, so let's uh, write it as Mike's target, right? We need Mike. So Mike's new target as 75. okay now to make sure that we need a mark here which can get mike to 75 percentage we will use the data operation so here on the toolbar which has file home insert etc we have one other option called as data so when you click on data from toolbar you'll have this ribbon and in this ribbon we have various options so when you come into forecast group we have an option called what if analysis when you click on what if analysis you will have a set of options out of which we have goal seek now for goal seek we need to select a table cell that is this particular table cell that is m9 so we need the value 75 here right so what is the cell that you need to change here for that you need to select this one and select this particular cell here right and now you can select ok now you can see that excel has automatically run all the permutations and combinations and has come up with a number so that the overall percentage of mike will be 75 percent right so the expected marks that mike should be getting in his computer's improvement exam should be equal to 56 or greater than 56 to get the final target as 75 so that he can attend the company's interview so this is how we use goal set or goal seek in excel we are on our excel spreadsheet and here you can see i'm trying to create a calendar for the employees in the company where you might have to you know write down the day and month and year or week of your birth date or maybe your joining date or maybe also your last working day right this might be useful for all the employees to you know uh, avoid them from writing it down manually so how do i create it so it takes a few simple steps all it takes is some data validation methods and also there is an exclusive video specifically made on data validation in excel link to which is in the description box below or you can search it on our official youtube channel now you can see that uh, the word calendar is on the first cell that is a1 but we have four cells below it that is a3 b3 c3 and d3 so you might want to add this to all the cells right like maybe in the middle so for that you can do the option of merge and center also there is a tutorial on merge and center about all the options available in this particular thing so you can go through that also 
and uh, here we have done the first step now all we need is day month year and week so in a calendar or in a month you'll have days from 28 29 30 or 31 days right so let's create a list or the drop down menu for that so that whenever you click it right so whenever you click on that particular cell you will have the list of all the days available right so let's get started with that let's create a new sheet so why are we creating a new sheet you won't want that all the numbers in your calendar sheet right over here right so for that so we are creating a new sheet and all the data will be available here so here let's write down the days first and here the second number also you can use the option of flash fill so that you can you know uh, reduce the effort here so you can see the flash fill option over here all you need to do is select the cells and drag them down until you get your required dates right so let's keep it to 31 days there you go you have the days so these will be your days and here now the next option was month right yeah month and year now using the same flash fill option you will uh, you know add the months into your sheet so this will be sunday so excel has this smart flash fill option where you can just drag the data and everything will be filled according to your requirements so sunday to saturday now the next one right that is your month so same as the before process will create January now you can use the flash fill option and all the way up to December now the last one was the year so 1990 and 1991 so you can select the cells and flash fill up to 20 22 maybe yeah 2022 should be good enough now this is the flash fill option you have here and also we have an exclusive tutorial on flash fill altogether you can go through it for a detailed explanation as well now coming back to the original sheet so this is where you create your drop down list right so select the cell where you want to add the drop down list navigate to data and then here is your data validation menu so we have a variety of data validation options over here there is an exclusive tutorial on that you can go through it for now we'll look into the list option only because we want to create a drop down list right so here it will ask for source click on the source here the source bar right now navigate to sheet number two where we have the days options select the range so this will be your range and select OK. Also, you can add some message here, right? What you can do is uh, in case if there is an error or something, right? You don't want that to be happening. So all you need to do is uh, write down select from drop down. Select from drop down only. So this could be a message select from drop down only. The title is select options or just options. In case if there is an error, you can write down your title as invalid data and you can write down a message as please select from drop down only. So um, in case of someone tries to write as 32 or 33 to check the integrity of your data validation, then they will encounter an error and an error message. And then they must be understanding what exactly they try to do and if it's correct or wrong, right? So this is to make sure that whatever the data you enter is correct and valid. 
so okay and here you can see select from the drop down list only options with, with option list as title and let's try to enter 32 right and when you press enter you will see an error so the error message is invalid data please try to select from drop down only so you can go for a retry and select the drop down right so let's eliminate them and now select something from the drop down so let's take it as maybe 10 right so this is how you cleared the day one now let's try to do with the month same data validation option settings will be list and source will be this one I think I made a mistake here so let's cancel this and go back to sheet 2 and rename this as our week yeah now coming back to the month again it will be a list and the source will be in sheet 2 navigate to the sheet 2 and select your range and the input message the same options Select from drop down only. And error alert. Title will be invalid data. This one will be please select from drop down only. okay and that's done now let's continue with year as well let's quickly do the same will be a list source will be in sheet 2 so this is your list press ok and lastly the week same process it will be a list source will be in your sheet 2 the input message options Title invalid data. It's drop down only. Right, so your drop down list is ready now. So the month will be anything. So currently we have May and the year can be anything anywhere. So let's take it as 1997 and we can be, you know, the, the adjacent week. And so what was 10th of May 1997? Let's check our calendars. So it was a Saturday. So it was a Saturday and that's how you create a drop down list in Excel and if you want you can also add borders to your calendar right so that's how it's done. So what is data validation in Excel? So it is a feature by Microsoft Excel 
where it can restrict data entry into certain cells by using data validation and it will prompt the users to enter valid data in the cells based on the rules and restrictions provided by the creator of that particular sheet. Now this would be a little confusing to understand. So to understand it in a much better way, let's get back to the practical way where we will start entering some data validation rules to our Excel sheet and try to enter data into it. Now we are on the Microsoft Excel and this particular sheet is based on employee ID, employee name, employee department, employee salary, fiscal year and work timings of the employees. Now we will be applying some data validation rules to each and every column and try to enter data based on the rules we have entered. Now for the first one which is the employee ID, we'll enter rules based on the employee ID number. So to apply the data validation, you need to go into the data tab on the toolbar and inside the ribbon you can see data tools group and in the data tools group you have the option of data validation. Now select the entire column go to the data tools group, select data validation option and you will have this particular pop-up menu. And here you can see different types of options. So since we are entering employee ID, it would be a whole number. So let us select whole number option. And now here you can see the option of between not equal to, equal to, not between, greater than, less than, etc. So let us select between and let us assume that your employee ID has five numbers and uh, it should be between 10,000 to 11,000. So let us provide 10,000 and 11,000. Now select OK and now the new rule has been applied. So now the minimum value of each and every employee ID should be equal to or more than 10,000 and less than 11,000 and it should have 5 digits. Now let's try to enter a wrong employee ID that is just one. There you go. You can see that Microsoft Excel is not allowing you to include a wrong number. It says this value does not match the data validation restrictions defined for this cell. So now you can press retry and try to enter some number which is in between 10,000 to 11,000. Now it is 10,901 and this will take the entry. Now let us assume that because I am the creator of this sheet, I know what should be entered here. But what if I give this sheet to you and you are the person who is trying to enter the number and it shows the error and you don't know what was the error. Right. To avoid this kind of confusion, what you can do is, you can do some uh, ways where you can provide the message to the user. So that can be done by, okay, let's select the sheet again and go to the data validation. And here you have the same settings. Now here you have another option saying input message. So before input message, let us go to error alert. Now here the error title would be data entered is not valid. Please enter. This is the error message. Please enter EMP ID between 10,000 to 11,000. Press OK. Now, when you try to enter the wrong number, it will show that particular error alert message. See, data entered is not valid. Please enter employee ID between 10,000 to 11,000. Now, this is fine, but how long this will be, you know, what if there is an option where you just hover over to this cell and it automatically tells you to enter the value between 10,000 to 11,000 without having to face the error. Yeah, even that can be done. So you can select the entire column, go to data validation and here, this is the input message. This is where you can do that. So here you can write the message name, valid data. Please enter data between 
10,000 to 11,000. Now, when you hover over to any cell in this particular column, it will automatically show you this message where you can avoid all the errors. Just select OK. See, when you select any cell in this particular column, it will automatically tell you, please enter data between 10,000 to 11,000. So, here you don't have to face any errors. Right. Now, let us try to enter the valid data. 10902 and it will take it as the correct value and again 10903 now in case if you try to provide the wrong number it will show the error see so that's how it is now we have finished the whole number part now let's get into the employee name where we have to provide uh, the second type that is text length now let us imagine that uh, in your company, you are trying to provide ID cards to your employees and you know that ID card is really small and inside that ID card you need to include the employee photograph and your company name, employee ID, blood group, phone number, address, everything and also you need to include the name of the employee. So what if there is an employee with very lengthy name like 30 characters, 40 characters, yeah? In India, it is really possible that you might have a lengthy name. So what you can do is you can provide the text length where the text is limited to like 15 or 20 uh, uh, characters. So you can include that name in the ID card. So you can do that by allowing the data validation criteria with text length. Uh, minimum can be anything. So minimum can be one and maximum here you can provide 15 and press ok ok minimum will change it to at least uh, 2 and yeah let it be 1 so minimum is 1 and maximum is 15 characters and press ok and uh, let us also provide the input message enter character type character data please enter valid name and error alert invalid data please enter valid data okay please enter characters less than 50 press ok now let us try to enter a random name okay uh, we'll enter characters more than 15 here QWERTY 0 I think uh, yeah it's like uh, 1 2 3 4 5 11 okay now this is more than 15 okay I think it's not more than 15 let's try to enter a little bit more characters yeah now we have entered more than 15 characters and it is showing please enter characters less than 15 so now we can retry and try to enter some valid name. Uh, now we have characters less than 50, so it will take as the proper name. Now let us try to enter another name. I'm just entering some random data. So, another name maybe. Great. Now, the next type of data validation is also done. Now, let us get into employee department. Employee department is something really superb. So, I'll tell you about it. It's actually a list. Now, let us finish the other ones first. That is employee salary, fiscal year and work timings. After that, we'll learn about uh, the list one. Now let's come into employee salary. So salary is something where you have to include decimal points. So now let us go to uh, data validation and inside the values we have already dealt with whole number, uh, text length. Yeah, now we'll uh, deal with employee salary that is decimal. Now minimum is, okay, what is that? Uh, minimum can be 1.00. 
and uh, maximum can be 1 lakh 0 0.00 or let us put that as 10 lakhs press ok ok not not just then mm, enter valid salary okay now let's change it to minimum as 10,000 so the employee minimum salary will be 10,000 and input enter valid salary enter salary between 10,000 to 10 lakhs let us include a comma here too now error alert invalid salary please enter between 10,000 to 10 lakhs press ok now the message and the data validation conditions are applied to this column now let us try to enter some invalid data first it will show the error now we need to enter the valid data yeah now it is taking the valid data let us provide 20,000 and this has 35,000 now the next one is fiscally let us imagine that we wanted to you know work on the employees for current working year that is 2020 to 2021 and or you can consider 2021 to 2022 not more than 2021 and not less than 2021 for that you can provide the year option as well so for that you need to select the entire column go to data validation settings and inside here you have an option of date so uh, let us provide the date option as between and start date is 01 slash 01 slash 2021 and end date is 01 slash 01 slash 2022 and input message let us provide data as current fiscal year current financial year enter date between 2021 to 2022 let us copy this and go into error alert error message will be same invalid date select ok now the error message and uh, the data input message and the data validation rule has been applied for this column so let's try to enter some date here you can enter uh, 02 of february 2021 it will take as the correct data now let's try to enter some wrong data which is apart from 2022 02 02 2022 it will not take this it will throw error so that's how it works now let us try to enter as 2021 and this is march it will take it now another data 04 this time and 2021 so that's how your uh, date data validation will work now coming into the next type of data validation that is time so we have time here let us imagine that you are providing some work timings to your employees that should be from 9 am to 5 pm not more than that so you want to keep your work life balance for your, all your employees so you, you just want them to work between 9 to 5 and that should be fine and anything apart from that time should be invalid so you can do that by selecting a time option between it should be in between and the start time will be 0 9 0 0 and this should be uh, 
सेवेंटीन दैट इज फाइव पी एम इन दी इवनिंग एंड इनपुट मैसेज प्लीज एंटर टाइम बिटवीन नाइन ए एम टू फाइव पी एम दिस शुड बी दी इनपुट मैसेज नाउ एर अलर्ट इन वैलिड टाइम error message okay now okay work timings now this should be okay we can do this as two columns actually let us cancel let us copy this and paste it here we can do it as login login timing and this should be okay This should be a log out. So this should be okay. So this will be considered as login and log out times. Now let us provide the login time. This should be the right time, and uh, let's try to provide wrong timings. Zero eight. Now it will not take it. It will throw as error. So it's working fine. Let us provide ten. Now let us provide the logout time. It should be below five p.m. So let us provide five. It will take it. Okay. Let's try to provide something just one minute less than five. It is fifty-nine. Okay. There is some problem in this. Let's check it. Okay, it is taking uh, three. That is including seconds. Okay, let's provide seconds as well. Zero five zero 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 zero. Okay, still there is some problem. Okay, we have entered four. We should. We are supposed to enter twenty-four hour timing, right? Fourteen. Okay. Uh, it should be seventeen. I think this will work. Yeah. Now we are following twenty-four hour timing here. So let's provide another timing that is sixteen thirty zero zero. This will be valid and fifteen thirty. Yes, this is also valid. now we have finished almost all types of uh, data validation things that is we have finished with any value whole number decimal date timing test length and the last one is list so this is where things get interesting now let's cancel this now select the employee column now if you are running a company then definitely you will not have only one department in it you might have multiple departments right so let us consider that you have a software development company So in that the basic departments will be software development team and software testing team. So what you can do is you can provide a list. So using that list you can just uh, hover over to that cell, select the drop down menu and inside that you can select the option. So we will try to work something like that. If we have selected the entire column. Selection okay. let us select the entire column again go to data validation the selection contains some cells without data validation settings do you want to extend data validation to this cells yes 
Now let us provide the list option and here source you can provide as developer and tester press ok ok now input message select one select one error alert invalid data select from drop down only press ok now when you select the cell you can see small drop down icon right so when you press it you will have developer and tester option so you can select developer for first one and for second one you can select uh, tester right okay this is good for uh, one or two options maybe three or even maybe like five but what if you have more departments okay let's go to this uh, second sheet where we have the department data so here we have like 14 departments no 15 departments or 15 uh, employee type names so the first one is CEO second is developer tester quality analyst system analyst finance human resource so so many options are there so you cannot keep on typing all of them right so here it is 15 what if you have like 25 like 50 departments right it will be tough so for this you have another option so let me select all this data and copy this from this sheet to our employee sheet let us paste it somewhere here let's expand this okay now we have our uh, list over here now let us remove the data validation from this column clear all okay now everything is cleared let's select ok now let us erase this data as well now let us apply the list data validation again from scratch go to list now here we can select the source select this particular cell and drag it until here and it has been loaded now go to input message data options select one from the menu or the drop down copy error alert select only from the drop down menu invalid entry yeah now let's select ok fine now you have the icon here you have all the provided options you can scroll down and select any one out of these you can select knowledge transfer for the first one and second one would be system analyst and the last one would be human resources now in the list everything is fine okay this is showing you the menu options and everything so but what if you provide this sheet to your new joinee or new employee in your company and uh, by mistake he messes up something like deleting this okay so we have uh, deleted systems analyst and when you click on the options here you don't have systems analyst in that place you have blank space right so there is a way where all your uh, you know data can be messed up so to avoid this what you can do is you can actually uh, save this data in a different sheet like i did here like department data you can hide this sheet or you can protect this sheet with password or something so that nobody can mess this up so now let us get back to the employee data and select this column and uh, clear everything press ok and let us also clear this and this as well in this one too now let us eliminate the rows or cells the employee yeah, everything okay now we have basically removed this data from here 
Now, let us try to apply the data validation once again. Now here, let us select as list and uh, here, let us provide the option. Let us go to next sheet. Let us select all these options and press OK. OK, let's provide input message. data options or department options Now let's select OK. Now let's hide this sheet. Now the sheet has been hidden and you still have the options. Developer or let us provide CEO. Then we have developer. Then we have test. So that's how you can protect your sheet. How to protect and lock cells in Excel. Now, why do we need to lock or protect cells in Excel? Let us imagine that there is an Excel sheet with really confidential data and you need to pass that data to your subordinate or your colleague to make some minor edits. Now, let us imagine that the edits are supposed to be done to only one or two columns and the rest of the columns should be left as they are. Now, there is a huge possibility that sometimes unknowingly or unwillingly, there might be some edits done by your colleague or your subordinate. So, to avoid such kind of unexpected mistakes, you might want to protect and lock your cells that you don't want your subordinate or your colleague to edit. So, before we begin, be kind enough to get subscribed to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated on the latest IT trends and tech content. Now, without further ado, let's get started with our one point agenda that is lock or protect cells in Excel. Now, let's get back into the practical mode and start our Microsoft Excel. Now, we are on the Microsoft Excel and this particular spreadsheet is related to employee details. Yeah, now the screen is visible a bit better. Now, let us imagine that this is our confidential data and you want to edit only two columns that is the designation column and phone number column. Now, let us imagine that the company has finished one annual year and now there are some promotions happening in the company and let us also imagine that the phone numbers of the employees provided by the company have undergone some changes. So now the minor edits that you want to make are related to the designation column and phone number column. Now you can see that all the columns that is the blood group, new salary, salary hike, current salary and name of the employee, serial number, employee number, everything is editable. So in such kind of scenarios, when you pass on this data, there might be a possibility where your colleague or subordinate might end up making some mistakes, right? So you want to avoid that. So you can do that by locking the cells. Now let us rename this sheet. Now the sheet has been renamed successfully. So now you can lock the cells by the following process. So in this process, you have two major steps. First one is to lock the cells. And the next one is to protect the cells by a password. Now, when you select all the cells in this particular sheet, you can just click on this edge here and you have all the cells selected. And now right click somewhere on the sheet and you can see an option called format cells. So in this particular option, you have some options provided, which is number alignment font, and you want to go into the protection part. So you can see by default, Excel keeps all the cells locked. Now we want the phone number and designation to be unlocked. Okay, so let's cancel it for now and get back to the sheet and select the columns D and I. And now let's right click and go into format cells. And in the protection option, make sure that you uncheck the locked icon. Now select OK. And now 
okay so you cannot include the merged cell fine we have a cell here which is merged okay let's remove that okay now again select the entire column right click get into format cells and uncheck the lock option select ok now we have finished the first part that is locking all the cells which you don't want to get edit and unlocking the cells where you want to make some edits now the second stage is protecting the sheet now right click on the sheet name and you can see an option called protect sheet click that and now here you can see select locked cells and also select unlocked cells so let us provide a password here so let us use some simple password so that we don't forget that so i'll be selecting one two three and now select ok re-enter the password to proceed now let us type one two three again now select ok and now the sheet is protected now we have successfully locked and protected all the cells in excel now let us verify that the cells you wanted to protect are really protected and locked or not so we have unlocked phone number and designation and everything else is locked now let me try and edit the blood group so when i double click or try to edit this particular sheet then i'll be receiving a warning from excel it says the cell or chart you're trying to change is on a protected sheet to make a change unprotect the sheet you might be requested to enter a password so it says that this particular cell is locked and you cannot edit it now let us try to edit the phone numbers which we kept as unlocked so you can see i can really edit the unlocked cell here now let me try to change this phone number let me enter some random phone number so you can see the cell is editable now let us go through the designation column and try to edit this particular column now since i said that there's a promotion happening in the company so the deputy ceo is now the current ceo of the company and the software developer happens to become the senior software developer and the tester as well let us imagine that he will become the senior and so on okay so this proves that this particular sheet is editable not the entire sheet but only the cells that we kept in the unlock mode. Okay. Now, this is how you lock and protect your cells in Excel. Now, you can see that I have sales data on my worksheet. So, uh, let us imagine that your manager asked you to find the average of sales happening in your company right so let's navigate to the bottommost cell and you know write it down as average here okay average sales so here this is a cell where you want to keep your average right so here we'll be writing a small formula that is average and tab to select it now you must select the array of data right so this is my array since average is an array function and now press enter so there you go you have the average sales data that happened in your company so to understand the page setup in ms excel we will go through a demo inventory in excel where we'll be considering some restaurant data now without any delay let's get started with the practical demo now we are on the excel sheet and this is the data i was talking about the restaurant data where we have the first column that is rank and next we have the restaurant name followed by that we have the sales happening through that restaurant and then we have the segment category that is what kind of service does that particular restaurant offers now this is the list what we made and uh, what if we wanted to represent this data in the form of a printed paper right so i guess you can see all the columns and rows here so you can see that we have almost like 250 rows so there is no chance or there is no way to print all those 250 rows in one page of course it is practically possible but when you try to read the content it will be so tough to read because all the rows will be clubbed together so closely so that you cannot read it 
so uh, you need to print them page by page so and you need to also take care of the data is aligned properly according to the page size everything and even you need to take care of the margins of your page right so that's what page setup basically means so we had a detailed overview of our data and what actually we're trying to make now let us see how page setup is possible in ms excel so to go to the page setup menu or go to the page setup options we have three methods let's start with the simplest method so the simplest method is by just clicking on file and go to print option and you'll see all the page setup options right over here and you can also go to print menu by pressing a shortcut method that is control p so you'll directly end up on the page setup options now let's look at the second method so the second method is you can see the toolbar over here right which has file home insert draw page layout formulas data review view and help so the second method we can use page layout option from the toolbar and you can see when you click on the page option from the toolbar you have a new ribbon over here so this ribbon is all about page setup options so it will offer you margins it will offer you orientation size print area breaks background print tiles etc etc right so all these options or menus in this ribbon belong to page setup now let us look at the third method so the third method is something similar you have view option on the toolbar so just select view and you can see we have few page setup options over here as well the normal page break page layout custom views and we have grid lines formula bar heading zoom and zoom out select to zoom free certain panes right so all these are also the page setup options so we have the three methods to enter the page setup options now we are familiar with those now let's get started with the practical mode on page setup for that let me use the simplest method that is holding the control key and pressing p which navigates me to the print option now we have various set of options here we have no scaling normal margins letter portrait orientation collated print active sheets and note one for windows you can see this option is the printer's option for example if you are connected to a printer which is the hardware printer then your ms excel will show the printer's name here so other than printer you can also make some other arrangements where you can just directly print your complete data in the form of pdf and then you can export your pdf to your recipient that's also possible okay now let's get started with the first option that is print active pages okay to understand this better we need to create a new sheet not a problem so you can see that we just have one sheet over here so let us kind of select all the items and create a new sheet and try to paste it over here or let's try to paste it over here okay now let's try to extend these yeah this should be fine now let's rename this sheet sheet uh, or let's rename it as restaurant sheet 2 for our reference now let us get back to the print sheet option so i'll use the shortest method that is holding the control key and press p now you can see that here we have six pages in total from the active sheets so the current active sheet is the top 250 sheet so this particular sheet is the current active sheet so if we print the entire data in this particular sheet then we will end up printing six pages now let us select the other option where you have to print the entire workbook right so now you can see that there is a change in the number that is 12 pages so what is a workbook so basically workbook is the collection of entire sheets in your excel home page so in this particular excel home page you have the first sheet that is top 250 and the second sheet that is the restaurant sheet 2 right so the combination of these two sheets make up a workbook 
So when you select the entire workbook option, you'll have 12 pages. So that's how we use this setting where you select the active sheets, the entire workbook, and there is another option where you can only print a selected item. So if you want to do this, then let's get back here. Now, what if your customer or what if your client wanted the top 10 restaurants only? So you can select the top 10 restaurants by doing this. Now you have the top 10 restaurants. Let's go to print. So you can see Excel has automatically selected the selection only print the selected content only so you can see we have only the top 10 restaurants or top 11 restaurants that we have selected in our sheet and it is ready to get printed so this is how we use the first option now let's get back let's not select that and let's make the pages normal now get back to the print option again now you can see the next option that is collated Right, so in collated you have different different options that is 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 and 1, 2, 3 and the next one which is uncollated 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3. So why are these numbers uh, present here and what does collated mean anyway? So this is your question right. Now the answer for this question will be a little similar to your examination hall. Okay. Let us imagine that you are in examination hall and you are the invigilator and you have 10 students in your room. So you wanted to provide question papers to all the 10 students. Okay. So you have your question paper distributed into three sheets. That is you have marked questions and your questions are fit into three papers. Right. In this scenario, we have 250 rows and all the data is split into six sheets. That is sheet one or page one, page two, page three, page four. Right. Now, if we wanted to print 10 copies, then the arrangement of papers will be page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six in continuous order. Right. That is collated. If you wanted 10 copies of different different ways where you wanted to print the first sheet first, then you wanted to print the second sheet second and the third sheet third that is you'll have 10 copies of first page, 10 copies of second page, 10 copies of third page and so on. That particular approach is called uncollated approach and if you're printing the pages in continuous order for 10 times, then that particular approach is called as collated approach. So this is what we had to learn about collated and uncollated. Now let's get back to the third option. Now let's press again print. Now we have our data over here. There is something wrong. Select all the elements, control P. Yeah, now we have our data back. Now we have the third option that is the portrait orientation. Okay, so when we click that, we have two options that is portrait and landscape. So you might be having a good idea, like when you try to click a picture in your phone, we have two modes as well that is portrait mode and the landscape mode. So when you click on the portrait mode, this is how your data will be looking. Now, to understand the difference, let's click the landscape mode. So when you click the landscape mode, this is how your data representation will change. You'll have a wider page to print. So this is why we use the page orientation. For now, let's keep the page orientation as portrait orientation. And we have now the fourth option. So what is the fourth option? We have various sets of options in here. That is letter and A4 size. There are also some more page options over here where you can select the page types you want to print. So basically you'll be having few more options that is A4, A5, A3, etc. But here we just have two that is A4 and letter. So basically you'll get those options and followed by that next we have margins. So here you can see we don't have any margins for our data. Okay. So now we can add some margins by setting up this one as an option like last custom setting or you can also choose normal wide narrow right so your page will be changed according to your margin size
right so this is how you can change the margins now let's keep it as default let's set the normal one now we have the next option that is scaling option so here you can see we are trying to fit the page so when you're trying to print these sheets using no scaling then the actual size of the page will be printed now you can also modify that you can fit and print these sizes so you can remember the first option that i said of printing all the 250 rows in one single sheet this is how you can fit it so fit the sheet on one page where you can see all the 250 rows are fit into one page but the data is not readable so but we don't want this type of an approach right so let's keep it as the default one which is no scaling so these are the variety of options in print now if you wanted to print the all the six pages into the pdf format and mail it to your client you can also do that i think i have explained it in the first place so you can see we can do it by just selecting this option where you can print all the six pages and into pdf format and then you can mail them to your client and you can also select the number of copies you want you can increase the copies to two three and any number of uh, copies you want for now i'll keep it as one copy now let's print this now let us select the location rename it and publish now let's get back to documents and see if the page is printed or not here we go here we have the restaurant data in the form of pdf so we have our entire six pages of data in the pdf format now we are back on the home page now we had some limited functions in the print function over here we have tried to export the data so you can also export the data or try to print it from the print option over here you can just select that as well you can modify yes the pages are printed now there you go we have the restaurant to pdf data so that's how you can print all your data you can either choose the export option or you can either choose the print option now when you see into the print option we have limited number of page setup options over here now let's check out what we missed so we are in the page layout here so we had gone through the margins we had set all the margins and then we have also gone through the portrait and landscape now you can see the size when we were in the print menu option we had only a4 and letter but here you can see there are a wide variety of options that is other than letter we have tabloid legal statement executive a3 right we have a5 and many more other options and if you want some more paper options you can go to more and you can always select a few more options that's how you do it and yeah we didn't had the break option so remember when we had been through the print option we did not have the break option there let's select this to normal a4 so you cannot see the break option over here right so here we have the break option so what does break option does right you can actually break the page uh, remember we spoke about the top 10 things or the top 10 rows you can always do that so you can just keep the top 10 restaurants in your first page and then break the remaining and to set page breaks you can select the cell now i need the top 10 so i'll select this particular cell which is in the 11th position and now i'll try to implement the page break insert a page break and now you can see on my sheet there is a thin line which is separating the two pages that's how you can see the indication of a page break implemented onto your page now how do you see it you can see it by selecting ctrl p where you can see the first top 10 restaurants being printed on your sheet so there you go we have the first top 10 restaurants printed on our sheets so that's how you use the page break
now let's try to eliminate all the page breaks so you can select breaks and reset all page breaks so the page break has been eliminated now you can always choose a background for your data as well you just uh, if you want you can add a picture to your background i think that's not available for now okay you can work offline as well let us select this one So you can see that we have added a background to our data. We can select all the text files and then you can change the color so that the text becomes a little visible. Yeah, that's how you do it. Now, if you don't want the image to be added on your file, you can also remove that, delete page background, and there you go, all the images are gone. Now, the next important part, that is the print titles. Now, why do we need print titles? For that, let's try to print this. So now you can see the first page. In the first page, we have the title, rank, restaurant, sales, segment, category. But if you go to the second page, you don't have that title, right? You don't have the title, rank, name of the restaurant, sales, and their service category. So if we want that, then we need to add titles. Now for that, let's select the print titles option now let's select the rows to repeat on top now for that we need the first row select the first row and this particular row will be repeating into all the pages now let's try to print it so yeah now you can see the titles are being added to all the sheets you can see the page 2 page 3 page 4 page 5 and page 6 so you can see the titles added to all the sheets. Now we are on the spreadsheet. So here, what exactly are page breaks? So page breaks are something which help you during your trying to print your data or present your data in the form of a web page, right? In those times, you cannot fit your entire Excel data in one spreadsheet or one paper or one web page, right? So in those scenarios, Excel will try to eliminate a few parts of your spreadsheet or it will try to split the spreadsheet. So how exactly it looks like? So go to the view option and click on the view and click on page break preview. Here you can see the dotted lines, right? So these are the things which separate your data in form of pages so that it can be printable on one single page. So some of the times the user or the X user manually inserts a page break, right? So how do you insert it? Just go to the page layout and here you can see the page breaks insert a page break and you have successfully inserted a page break again go to the view go to page break view and here you can see the solid line so these solid ones are the ones which are inserted by the users or anyone who had the access to the data now how do we eliminate them right so we can eliminate them and we can try to you know get the sheet back to the normal way so all you have to do is click on the cell which has the page break which is right under the page break Go to the insert page break yeah page layout menu go to the breaks option click on remove page break and there you go you have successfully eliminated the page break and page break preview to make sure that the page break has been successfully removed so you cannot see that anymore so that's how you try to insert or eliminate a page break in excel so conditional formatting is a method to visualize your worksheet we already have the charts in Excel to visualize our Excel sheets in graphical form, but what if you had to see or visualize the data in your worksheet as it is? So that is where the conditional formatting comes handy. Now let's get back to the Microsoft Excel and try to implement some conditional formatting. Now we are on the Excel worksheet. This particular data set is based on a store. Now we have various columns in this particular data set. We have row ID, order ID customer name etc and finally we have quantity discount and profits now let's go to profits uh, let us imagine that we have provided this particular store with a target of minimum 15 percent profits now let us find out the stores that have hit the 15 percent target and the ones which did not so for that let us select the entire column now you can find the conditional formatting option in the home toolbar and in that ribbon the ribbon with styles has the condition formatting option. Click on that and you have various options over here. Highlighting the cells, 
top bottom rules data bars data scales and icons so data bars are actually the bar graphs which highlight themselves on each and every cell if you implement them and these are the color scales if you want to implement some colors you can go through that and if you want to represent your cells with icons you can also do that for now let's highlight the cells so select that and inside this select the greater than option and here you can provide the percentage that is 15 percent and the cells or the stores which hit the target should be highlighted with the green color and select ok and there you go you have your stores that hit the 15 percent target and the ones which did not hit the 15 percent target now if we want to highlight the ones which did not hit the 15 percent target you can highlight them with the color red so conditional formatting highlight the cells less than 15 percent with color red and text dark and there you go it's done now let us consider another example so this particular example is based on train data set and here we have the passenger id survived passenger class name etc now we have a train accident incident over here now one is indicated that they are alive and zero is indicated that they are not alive now let us use this column and conditional formatting highlight the cells containing the text as one with color green okay and highlight the cells that contain text zero as the red that indicates they are not alive and let us select the icons now we have the icons over here the x indicates that they are not alive and the green tick mark indicates that they are alive now that is how you use conditional formatting in excel excel now here on my spreadsheet you can see some data so this particular data has some color markings so we have used color codes to mark the designations of all the employees with different colors so for example blue for manager purple for senior and so on right now our duty is to count the total number of employees present in a company based on the color code this can be done using filters but let's try with color codes now we don't have a readily available function in excel to count cells based on their colors but we can make use of macro now to make use of macro you might want to enable the developer options so by default these will be disabled in excel to enable them right click on the toolbar and you can see this particular option click on the customize ribbon option and you will be provided with various set of options now on the right side you can see developer options so make sure the checkbox is clicked to enable developer options and press on ok to completely enable developer window right now when you click on developer options you can see various options here visual basics macro etc now click on the macro to create a macro now just give a name to the macro function so i'll give simply learn and press on create to create that particular macro function so we have already created a macro that is count colored cells which we will be using in our current spreadsheet for counting the colored cells now let us erase the newly created function now getting back to the original code so how does this particular count colored cells works so let us understand the function first then we will try to make use of it in the spreadsheet so the function name is count colored cells as you can see and this particular function will have two parameters current cell and spreadsheet area so the current cell will be the cell address where the color you want to count is present and then the spreadsheet area so what is the range of cells where you want to locate that particular color and count the number of repetitions that is the spreadsheet area and then comes the variables used colored cell range color code and color cell count so the colored cell which particular cell is having that particular color and what color code is involved in that colored cell and colored cell count so what is the total count what is the total number of colored cells you have in that particular range that is colored cell count now let us consider color code is equals to current cell interior color that is current cell dot interior dot color 
So this is the function which will identify the interior color of a selected cell. Let us imagine that initially color code is equal to the current cell's color code. Okay. Now we will have the for loop. And that for loop will include colored cell which is the current cell in the spreadsheet area. And if the colored cell, the currently selected colored cell dot interior dot color is equal to the color code that we have selected, then colored cell count, the variable which is used to count the number of colored cells is equals to plus one. Initially, by default, it will be zero. In case if this particular if condition is true, that is the current cell color and the color code given is equals to same, then the value of colored cell will increase by one. And this particular if loop will run as many number of times the condition is true. So let us imagine that the condition will remain true for five times. Then we have obtained five similarly colored cells in the given range of cells in a spreadsheet. And once the condition fails, then the latest value present in colored cell count variable will be displayed, which will be a final result. So this is how the macro function works. Now let's close the macro window and get back to our spreadsheet. Now let us try to make use of the macro function that we just created. So that is equals to count colored cells. Press tab to select the macro function. And the first one is the current cell. So this is the current cell where the current color is being provided, comma, the cell range. So our cell range will be from C2 to C31. Right. So this is the range where we want to count the similarly colored cells that is sky blue colored cells. Close the function and press enter. Now you can see the function has identified six repetitions of sky blue color in this particular range of cells. Now you can drag the same formula across all the cells and it will be providing the results of the same. So six senior colors that is pink or purple color, then two repetitions of this particular color. Two repetitions of trainee color, five for dark blue and six for green, right? So this is how the macro function works. And the key point to remember here is this particular macro will work only for manually colored cells. So there are situations where we have used conditional formatting to color a single cell. Let us imagine that we have used conditional formatting to recognize the employees with salary above 30,000 as green color. And if we try to use that particular green color to be counted, by the color count cells function, no, it will not happen. It will not consider that color as a feedback or an input. Now, in future, we will also try to design a macro which can recognize the colors made by condition formatting as well. But this particular function will be exclusively used for manually colored cells only. Dated if function is majorly used to find the differences between two individual dates. So it is also called as dated if by a few people and a few people also reference it to date diff, that is date difference. So anything is good. Now to find the difference between any two dates, let's select a few dates. So the first date would be, uh, let us imagine that you're an employee and you wanted to find out how many years that you've been working with an organization. So for that, you might want to need today and the date where you joined the company, right? So it might be date of joining and today. So what's the difference, right? So let us imagine that you joined the organization somewhere around 2010, 0, 1, 0, 5, 2010, and today. So for today, can you can give any particular date. Let us imagine that uh, today is 1st of January 2021 or 2022. Now we have up both the dates, that is the joining date and the current date, which can be the current date. So the day can be anything. So you might be watching this on a different date as well. So the date of that day for today would be a little different. So we'll imagine the today's date as an imaginary date. Now we might want to find the difference that is in terms of years. So you wanted to find the difference in terms of years. So here you can find the difference in terms of years, days and months as well. So currently let's try to find out the difference in terms of years. So for years you might want to specify the third parameter in the date function as y. If you wanted months you have to give 
the m as the third parameter and if you wanted to find the days you might want to give d as the third parameter uh, so we have discussed the third parameter. So what are the first two parameters, right? So the first two parameters are the first date and the last date. So the first date in this situation is your date of joining and the last date or the final date, which you want here as your today. So let's find the difference. So for that equals two. So it can be dated if or date diff. So date if and the first date, which is the A2 and comma, the last date, that is B2. And your parameter, third parameter in terms of years, that is Y, close the bracket and press enter. So there you go, you have your date here. So it's been like 11 years that you're working with your organization. So that's how you find out the differences. So we have 11 years because uh, we did not finish the 12th year completely. So if we had given the month as uh, maybe six where we have finished our total years then it will automatically change to 12 years so now for this particular task we will be considering the student database now let's get into practical mode and start our excel so on my screen you can see some data related to students now let us try to duplicate some of the rows here So we have selected the rows 8, 9, 10 and 11. Now we shall copy them and paste them. So now these are the duplicate elements, right? Now there might be possibilities about the duplication of class because all the students, all the 10 students are in same class. So there might be a duplication, but we are not looking for such kind of duplications, right? We are looking for the duplication of the entire row. For example, we have the details of Mike over here in the 8th row, which has the roll number or serial number as 7, name as Mike, roll number, class, blood group, and subject scores, percentage, round of percentage, and total marks. So the entire 8th row has been copied here, and it is in the row number 12. We have the exact same details. So what if you have the exact same rows duplicated? So that's what we're going to deal with. We are going to eliminate the duplicate rows all completely together. Now to carry over this task, we have to select the data from toolbar. So you have various options, file, home, insert, etc. So you need to select the data and inside the data toolbar, we have the ribbon and inside ribbon, you have got the duplicate values or remove duplicates uh, option in the ribbon. So select all the data, select remove duplicates. And now you can see that we have all our uh, column names over here and make sure that you have selected my data as headers and then select OK. And now you can see that Excel has automatically removed four duplicate values. So four duplicate values are found and removed. Ten unique values remain. Now another type of uh, remove duplicates can also be done. So you can see that here we have another data set which has phone numbers or phone names, that is phone makers, that is Samsung, Huawei, Vivo, Oppo, etc. So there are some duplicate values in this, I've copy pasted them. So now you can also do that. So just select all the data and now go into home and select conditional formatting and here select highlight cell rules and inside that you have duplicate values. Selecting this option will help you identify the duplicate values in your data set, but not to remove them. So you can select that and you can see the duplicate values are highlighted over here in the red color. Now again, you can get back to data and uh, select the option of remove duplicates and select OK. And the duplicate values will be automatically eliminated. So that's how you delete or eliminate duplicate values in a data set. And you can also see that we have another duplicate in this particular row. And if you wanted to select a particular row and eliminate the duplicates, you can also do that. Now for that, you need to go to the same process, remove duplicates. And here, Microsoft Excel is asking you if you had to expand 
the selection to the entire data set or you want to continue with the selected data set itself or selected column itself so for that you need to select the continue with the current selection and remove duplicates and press ok and you can see one duplicate value was found and it has been removed and six unique values remain so that's how you use the function of removing duplicates in excel so what is sum ifs in excel now you might want to calculate uh, the total sum of sales right so let us assume that this is your entire store's sales data and you wanted to calculate the entire sum of sales so there is a sum function in excel where you just have to you know select all the cells and apply some function onto it and you'll get the sum of all the sales right so with something like this you'll select all the cells and then you'll apply a sums function and you'll get the sum here and average everything right so this is fine but what if you just wanted to find the sales that are happening in only western region as you can see our column f is based on region so we have four regions south west east and central so your manager asks you to find the sales happening in suppose say west region so how do you calculate it would you manually go into each cell and check if it's west and calculate that will be time consuming right so what if you had a method which could do it for you just in a matter of few steps or few clicks right so that's exactly sums so it will basically add a condition calculate the sum of sales where the region is equals to west simple to like or similar to sql query right so that is exactly what we're going to do in excel today that is using sum ifs now let me add here sales of west region now in the next cell let's add a sum ifs function remember there are multiple sum functions in excel so when you type in sum you can see so many options based on concentrating on sum ifs so not just sum if we'll go to sum ifs so we'll be having an option of uh, placing multiple if conditions there so let's also try that more on that later now let's press tab to select our sum ifs function now okay we forgot another important step so before we apply sum ifs we need to convert our table into a table format yes it looks stable but right now it's not in tabular format it is in the format of database we know that microsoft excel considers its data as a database by default so to convert the database into table just click anywhere on the data and press ctrl t so that you'll have a new dialog box and it will ask if your table has headers just make sure that you have ticked in it our table does have headers so select ok now our database has been converted into a perfect table and it's ready for applying some function so now you can see our database has been successfully converted into a table now let's begin with our sum ifs now again remember we are using sum ifs here not sum if or sum so select sum ifs and press tab and we have our sum ifs function now the first step which column are we looking at what are we finding out right which is a sum range what sum do you want for now we need sum of sales so select the sales column and we have a simple key function here let's hold control again press shift and hold shift together so we're holding control and shift key together and now we're pressing lower arrow key once yes the entire sales column has been selected comma now where do you want to look so we want to look i mean which part of the table you want to fetch right so this is the region part we want to fetch right now so again hold control and shift together lower arrow key the entire column is selected now the next last part so we want to look into the both of the columns that is sales column and region column now which type of data you want so for now we want western type of data that is the sales data which is happening only in west right so we'll select this cell with the data as first or you can also manually enter it for now let's select the data so i'm selecting the cell f7 which has uh, data as best right now let's close the parenthesis and press enter so there you go you have the sales happening in the western region now you can also try to format it in the form of currency so let's use uh, dollars since it is based on american states so let's use dollars so there you go now we are having the sales data of west now let's try to copy the same to all the four cells and uh, for now here let's type in east 
and this can be south right and this can be your central there you go right now you can also copy the same formula and make minor edits to it so here instead of f8 you can select uh, east so where is east here and press enter so you have the sales related to east now let's try to edit f9 with south select south region enter so you have south sales and what remaining is central so let's edit central as well and press enter so there you go right now you have all the separate sales data from west east south and central now again uh, you might want a bit more granularity in data right or in your reports right like you wanted to find the sales data happening in west and you wanted to find out the category based on only furnitures so your manager will ask you okay a fantastic job so now just give me another minute detail on the data i want to calculate the sales happening on west based on category furniture right so he wants furniture or he wants office supplies only right you can also do that it's not an issue at all now let's try to copy this cell and paste it here and sales invest let's add another input here on furniture right now you wanted to calculate the sales happening in west region only on furniture so you can also do that now we can use the same formula as well just copy paste the formula here right and you can add few things here when you try to add a comma it will automatically generate the next criteria so it is expecting that you are looking for adding another criteria right now which column you want you want category so let's select category you want to select all the cells same trick control shift lower key and again press comma and you wanted to select only uh, furniture so select on furniture cell there you go. now press enter so there you go we successfully have the sales data from west region based on category only furniture so that's how you do sum ups in excel you can also add a few more details to it like in furniture you can also look only for tables so here you can see in west region we have furniture sales data and we have sales data of west region based on furniture which includes only tables you can also do that using sum as function in the same way all you have to do is select the subcategory column and select the cell which has the data as tables so this is how you use sum ups in excel now creating a pivot table is just away from a few clicks trust me it is just a couple of clicks and you'll have your pivot table ready to operate now click any cell or select any cell on your spreadsheet which has the data and navigate to insert menu on the toolbar and select pivot table and that's how simple it is now automatically excel will choose your data you can see the lines over here dotted lines that means the excel has already selected the range of data that you want to put into your pivot table and you can either select the existing worksheet or a new worksheet i'll select a new worksheet over here and just press on ok and there you go you have your pivot table ready now here you can see your pivot table is a little empty all you need to do is drag and drop the data elements that you want on your pivot table so here you can see on our spreadsheet we have some business data related to our store which has furniture and states and subcategories of the furniture and all the you know in in category you have furniture office surplus technology etc right so those have some subcategories as well and different states and the regions as well and the quantity total sales happen right so using this business data we can find out some key insights of this particular data using our pivot table right so here we'll add the data now let me drag the region into rows click and drag and let me drag uh, categories into columns which are the different categories which are involved in the sales data and values what are the sales happened right and there you go you have furnitures office supplies technology as the three different categories and those are the sales happened in central east south and west regions and this is the grand total and instead of regions you know you have all the regions over here right so central east south west or instead of uh, all the regions or instead of all the categories you can you know 
place a specific category in your pivot table. For example, let me push the category into the filters and here you can see the total sales happened in those particular regions. Now, what if someone asks you to find the sales of only furniture, right? So your manager comes to you and he'll ask you, get the sales of only furniture. So you can select that and there you go. You have the furniture sales in all the regions, right? Or you can also do the vice versa. You can also drag uh, regions into the filters and if you wanted to find out the region wise sales of furniture you can also do that right so here we have furniture and here you have uh, all the regions and let us try to find the sales of furniture in the central region and there you go right so this is how uh, the pivot table works and you can also remove the regions for example if you wanted to remove a certain element from filters or anywhere if it is columns rows anything you can just drag and drop it right so that's how it works and also you can increase the level of detail or improve the granularity right so here we have uh, categories on our uh, you know columns so you can also include subcategories into the columns right and and you have the region wise sales so in the region filter select all press ok and in the category select all press ok and you have the furniture here office supplies here and technology here and also if you want to include the quantity how much or how many number of uh, you know things got sold in those particular categories and subcategories you can also do that so here in the furniture section books these are the sales and these are the number of quantity or elements sold in the in those particular uh, you know sectors so you can you can also improve the level of granularity you can also improve the level of detail using pivot tables and now autofill in excel is a feature where you can add some series automatically using excel for example let us imagine that you wanted to add index numbers right so starting from 1 to 10 so manually you will be typing in the numbers and you'll be doing it right so instead of this what if i said you there was a simple way where excel will fill all the data for you right so just start with one two and select these two cells and you can see the flash logo over here right so that's the indication that excel has understood your pattern and it is ready to fill the remaining numbers so as long as you drag this logo or that ending part where you have a small square box that will fill all the numbers until where you have dragged it so that's how autofill works and you might be wondering will it work only for numbers no it will also work on some logics as well okay this was the first part let us also look at some other tricks with autofill now most of the time you might be just adding one number and try to drag that cell and the result is it will copy the same number all the time right so you can change it by clicking on this menu you can click on fill series and it will change to series and this was one more trick with numbers now getting back to the next type so let us imagine now the next type of series you want to add as weeks in a day right so you'll be having monday tuesday wednesday right so you can also do the series of weekdays using autofill in excel as well so drag that cell and it will give you all the days or weekdays in a week now let's try january and this will give you the months in a year in the shortcut way right since you just added the first three letters of the month it will recognize the pattern and it will do the same for you now let us try the full names of months right and now let's try to drag it it will fill all the full names of all the months now let's try the dates so let us imagine that this is the first day of the current year right it will now give you all the dates of that current month or until the end of the year as well There you go. Now, let us imagine that your manager tells you to add the dates of working days in the month of January. 
So how can you do that? It's simple. All you need to do is select the cell, go to the fill option, select series and here select column wise since you want the dates and columns and here in the type select date, date unit should be weekday and the stock value should be the next month, right? Since your manager asked for the weekdays of January. So your stock value will be the 1st of February. Press OK and there you go. So since the 1st of January is Friday, it's selected over here and the rest too, Saturday and Sunday are eliminated. Similarly, we have all the dates here of working days only. So that's how you use autofill in Excel. So on my screen, you can see a simple spreadsheet with student names and their marks on my sheet. So we will be calculating what are the total marks obtained by the students in overall subjects and calculate what is the percentage. Now we will carry forward a few simple inbuilt functions in Excel to calculate that. First, we will be calculating the sum of marks. So here equals to sum function and select the range of cells. Close the bracket, press enter. So you have the sum now. So we have to calculate it repeat. So by clicking on the same formula, now we have the total of all the subjects for individual students. And now let's calculate percentage. So usually we use the you know divide by option that is divide the total number of marks obtained by the total number of marks available. That is we will be dividing 407 by 500 and then we will be multiplying that into 100. So that's how we calculate the percentage. So cell G2 divided by cell H2, press enter and you will end up with, you know, uh, the decimal format. That's perfectly all right. Now we have also extended the same formula for all our cells. Now select this overall column or select the highlighted cells, right? And get into the data type. Here you have general. So that's why we have got that uh, decimal format. But when you press percentage, you'll have the actual percentage of all the students according to their marks achieved. Now we are on our Excel spreadsheet and this spreadsheet has some values of employees. That is their employee ID, name, designation, department, salary, date of birth and date of joining. Now our concern is to highlight some cells which are duplicate in this or some rows which are duplicate. So for example here you can see on row number 7 we have the details of Martha and you can see the same details of Martha in the row number 14 as well right so you need to eliminate those cells or you need to eliminate those rows now you can say there is a quick way just few clicks and those will be eliminated that is conditional formatting yes that is also one way but i'll show you what's the problem with that okay so let us select the entire table and get into conditional formatting and here you have duplicate values highlight cell rules with duplicate values and there you go the problem so here we have designation which is duplicated in certain ways, department and salary, state of joining, right? So there are certain conditions or scenarios where you cannot directly identify which is the duplicate row. Again, you can use the same for this, right? So you can select the entire uh, column of employee ID and you can uh, identify the duplicate cells here since the employee IDs are unique for everyone. So this is a way, but let's dig a little deeper and understand the way of highlighting duplicates with an advanced technique. So let me cancel this and for that, let's create a new uh, column. And let's name this as duplicate flag. E flag. So the new column has been created which is D flag. So here we will be using a simple formula that is count F and here press tab to select the formula and here we will be adding our uh, range that is which range are you considering. 
So the range will be the employee ID since employee IDs are unique for every employee. And, and let's press function F4 to fix it. And now uh, again the criteria and the criteria will be the same cell that is A2 and now close the bracket and press enter. Now let's track the same formula to all the rows. Okay. Now here we have. Now what you can do is uh, sort it in an advanced way. Go to sort and filter and custom sort and here you'll be sorting by the D flag and it will be smallest to largest. So now uh, you can apply the conditional formatting to highlight it. You can select the column H or the D flag. Go to conditional formatting, highlight cell rules and here you can get into greater than and give the value as 1. Okay. So all the cells which are you know repeated multiple times will be selected here and they will be highlighted with a selected color what you have given so I've given red so now you can select these cells and highlight them or delete them from your spreadsheet and now all your data in the spreadsheet is unique and clean now let's quickly get onto the practical mode where we will have some data sets over which we will be trying to apply the charts now there are various types of charts in tableau and those are the pie chart the column chart the bar chart column versus line pivot chart and spark line charts so we will discuss one after the other first let us discuss about the pie chart so as you can see we have a small data set on my screen which i have personally created and uh, this deals with the companies and this deals with the shares of the automobile industry so now for this let's create a pie chart select all the data and then get into the toolbar and inside the toolbar you can see various options and inside that we're going to use the insert option and when you select the insert option you will have a ribbon here and inside the ribbon you can see groups tables illustrations add-ins and here you go these are the charts so now we needed a pie chart so select on that icon and you have various types of pie charts. You have two dimensional pie charts, three dimensional pie charts, donut type of charts, etc. Right. So I would like to go with the three dimensional pie chart as it looks a little more appealing and easy to understand. And now there you go. This is the title of the chart and these are the legends of the chart. And this is the chart area and these are the values. Now we can, uh, you know, kind of add the data labels as well so you can just have to press the plus icon over here and you'll have the options you can add the data labels which will give you a lot more interesting values and uh, you can also turn this around as you can see we on double clicking any part of the pie chart you'll get this option which is called as format data point and uh, let's imagine that you wanted to show the information related to this particular one which is Volvo which has the biggest share so this is in front right now now what if you wanted to show the information related to Tata which is over here right for that you can select this particular arrow key and you can just twist it and there you go it is coming in front this will be a, a great way of presenting your data to your clients right yeah and there is another option where you can directly explode this like you can pick it out you can see this right point explosion where you can split it out and you can show that especially like you can highlight it and show it so that's the you know a great way of presenting your data so that's how you can work with pie charts in excel now let's quickly move to the next one that is the column chart and in the column chart we have the data related to some company and uh, the profits of that company based on a year so you can see that the year has started from 2008 and it has gone until 2021 and these are the profits of that company year after year so since we are dealing with column chart i'll tell you the simplest way to create a column chart there is a shortcut key for that which is alt f1 and there you go you have the chart right on your screen now you can uh, expand the chart just by dragging it like that and you can see that there is some problem with this chart that is 
we have numbers here instead of years right you can see that the first column is the years which is 2008 to 2021 but here you can see we have one two three four which is not proper right so to change the axis that is you can see the axis which is one two three let me expand my screen a little bit yeah so if you look at my screen we have two different columns one column is about the years and the second column is about the revenue now what we want to do is we want to create a line graph where we have year on the x-axis and revenue on the y-axis and we will be generating a line graph based on the data we have now for that we have to select the entire data what we have then we need to go into the insert option in the toolbar and then you can see a lot of chart options in the insert ribbon now here you can see that we have a line chart or area chart option select that and here you can see 2d line graphs now let's select the first one and there you go you have the line chart here now let's rename the title and there is one problem with the chart here you can see that the x-axis is not actually pointing the ears you can make a change to that no worries just right click and then you can see the select data option and there you go you have the edit option here just edit it and now select the range i am selecting the ears now let's select okay and there you go you have the ears here you can just try to expand it a little more So now you have the revenue on the y-axis and year on the x-axis and this shows the growth of revenue in your company. So this is how you create a line graph in Excel. Play down. Now, let us imagine that you are the CEO of an IT company and you have taken up multiple projects. Let us imagine that you wish to keep track of all the projects. So, what if there was a tool which could keep track of all the projects in the form of a detailed visualization with the percentage in the form of a graph or a bar chart? Interesting, right? That's exactly what we are going to design today using Microsoft Excel. So, without further ado, let's get started with our one point agenda that is progress tracker in Excel. Now, to design a progress tracker in Excel, let us get back to the practical mode where we might have to use our Microsoft Excel. Now we are on the Microsoft Excel and we have taken some sample data to make things look simple. So here we are considering a set of students and their attendance percentage. So we will be using this particular data and design a progress tracker. Now let us try to increase the size of the cells. Now select all the cells in the attendance column. Now we have selected all the cells in the attendance column and in the toolbar select the home tab and inside the home tab you have styles group. Inside the styles group select conditional formatting and inside the conditional formatting option select new rule. So in the new rule we want to select the first option that is format all cells based on their values. Now here, you can see format style. Since we are trying to create a data bus, we need to select the option of data bus here. And under the data bar options, we have some more options on the drop down menu. So here in the type, select number. And the minimum number is zero. It is automatically stored here. And the maximum value is again a number and let us provide it as one. Now here you can select the color for your bars. Now since we have already chosen green for all the column headers, let's choose blue and select OK. Now here you can see that the 
values are being indicated using bar graphs right and you can also see the percentage values but we can make it look a little more better by shifting them to the left side and text could be given as white so that it's more uh, vibrant to look at and now we can also apply some conditional formatting onto these attendance columns so let us try to highlight the students having attendance less than 65 percent so highlight cell rules less than 65 percent attendance with red color select ok and there you go you have the progress tracker right on your screen and using the same principles you can track the attendance for all the students and also you can apply some conditional formatting onto all your cells and highlight the ones which are not on the track now this is how you can implement progress trackers using excel now for this particular example we are going to use the employees data now let's quickly get back to the practical mode and enter into excel now you can see that we are on excel sheet right now so let me expand my screen a little bit so that the data is a little more visible yeah so here on my screen you can see that we have employees data so the first column is the name of the employees and the second column is the start dates of the employees that when have they started working with the organization and when they have ended or resigned to their position in that particular organization and the duration gives us the number of days they have worked in that particular organization so to create a gantt chart is really simple you just have to select the data and then go to the insert option and in there you can see the charts icon and select all charts and in that select the bar chart and here you can see the stacked bar chart select that and press ok and there you go you have the stacked bar chart right on your screen let's expand this a little more so that we have the clear visualization of the dates as well now you can if you want you can change the title as org data or employee data And now we are partially done with our chart. Now the next thing we have to do is select the bar chart, right click on it, select data and here select the add icon. Now you need to select the series name. So the series name is duration for our Gantt chart and series values are, let's select this and select, let's move a little. Yeah, so these are the data series. Let's select OK and you can see the Gantt chart on my screen right here. Select OK and it's done. And still now it's not complete yet. So to finish it, you need to select the blue colored bars here and right click on them and select Format Data Series. Go to the fill icon and select No Fill. And it's done for now and you can see that there is a difference in this particular arrangement we had joe at the first place and susan at the last place but here you can see joe is in the last place and susan is in the first place so we need to make some arrangements here for that right click select format access and then here you can see categorize in reverse order and there you go it should be done and there you go, you have your Gantt chart right on your screen. Excel is a really powerful tool for data analytics and reporting. And pivot tables are one of the features that Excel offers for creating tabular reports to summarize our data. Let's begin by understanding what is a pivot table. A pivot table is a tool that summarizes and reorganizes selected columns and rows of data in a spreadsheet to obtain a desired report. It does not actually change the spreadsheet data it simply pivots or turns the data to view it in different perspectives. Pivot tables are especially useful with large amounts of data that would be time consuming to calculate manually. Now, let's understand the different components of a pivot table. So there are four main components. First we have rows. When a field is chosen for the row area, 
it populates as the first column in the pivot table. Similar to the columns, all row labels are unique values and duplicates are removed. Columns is the second component. When a field is chosen for the column area, only the unique values of the field are listed across the top. Then we have values. Each value is kept in a pivot table cell and displays the summarized information. The most common values are sum, average, minimum and maximum. Finally, we have filters. Filters apply a calculation or restriction to the entire table. So let's jump over to Microsoft Excel and let me show you the data set that we will use in this demo. So with India being ready for its 16th census in 2021, that is next year, it is a good time for us to analyze India's last census data from 2011 and see where different states and cities across India stood in terms of population, literacy and other socio-economic factors. We will analyze this data by creating different pivot tables in Excel and explore some of its features. So let's begin. First I'll show you one of the features that Excel offers us. So suppose I click on any cell and hit Ctrl plus Q. You can see our entire table is selected and at the right bottom there's an option of Quick Analysis. Now you can see by default Excel has prompted certain features such as formatting, we have charts, totals and there's one more called tables. Now Excel by default has created some pivot tables for us. Now the first one you see is sum of district code by state names. Next we have sum of sex ratio by state name. Then we have sum of child sex ratio, sum of male graduates and sum of female graduates by state name and there are others. Before creating our pivot table, so let's have a final look at our data set. So first column you see is the city column. So there are different cities from different parts of India. Then we have the state code, we have the state name, district code, we have the total population followed by male and female population. Next you can see we have the total literates from each city. Then we have the male and female literates. Next we have the sex ratio. Then we have the child sex ratio. Next we have total number of graduates. And finally you can see we have male and female graduates. So using this table, we'll create several pivot tables. Now first of all, let's create a pivot table to find the total population for each state and sort it in descending order. So you can see here, we have the problem statement. So our first pivot table will have the total population for each of the states in descending order. So to create a pivot table, you can click any cell in your data, go to the insert tab and here left you can see we have the option to create a pivot table. So let me select pivot table. Now my range is already selected the entire table and here I'll choose existing worksheet because I want to place my pivot table in the same worksheet and I'll give my location I'll point to cell Q5. Now let me click OK. You can see the pivot table fields appears here on the right. Now since we want to find the total population for each state, so what I'll do is I'll drag my state name onto rows. So here in our pivot table you can see we have the different state names listed. Now we want the total population for each of these states. So in the field list, I'll search for total population, which is this one, and drag it under values. You can see we have our sum of total population for each of these states. By default, Excel will sum any numeric column. You can always change it to average, minimum, maximum, anything you want. Now we want to sort this column in descending order. So I right click, go to sort option and choose Z to A that is largest to smallest. You can see here, in 2011, Maharashtra had the highest number of population or the total population in Maharashtra was the highest. Then it was Uttar Pradesh, we had Andhra Pradesh and if I come down, we have Nagaland and Andaman and Nicobar Islands towards the end. So this is a simple pivot table that we created. Now the next problem we have is, we want to find the total sum of literates in each city belonging to a certain state. So let's see how to do it. I'll click on any cell, go to insert 
and here I can click on pivot table. My range is selected. I'll choose existing worksheet and give my location which is Q5. I click on OK. Now here we want to find the total sum of literates. So what I'll do is first let me drag total literates column to values. You have the total sum of literates from all the states. Next, I want to see the sum of total literates based on states and cities. So let me first drag state name onto rows and then we'll drag city onto rows. You can see here we have our pivot table ready. To the left of the pivot table, you can see we have the state names and the cities per state. And on the right, you can see the total number of literates from each city. If I scroll down, we have Assam, then you can see we have Bihar. And if I keep scrolling, we have all the states, Haryana, Himachal Pradesh, there's Jammu and Kashmir, which has now become a union territory. We have Jharkhand, Karnataka and other states as well. Moving on. Okay, so the next thing we want to see is what is the average sex ratio and the child sex ratio for each state. With that, we also want to find the states that had the highest and lowest sex ratio in 2011. So let's create a pivot table for this. I'll click on any cell, go to insert, choose pivot table, click on existing worksheet. I'll select cell Q5 and click on OK. Now, since we want the average sex ratio and the child sex ratio so first I'll drag those columns either you can manually scroll and drag it or here you have the option to search for it so if I look for child you can see we have the same column listed you can just drag it from there let me delete this and I also want the sex ratio so I'll place it on top of child sex ratio next we want to see it based on different states. So what I'll do is, I'll take state name and put it under rows. So here you can see we have our pivot table ready. On the left, you can see we have the different state names listed. And on the right, we have the values. Now we want to find the average. Now by default, Excel will sum the numeric columns. You can see it, it tells you sum of sex ratio and child sex ratio. So what you can do, you can click on this drop down and go to value field settings. And here summarize values by you can choose average. You can see the custom name. It says average of sex ratio. Click on OK. Our entire column is now giving us the average sex ratio. Similarly for this column let me convert it into average I'll again click on the drop down go to value field settings click on average and click OK and you can see here we have the average of child sex ratio for each of the states now the next question says which states had the highest and lowest sex ratio so we'll consider this column so we'll sort it in any order you want you can do it either ascending or descending let me short it in descending order you can see we have our column sorted now so in 2011 Kerala had the highest sex ratio and if I scroll down to the bottom you can see Himachal Pradesh had the lowest which is around 818 up next let's explore one more feature of pivot table so suppose you want to see the top or bottom few rows of a pivot table, you can do that as well. So here we have a question at hand. We want to find the top three cities with the highest number of female graduates. So let's see from the entire pivot table how we can filter the top three cities. So I'll go to insert, click on the pivot table option, go to existing worksheet, click on Q5 and hit OK. Now, since we want to find the top three cities, I'll drag city column onto rows and then we want the female graduates. So in the search bar, I'll look for female and I'll choose this column that is female graduates and drag it here onto values. 
so i have the sum of female graduates for each of the cities now since we want to find the highest number of female graduates in the top three cities so let me first sort this column i'll sort it in descending order now we have it sorted now from this you can say that delhi greater mumbai and bangalore are the top three cities but it's displaying all the cities for us so let's filter only the top three so what you can do is right click and go to filter under filter you have the option of top 10 i'll select this here i only want the top three so either you can go down like this or you can directly type three your column is already selected let me just click on ok there you go we have the required pivot table ready and it only displays us the top three cities with the highest number of female graduates now the next thing we want to see is how to use a slicer in a pivot table so we have a question here what's the total population for all the cities in rajasthan and karnataka so let's create a pivot table for this and see how you can use a slicer to filter the table click on existing i'll click on a location this time q6 click ok now since i want the total population so i'll drag total population onto values and then i'll select the city onto rows and then the state name also i'll place it on top of city so you have in the pivot table all the states and their cities and on the right you can see the total population for each of these cities but our question is we want to find only for Rajasthan and Karnataka now for that what you can do is go to insert and create a slicer either you can create from this option or you can go to pivot table analyze option and here you have the option to create or insert a slicer I click on this and since we want to slice the table based on state that is Rajasthan and Karnataka I will choose state name as my slicer field you can see this is my slicer here now you only want the data for Rajasthan and Karnataka so I will search for these two so here we have Karnataka so let me select Karnataka first and I also want for Rajasthan so let me select Rajasthan also you can see in our pivot table we only have data for Rajasthan and Karnataka so this pivot table shows you different cities from Karnataka and the total sum of population from each of the cities and similarly we also have for Rajasthan moving ahead now we will see another very interesting feature of pivot that is how you can create percentage contribution of a table for example we have a question here what's the percentage contribution of male and female literates from each state now we want to see in terms of percentage and not as sum or average let's do that I'll create my pivot table click on existing and I'll select an empty cell okay now here since we want to find the percentage contribution of male and female literates so first I'll drag male literates onto values followed by female literates onto values by default it has summed up the male literates and female literates value and also I want to drag state column to rows so here you can see the sum of male literates and female literates per state I want to convert this as percentage contribution so what we can do is I'll select any cell and I'll right click and I'll go to show value as and here I have the option to select percentage of grand total so I'll select this you can see we have the percentage contribution of male literates to the total now if I sort this you will get to know which state 
contributed or has the highest percentage contribution. So we have Maharashtra for male literates. Then we had Uttar Pradesh in 2011. If I come down, we had Meghalaya, Nagaland and Andaman and Nicobar Islands as those states which had little or minimal contribution to male literates. Similarly, let's do it for female literates. I'll go to show value as and select percentage of grand total. So you can see here also Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, then Gujarat and all had the highest percentage contribution to female literates. So this is another good feature to convert your data and see it in terms of percentage. Now moving ahead, let's say we want to find the bottom three cities from each state that had the lowest female graduates. We can do that as well. I'll go to insert, click on pivot, go to existing worksheet, select an empty worksheet and click on OK. Now since I want to see based on states as well as cities, so let me drag the state name first onto rows and let's drag the city column onto rows. Next, we want female graduates. So let me look for female graduates in the field list. I'll drag it onto values. Now we have the list of states and their respective cities. And to the right of the pivot table, you can see the sum of female graduates from each city. Now, first I'll sort this column. I'll right click, go to sort and click on sortest to largest. Now we have sorted our female graduates from sortest or smallest to largest. Now since I want to find the bottom three cities from each state, I'll come to the cell, right click, go to filter and select top 10. Now I'll replace top 10 with bottom and I want the bottom three cities from each state. I have my column selected that is sum of female graduates. If I click on OK, you can see here some of the states don't have three cities. So you can see Andaman and Nicobar Islands has only one city that is Port Blair. While the remaining you can find the bottom three cities with the lowest number of female graduates. So Andhra Pradesh had these three. In Assam we had Nagao, then there was Dibrugarh and Silchar. Similarly, if I come down in Haryana, we have Palwal, Kathal and Zind. If I come further, here you can see for Karnataka, there's Gangavati, there's Rani Benur and there's Kolar. Similarly, you can see for Kerala as well. Now moving ahead. Now in the next example, I'll tell you how you can create a calculated field or a calculated column in Excel with the help of a pivot table. So in a pivot table, you can create or use custom formulas to create calculated fields or items. Calculated fields are formulas that can refer to other fields in the pivot table. Calculated fields appear with other value fields in the pivot table. Like other value fields, a calculated fields name may proceed with sum of followed by the field name. So here we have a sales table that has columns like the items which has different fruits and vegetables and those have been categorized as fruits and vegetables. We have the price per kg and this is in terms of rupees and we have the quantity that was sold. Now let's see if you want to find the sales for each item in the table, you can create a calculated field. So your sales column is going to be the product of price per kg and quantity. So let me show you how you can do that with the help of a pivot table. I'll create a pivot table first, click on an empty cell, hit OK. Now, if you see on the top, under pivot table analyze and under calculations, we have the option fields, items and sets. If I click on this drop down, I get the option to create a calculated field or insert a calculated field. I click on this, I'll give my field name as sales and I'll select my formula. I'll first click on price per kg and hit insert field. I'll give a space, hit shift 8 to give 
the product symbol and then I'll double click on quantity. Now this is my formula for sales that is price per kg multiplied by quantity. I'll click on add and I click on OK. If you see here, there's a calculated field that is present in the pivot table fields, which is sales, but it did not add it to our original table. Our original table is the same, but here we have added a calculated field, which is present only in the pivot table list. Now we can use this. It has already taken it under values. Now so let's say I want to find the sum of sales for each item under each category. You can see it here. We have our category fruit and we have our category vegetable. And under that we have different items like apple, apricot, banana. Similarly in vegetables, we have broccoli, the carrots, corn, eggplant and others. So this is how you can create a calculated field in a pivot table. Now there's one more good feature that Excel offers us in pivot table is to create a pivot chart. So you can use your pivot table and create different charts. So I'll show you how to do that. If I go to insert, here I have the option of recommended charts. If I click on this, Excel gives me some default charts which you can use. Let's say I'll select this. Let me drag it a bit to the right. Here you can see I'll close this pivot field list. This is a nice bar chart that Excel has created. This is called a pivot chart. Now here you can see the category fruits and vegetables and the different fruits and vegetables or the items. In the Y axis, you can see the total sales. If you see from the graph, guava made the highest amount of sales. Now if I sort this, let's sort this first. You can see it here fruit guava made the highest amount of sales. Now since I sorted and changed my pivot table, the pivot chart also automatically gets updated. Similarly, there are other charts also that you can create. Let's go to the insert tab and let's click on recommended charts again. Let's look for a pie chart. So this is a pie chart that you can create. Let me click on OK. So here is our pie chart and each pie represents a certain item and the pie that has the highest area represents it had the highest amount of sales. In this case, you can see it is guava and similarly we have other items as well. This is fruit banana, that's corn and we have spinach and others. Let's explore a few other charts. So first I'll click on my pivot table, go to insert and under recommended charts, let's now select a line chart. If I hit OK, move it to the right. So this is a line chart. You can see it starts from guava, which had the highest amount of sales, then it drops. And in the X axis, you can see the different items. Similarly, when it starts with the vegetables, broccoli made the highest amount of sales with 2800 rupees. And our lowest was eggplant at 900 rupees. For fruits, papaya sold the least at 700 rupees. Let's take another chart. I'll go to insert. Under recommended charts, let's see. This time we'll see a bar chart. Now this is a horizontal bar chart and not a vertical one. We just saw a vertical column chart like this. This is a horizontal bar chart. Now you can always increase and decrease the size of these charts. Let's explore a last chart. Let's take the area chart for now. So this is an area chart. Again, it looks similar to the line chart. It starts with guava, which had the highest amount of sales. Similarly, papaya under fruits had the lowest amount of sales. Under vegetables, it was broccoli. And finally, eggplant made the lowest amount of sales under vegetable. Now let's go to our first sheet and summarize what we have done in this demo for pivot tables in Excel. So we had our data. This is a 2011 census data from India. We had the different cities, the state names, and we had the total population, total literates, 
female literates, male literates, we had the sex ratio, total graduates and other information. So we began by understanding how to create a simple pivot table where we calculated the total population for each state and sorted it in descending order. We found that Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh had the total population in 2011. Then we saw another pivot table where we calculated the total sum of literates in each city belonging to a certain state. So you can see we had the different state names and the cities under each state. Then we saw another feature where you could calculate the average of a certain numerical column. So here we calculated the average sex ratio and the child sex ratio for each state and found out which one had the highest and lowest sex ratio. After that, we saw how you could find or filter tables. We saw how to find the top three cities with the highest number of female graduates. We found out that Delhi, Greater Mumbai and Bangalore were the top cities with highest number of female graduates. Next, we saw how to use slicer in a pivot table. So we sliced our table based on Rajasthan and Karnataka state and saw the total population for all the cities in Rajasthan and Karnataka. In the next sheet, we explored another feature that was to find the percentage contribution of male and female literates from each state. Then here we saw how to find out the bottom three cities for each state having lowest female graduates. Now one thing marked that some of the states did not have three cities. For example, Andaman had only one city that was Port Blair, but the others we found out the bottom three cities that had the lowest female graduates. Finally, we looked at how to create a calculated field in a pivot table. So we saw how to create a calculated field called sales and then we explored how to create different charts and graphs. So this was an area chart that we saw. There's a column chart. We also saw or looked at a bar chart that was a horizontal bar chart. Similarly, we saw how to create a pie chart as well. So how to create a pivot chart you ask? It is really simple. All you need to do is just follow few steps and you have your pivot chart ready, which is completely interactive. Now all you have to do is select any cell in the data set you have and rush into the insert toolbar. Then in the group of charts, you have an option called pivot chart. Select on it. Now you'll be asked to select the data range and you can see Excel has automatically select all the range that you want to include in your pivot chart. Then you have another option which is asking you to either create the pivot chart in the current worksheet or a new worksheet. For now, let's select a new worksheet. And there you go. Voila, the pivot chart is completely ready. You might ask me, this is completely empty. Yes, the default pivot chart, what you get from Excel will be completely empty, but you can add the legends and all the data that you want to add onto your pivot chart just by dragging and dropping the data from the right hand side of your Excel sheet that is from the pivot chart fields. So you can see we have various options, region, category, state, subcategory, sales, quantity, etc. Now I'll add region. I'll add region to access. And comparatively, we will see the sales that are happening in those particular regions by dragging sales into values. Now you have all the data in the form of pivot chart which is completely interactive which represents the sales happening in those regions now you can also select a particular region right by default all the regions are selected but if you want to select only central then you can do that by deselecting everything and select only central and select ok and there you go you have all the data related to the sales happening in the central region now if you want to you know kind of see all the uh, categories of sales happening in all the regions you can drag the category into values again and uh, in the region part okay I think we have to add category into legends yes now select uh, regions that, that is all regions and select ok and you can see the category wise sales in all the regions at one single go and I hope you did not observe it clearly uh, 
the excel also gives you the completely prepared pivot table as well right which is also interactive you can also get to choose the data from here as well and select ok and you'll see that being reflected on the pivot chart so here you can see both pivot table and pivot charts are completely interactive done now here we have four different sheets of the sales so the first sheet is the west zone next is south zone east zone and central zone so all this data belongs to one single sheet that is superstore data set so i have categorized or i have taken a part of the data which belongs to central region south region west region and east region now we are going to use all these four sheets and create one single sheet which is the pivot table of all the four sheets now without further ado let's start the process now for that we might want to use the shortcut key that is alt d now press p now this starts the pivot chart wizard now here we have to choose the option multiple consolidation ranges then click on next and here you can see the pivot table is clicked by default now we'll go to next now here click i will create page fields or the pivot chart wizard will automatically create if you want that to create for you now click on next now here let's select the range now i'll be selecting the range add it now next we'll select east add it followed by that we have south and finally we have west now we will name these according to the regions so the first one will be west next one will be south next one will be east and the last one will be central click on next and here select new worksheet and finish and there you go you have the pivot table here now you might want to change the summation value so click anywhere on the pivot table and change it from count to sum so that you have the summation of the total number of sales subcategory sales and grand total of sales etc now here you can see all option now let's select central and you'll get the details of the central region the grand total and the sales happening quantity of sales etc now here you can, you can see the furniture office supplies technology and the grand total all in one single sheet now let's get back to the original sheet so as you can see this is the original sheet and in the original sheet you can see various more categories which is the which is the shipment mode, customer, customer segment, country, city, state, uh, and you also have uh, product name, subcategory, etc. So if you had added all these into this sheet, you can also create a separate option of adding minute details to your pivot table. So that is how the pivot table is created using multiple sheets. Mail merge in Excel is a simple yet spectacular method to write similar emails to hundreds and thousands of recipients without a hassle or even a single error. Let us imagine that you are supposed to write an interview call letter to multiple recipients. So what if you had like five recipients? You could do five different emails and you could send them. But what if you had 50 or even 500, right? That would seem a little troublesome and you might even feel that you might want a whole team to do that, right? But what if I say that you can do the same with one single mail within a matter of minutes, you send all the emails to all the 50 or 500 recipients. Sounds interesting, right? So now in this particular tutorial, we are going to do the same. Now without further ado, let's directly get onto the practical mode and start our Excel and try to do some mail merge in Excel. Now we are on practical mode and we have started our Microsoft Excel. So 
regarding the example we discussed earlier that is sending an interview call letter to multiple people that's what exactly this excel sheet does so here we have about 25 members or 25 candidates with their first name last name and email and their address written over now where is our call letter now this happens to be our call letter so the call letter is been sent from an imaginary company that is smart solutions private limited india and followed by that we are having one recipient here who happens to be mia and uh, the subject and everything all the text related to the interview call now we are trying to send this one single interview call letter to all the 25 people now the only change that is going to happen is the recipient's name and address is going to change and the addressing for example here you can see dear mia so instead of dear mia we're going to greet the recipient with their particular name so that's what we're going to try to do now so to do that you have to go into the toolbar and select mailings option in the mailings option you can see the start mail merge select recipients edit recipient and all other options so here you might want to select the second group and inside the second group you have an option called select recipients click on that and now it will show you some options the first one is type a new list so if you are having some list then you can type in or if you already have an existing list like what we did creating an excel sheet and storing all the email and address and all the recipients complete details you can use that as well so here we're going to use the existing list so click on that now it will show you a new dialog box using which you have to navigate to the existing list so our existing list is named as mail merge so click on that and select open now press ok now the next part is to address all the details so here you can see that to address and after that you can see the addressing of the recipient now we have to encode this mail in such a way that to all the recipients automatically excel will replace the addresses names and the greetings right now let's try that now let's try to encode the address part so highlight the address part and in the same mail links option you can find the address block in write and insert fields ribbon so let's select that and now you can see the address of everyone right so this is the preview of the recipient's address now you can see that the recipient's full name and state is only available here not the street and house number etc now you can fix that by selecting the match fields option and here you can include the address so which might be the house department and the second one would be street and uh, postal code you can match it with pin code and that's all yeah remaining we have everything else let's look at the preview and this is how it looks like perfect now let's select ok Now that's fine and uh, similarly we will also try to match the just a moment yeah similarly we'll try to encode the recipient's name now for that let's go into the greetings line here you can see you can select the option dear sir or dear ma'am or to whomever may, may concern and uh, here you have another option to or just dear so we'll go with dear and this is how the preview looks like and if you're happy with that it's okay and if you want to parallelly check for other things i mean other recipients you can also do that for example the next recipient is santosh shastri and followed by him we have prabhakar reddy rajesh saho right you can also check everything and here you can also see the address changing on the mail so you can check for jagadish chari his address and his name right so it looks like it's working perfectly now select ok and that's done
Now we are in the final stage and in the mailings option, you can see the last two options and that is the preview results and finish. So before merging and finishing the mail merge, we shall go through a quick preview to check if everything is fine or not. So here you can see we have the address block. This is how the encoding looks like. And uh, if you replace the encoding with the actual address and name, this is how the actual address and name look like. And you can check all the letters. You can just click on the arrow key here and you can check all the recipient's address and their uh, names, right? So if you can find any errors, you can replace them. And if not, if everything is fine, then you can just quickly press on the finish and merge option. When you finish merge option or finish and merge option, you get three different options. That is edit individual documents, print documents and send all these to the recipients. Now, if you had any queries or if you had any doubts about or if you find any errors on the emails, then you can go to that particular individual document and edit it with the first option. And in the second option, you can print all the documents. Like if you want to send a hard copy, then you can print it. So you can see here all and select OK. And then you can, you know, kind of save it as a PDF or you can send the location of your printer and then just press OK. Right, you can just save them in the form of PDF or you can directly send the emails. Right now I'm not connected to any printer so I'm not going to print any documents. Now let us try the last one. This should be interesting. Now when you select the mail option then it automatically selects the email column from your Excel sheet. Remember we had an email column from Excel sheet, right? This particular column. Word automatically selects that column from Excel and you can just select OK and all the mails will be sent to all these imaginary mailing addresses. So that's how it's done. What is Excel VLOOKUP? VLOOKUP stands for Vertical Lookup. VLOOKUP lets you search for specific information in your spreadsheet. It allows you to search for a particular value in a column and returns another value from a different column but of the same row. VLOOKUP takes advantage of vertically aligned tables to quickly find data associated with the value the user enters. Now, let's look at the syntax to write a VLOOKUP function. So VLOOKUP takes four parameters or arguments. You can see it here. There are four arguments in the VLOOKUP function. So the first argument is called the lookup value. The lookup value represents the value that you are searching for. Next is the table array. The table array represents two or more columns of information. The third argument is called the column index number. Now this represents the column number in the table from which the value must be returned. The first column is 1, the second column is 2 and so on. And then we have the fourth parameter which is called the range lookup. Now this parameter is optional. Now range lookup is used to find an exact match. So if you want to find an exact match, you need to enter false or zero. Meanwhile, if you want an approximate match, you need to enter true or one. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit Scale Up by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Now, let me give you a brief overview on what's going to be in our demo. So for our demonstration, we'll use a sales data set. You can see the data set on the left. Using this data set, We'll understand how VLOOKUP performs an exact and approximate match. We'll see how VLOOKUP is case insensitive. Then we'll perform a wildcard character search. We'll understand how to handle errors when a match is not found. And finally, you will look at two way lookups. Now here is a small example of how VLOOKUP works. So we want to find the unit sold by Morgan using the data set on the left. So here you can see I have the data set. It has some rows and columns. So these are the columns which are order date, region, there's a representative column, item, units, there's unit cost and total. And from this table, I want to find the units that were sold by Morgan. Now if you look at the table at the bottom, you can see the representative name Morgan and Morgan has sold 30 units. 
Now I want to find this value using the VLOOKUP function. So here on the right you can see I have my lookup value which is Morgan and this is my VLOOKUP formula and using this formula I am getting the result as 30. Now let's go to our Excel workbook and perform all the demos one by one. So this is my Excel workbook that we are going to use for our demo and here is the data set we'll be using. Now this is the same data set that you saw a while ago. So this data set has seven columns. You have the order date, the region, representative's name, item, there's units, unit cost and total, which is basically the total or the amount of sales that was generated. Now we are going to use a chunk of this data set and perform our VLOOKUP analysis. So let's see our first example and the problem we have at hand. Let me go to the exact match tab. All right. So here I'm going to use this chunk of data, which is actually taken from the original data set. So we have taken the first 11 rows from the data set. You can see from row two till row 12 is going to be our data set that we'll use. So we have a question here. We want to find the items sold by Thompson. So here Thompson is my lookup value which means looking at Thompson, I want to find the item that he sold. So if you consider our table here, you can see we have the representative's name Thompson right here. And from the table, you can see Thompson sold pencil. And I want to get this value, which is pencil using my VLOOKUP function. So let's go ahead and write our VLOOKUP function. I'll consider this as my lookup value. And here under item, I'm going to write my VLOOKUP formula. To write the VLOOKUP formula, I'll write first equal to and I'll write VLOOKUP. Now, if I hit tab, it will auto complete. All right. Now let's give the parameters. So first is going to be the lookup value, which is nothing but Thompson. So I'll just select this cell, which is J17, comma. Now it's asking to give the table array. So the table array is the table from which you want to retrieve a value. One thing to keep in mind is that the value you are looking for should be the first column of a table and you can select the table array till the end of the data set or till the column which has the value you want to find. So here I'll select my table array starting from the representatives column till the end of the item column, which is going to be my table array. Then I'll select the column index number. So the column index number is based on the table array you have selected. In this case, my column index number is going to be two because we have selected just two columns and the value which I'm going to find is in the second column. So I'll give two comma. Now the range lookup I'm going to give is false because I want to find an exact match. So either you can hit tab or you can write zero, which means false. If I close the bracket and hit enter, it will return me the item that Thompson had sold, which is pencil. You can verify from the table that Thompson had sold pencil. All right. Now let's try to change the table array and see what result are we getting. So this time I'll slightly change the table array. So again, we are trying to find the item that Thompson had sold. So I'll write my formula equal to VLOOKUP. I'll hit tab to auto complete. I'll give my lookup value as Thompson, comma. This time I'm choosing my table array starting from the representatives column till the end of the data set, which is till P12. Again, my column index number is going to be two because if you consider this table array, the item column is the second column in the selected table array. So I'm going to write it as two, comma. The range lookup I want to give as false because I want to find the exact match. If I close this and hit enter, you can see it has returned me the same result that we saw earlier. Now suppose, let's say this time I want to start my table array from the region column, which is this column. So I want to select my table array starting from the region column. Now this is going to show me an error because your table array should always start from the lookup value column. So if you consider Thompson as the lookup value, my table array should always start from the representatives column. So let's just try this example. So I'll write VLOOKUP. My lookup value, I'm going to give it as Thompson, 
comma the table array as I mentioned earlier I'm going to choose from the region column and let's say I'll select till the item column give another comma and this time my column index number is going to be 3 because since the table array has three columns and my item column is the last column so I'm going to give my column index number is 3 comma I want to get the exact match so I'll give 0 if I close the bracket and hit enter you can see it has given me an error okay now let me just show you another method to use VLOOKUP in Excel so here on the top you can see there's a formulas tab and under formulas tab under function library you see we have an option to select lookup and reference if I click on this and if I scroll down below you can see there's an option called VLOOKUP let's choose this alright now here you can give your lookup value, your table array, column index number and the range lookup under this function arguments dialog box. So here I want to select my lookup value as Thompson. My table array is going to be from the representatives column till let's say the end of the data set. My column index number is going to be 2. I'll write 2 and range lookup I'll write as false because I want the exact match. Now if I hit OK, you can see it has given us the exact same result. So this is one of the other ways to use VLOOKUP in Excel. Now let's move to the next sheet which is regarding approximate match. Okay, so sometimes you might have cases where you don't have the lookup value present in the table. In those cases, you can tell VLOOKUP to return an approximate match. Now one thing to keep in mind is that your lookup value column should always be sorted in ascending order while trying to get an approximate match. So here we are going to use this table and my lookup value column which is going to be the representatives column is already sorted in ascending order. And let's see the question we have here. So I want to find the item sold and the unit cost for mat. So my lookup value is going to be mat. Now if you see this table I don't have the representative's name mat anywhere in the table. Now using an approximate match I want to find the item and the unit cost. So let's do it. So here under item I'll write my VLOOKUP formula. So I'll type VLOOKUP. I'll hit tab to complete it. And this time my lookup value is going to be mat. So I'll select this cell comma. My table array I'll select from the representative's column till the end of item column because I want to find the item value for mat. I'll give a comma. My column index number as per the table array is going to be 2, comma. My range lookup this time I'm going to give is true or 1. So I'll write 1, close the bracket, hit enter. All right. It has written me binder was the item sold by mat. Now let's try to figure out why VLOOKUP returned binder as the item. Now let's say you were asked to insert the name mat to the representative column in alphabetical order. So where would you place it? Ideally, you should place between Kivel and Morgan. Since this column is already sorted, mat should appear before Morgan and after Kivel. So in an approximate match, VLOOKUP will consider the previous highest value. In this case, the previous highest value before mat is Kivel and hence VLOOKUP returned the corresponding item purchased by Kivel which is binder. Now similarly, if you wanted to find the unit cost for mat, again VLOOKUP will return the unit cost of Kivel which is 125. Let's just try it out. So I'll write VLOOKUP. My lookup value is mat, comma. My table array for this time is going to be from representatives column till the unit cost column I'll consider. I'll give a comma. Now the column index number as per the table array is going to be 4. I'll give another comma and this time I'll double click true because I want an approximate match. If I close the bracket, hit enter, you can see it has returned me 125 which is actually Kivel's unit cost. Okay. We have another question and this time I want to find the units sold by Rob. Now Rob is going to be 
my lookup value if you see the representatives column we don't have rob now let's see what vlookup is going to return as the item for rob so i'll write vlookup i'll give my lookup value as rob comma my table array is going to start from the representatives column i'll select till here i'll give a comma my column index number is 2 i'll give another comma i'll double click on true so i close the bracket hit enter you can see vlookup has returned me pen now let's understand why vlookup returned pen for rob now if you are asked to insert the representative's name rob into this column so ideally rob would appear somewhere between morgan and sorvino because since this is sorted in ascending order rob is actually greater than morgan and is less than sorvino so as you know we look up in an approximate match returns the previous highest value which is morgan here and the corresponding item for morgan is pen and hence we look up returned pen for rob all right now moving to the next sheet which is another property of vlookup which tells vlookup always looks to the right this means that your lookup value must always be on the left and the value you are going to find out should always be to the right of the table the consider this scenario where your lookup value is on the left in this case it is the representative's value and i have taken sorvino for an example and we want to find the order date for sorvino now if you consider this table your lookup value which is sorvino is actually this column the representatives column and we are going to find out the order date so your representatives name is on the right of the table and the value we are going to find out is on the left of the table now as per the property we lookup only looks to the right so if i use the we lookup function for this example here i'll write we lookup I'll give my lookup value as sorvino comma my table array I'll consider from the order date because I want the order date till the representatives column I'll give a comma and this time my column index number is actually the first column if I consider my table array as the first 3 columns selected and my range lookup is going to be false if I close the bracket hit enter it returns me an error the reason is we look up always looks to the right and this time the value we were trying to find out was to the left of the table now if you consider the opposite case suppose you have the order date and you want to find the representative's name you can do that easily because your lookup value which is the order date is on the left and your representative's column is on the right so let's just try this i'll write we look up my look up value is going to be sorvino's order date so i'll select it from the table i'll give a comma my table array will start from the j column let's say i'll select the entire table comma and my column index number will be 3 if you consider these as my table array comma my range look up is 0 if i close this hit enter you can see we have got sorvino corresponding to the order date all right now let's move to the next tab now this tab says we look up returns only the first match so we have a question at hand the question is find the units sold by jardin if you see this table we have the representative's name jardin twice you see here and if you look down we have jardin here as well but the item sold by jardin at the first instance is pencil and at the second instance it's desk now as per the property we look up always returns the first match now ideally when we write the we look up function and look for the units sold by jardin you will see we look up will return 36 instead of 3 let's just try it out i'll write the we look up function my lookup value is jardin comma my table array i'll select from the representative's column till the end of units column i'll give a comma my column index number based on the table array is 3 i'll give another comma now i want the 
exact match so i'll select zero close the bracket and hit enter now as you can see it returns me the first match of jardine which is 36 so vlookup did not consider the second match now similarly if you consider this table we have jones repeated thrice so you have jones here you have jones here for the second time and also we have jones for the third time and let's say you want to find the unit cost for jones so if i write the vlookup function i'll consider my lookup value as jones comma my table array i'll select from the representatives column till the end of unit cost column i'll give a comma based on the table array my unit cost column is at the fourth index so i'll write four comma the range lookup is zero if i click on this and hit enter you can see it here v lookup has returned the first instance of jones and it did not consider the second and the third instance so our unit cost for jones is 1.99 because we look up only returns the first match okay moving ahead to the next example we have here is we look up is case insensitive if you consider this table i have added another row in green so if you see here i have a representative name called gill which is in proper case or popularly known as sentence case here I have added Gil's name in capital letters or all in uppercase. So I want to find the total revenue generated by Gil. The total revenue is basically the total column. Let's do it. I'll write VLOOKUP. My lookup value is Gil, which is actually in uppercase. I'll consider my table array from the representatives column till the end of total column or the sales column. Based on this selection, my column index number is 5, comma, the range lookup is false. So I'll just double click on false. If I close the bracket, hit enter, you can see it here. Our VLOOKUP function has returned the total as 539.73, which is actually the value for this row. So clearly, VLOOKUP did not consider GIL which was present at the bottom of the table in uppercase. So this shows that VLOOKUP is clearly case insensitive. All right. Now moving to the next example, the VLOOKUP function supports wildcards, which makes it possible to perform a partial match on a lookup value. For instance, you can use VLOOKUP to retrieve values from a table after typing only part of a lookup value. To use wildcards with VLOOKUP, you must specify the exact match by giving false or zero for the last argument that is range lookup now we have a question here i want to know how much sales did the representative whose name starts with ki make now here sales represents the total column actually so i want to find out the person whose name starts with ki so if you consider the representative column i have one representative whose name starts with ki that is kival so using ki as my lookup value i want to find the total so let me show you how to use wildcard characters and find the value using vlookup so i'll write my function vlookup okay now in lookup value i'll give ki after that i'm going to write ampersand followed by double inverted commas then i'm going to write a star and close the inverted comma. This means the value starts with ki, ampersand actually represents concatenation, and star represents anything followed by ki. So this is going to be my lookup value in total. I'll give a comma. Next, I'll select my table array starting from the representatives column till the end of total column because I want to find the seals. I'll give another comma. My column index number based on the table array we have selected is 5, comma, the range lookup is 0 because I want to find an exact match. I'll close the bracket, hit enter. You can see it here. VLOOKUP has returned me 999.5, which is actually Kivel's total. 
Now there's another way to do it. Instead of selecting the cell in which we have the lookup value, I can directly write it in the VLOOKUP function. So I'll write the VLOOKUP function something like this. So my lookup value, I'll pass ki within double inverted commas because ki is a character value. So within double inverted commas, I'm writing ki followed by ampersand, which is for concatenation, followed by a star within double inverted commas. So this is going to be my lookup values. This in total means anything that appears after ki will be considered as the lookup value. Again, the table array I'll select as these rows and columns, comma, my column index number would be 5, comma, the range lookup is 0. If I close the bracket, hit enter, you see we have the same value. So this is another method or another way of using VLOOKUPs. Okay, now moving ahead, let's explore another feature of VLOOKUP. So if the VLOOKUP function cannot find a match, it returns a hash NA error. Now if you want, you can use the if NA function to replace the hash NA error with a friendly message. So suppose you want to find the region in which an order was placed on 10th of May 2018. Now if the order date is not found, I want to return a message that is invalid date. So if you look at the order date column, we don't have any value for 10th of May 2015. You can see these values. We don't have any value corresponding to this date. So if my VLOOKUP function cannot find this lookup value, I'll return invalid date. So let me show you how to write this. I'll type my VLOOKUP function. I'll give my order date as 10th of May 2015 as my lookup value and then I'll consider my table array starting from the order date column till the end of region column. I'll give another comma. My column index number would be 2 this time based on the table array we have selected. Comma. I want an exact match. So I'll give 0, close the bracket and hit enter. There you go. It has returned me an error. Now, I want to convert this error to a friendly message saying invalid date. So let me show you how to do it. I'll do it here. So to return a valid message, I'll use the if any function. And within if any function, I'll give my VLOOKUP function. So let me type if any. I'll hit tab. Now for the value parameter, I'll use my VLOOKUP function. So my lookup value is going to be the order date, comma, my table array I'll select from the order date column till the end of region column comma my column index number is going to be 2 comma my range lookup is 0 I'll close the bracket give another comma now if this expression results in an error I want to display a message that is invalid date so I'll put invalid date within double quotes since it is a text message I close the bracket hit enter you can see the result which is invalid date. Now moving on to the final section of the demo, we have two-way lookup. Now in the VLOOKUP function, the column index parameter is normally hard-coded as a static number. However, you can also create a dynamic column index by using the MATCH function to locate the right column. Now this technique allows you to create a dynamic two-way lookup matching on both rows and columns. Now let me first show you how a match function works. So suppose I want to find the index where unit cost column is present. So here I'll use the match function. I'll give my lookup value as the unit cost column name, comma. Suppose I'll choose my lookup array starting from representatives column till the unit cost column, comma. I'll give my match type as 0 for exact match. If I close the bracket, hit enter, it returns me 4 because my array was selected from the representatives column till the unit cost column. And in this array, unit cost is at the fourth index. Alright, now using this idea, let's solve the following problem. I want to find 
the cost of each item sold by Morgan. So let's write our VLOOKUP formula. I'll write VLOOKUP. My lookup value is J5, which has the representative's name as Morgan, comma. My table array, I'll select from C2 till F12. I'll give a comma. And this time, I know that my column index number is at 4, but I'll be using the match function to find the same. So I'll write match. My lookup value is unit cost, comma. My lookup array is from C1 till F1, comma. My match type is 0. I close this bracket, give another comma, and I'll give my range lookup as 0. Close the bracket, hit enter. You can see for Morgan, the unit cost is 19.99. You can verify from the table. For Morgan, the unit cost is 19.99. Alright. Now, we have another question here. I want to find how much sales did Andrews make in the central region. So here, I have two lookup values. One is central, one is Andrews. Now looking at these two values, I want to find the total. To solve such problems, let me first create another table. I'll place the table somewhere here. Okay, so let me just paste the table here. Alright, now I'll create another column where I'll merge the values of region and representatives. So here, let me create another column. Okay, I'll just name this column as region rep. Alright, now this column I'll use the concatenation operator. So I'll select East, use Ampersand, and then select Jones. I'll hit enter. Now the same thing, I'll just duplicate it for the other rows as well. So I have my new column created. Now using this table, I can easily solve the problem. Now to find the total, I'll write my VLOOKUP formula. So my lookup value will be a combination of J11, Ampersand, K11, comma. My table array will start from the region rep, which has the values of region and rep combined, till the last column. And from this table array, my column index number is 5, and my range lookup is 0. If I close the bracket, hit enter, you can see for central region, which is this one, and for Andrew's representative, the total is 149.25. Alright, now we are done with our demo. Let's have a quick glance at what all we did in this demo. Okay, so first of all, we saw our data set, which was a sales data set that we used. Then we started with our first example to see how VLOOKUP performs an exact match. We also saw how using the formulas tab and lookup and reference you can write VLOOKUP in another way. So you can use the function arguments to give your VLOOKUP parameters. Next, we saw how VLOOKUP performs an approximate match. So we had mat and raw which were not present in the representatives column. After that, we saw an important property of VLOOKUP that is VLOOKUP only looks to the right, followed by VLOOKUP only returns the first match. Following which we saw that VLOOKUP is case insensitive. So here we had added a new row where GIL was present in uppercase but still VLOOKUP found the total revenue for GIL which was in sentence case or proper case. Next we saw how we can use wildcard characters to use VLOOKUPs and here we saw how to use an if and a function along with VLOOKUP. And finally, we saw how to use two VLOOKUPs. Choose from over 300 in-demand skills and get access to 1,000 plus hours of video content for free. Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Now we are on the sheet of Microsoft Excel and here you can see some data on my sheet. 
that is employee name, employee ID and salary. So here we are going to perform our horizontal lookup. But before that, let me show you that this particular drop down menu. So this particular drop down menu has all the names of the employees in this particular table and we have created this using data validation in Excel. If you want to create the drop down menus just like this, then feel free to check out our data validation in Excel tutorial, link to which is in the description box below. Now let's try to implement HLOOKUP in Excel. So here we have employee name, but we want to find out the employee ID. So for that, let's create the HLOOKUP. Now for that equals to HLOOKUP. Now the first one is the lookup value. So this one is the cell which is the employee name now after that the table array we have to select all the table arrays here now the row index number so the employee id is in row index number two according to the table so for that provide two and close the bracket and before closing brackets you might want to give the exact match so for exact match select false and close the bracket press enter and there you go and if you select Jack then you'll find the employee ID of Jack and if you select Jerry you'll find the employee ID of Jerry reflecting here now similarly let's find out the salary of all the employees using HLOOKUP so equals HLOOKUP and lookup value that happens to be the name of the employee now the table array and next we have uh, row index number that is salary happens to be the third row in the table so three and exact match close the bracket and enter so now if you change the values in this particular drop down menu you will find the employee id and their particular salary so jack happens to be carrying the employee id as 1001 and his salary is 10000 so similarly let's try to find out peter's employee id and salary so there you go, 1005 and 50,000 as salary. So that's how you use HLOOKUP in Excel. Here you can see the first chart. So this particular data is converted into a table format to avoid confusion while you're fixing the data. So here you can see the name of the employee, employee ID, department, salary and date of joining. And here you can see the salary column and the bonus percentage of each and every employee based on their salaries. Now coming to the new data table and here on the table 2 which is an updated table here you can find we are going to find out the department of the employee and the current department of employee and the bonus percentage based on his or her salary. So why are we finding current department again? So here you can see that we have an intern Emily who has joined in the year 2020 but recently she got promoted as a developer. So her department has been changed from department intern to department developer in 2021. So that's what we're going to find out here in the current department using XLOOKUP. Now let's start to implement XLOOKUP. So for that equals to XLOOKUP and for lookup you can see if we need to find out the lookup value, lookup array, return array and all the other two are not important right now but you can use them to get some exact matches in the future we'll also use that in the future for now let's try to use the first three parameters that is lookup value lookup array and return array so the lookup value is the name of the employee mary and lookup array is right here which is this one now we are going to select the lookup array then comma and uh, we're going to look up the department so this is the department lookup array and that's all we need close the bracket and press enter okay i think we missed out the lookup value so the employee uh, or the lookup value which we required was missed so i've added it here so that is the lookup value the first one which is mary and there you go press enter and you have the department here now let's add it to all the rows and here you have all the rows and all the data related to all the employees. Now we will find out the current department as you can see here you have Emily as intern which is the older data but what if we needed the latest data that is the developer in the year 2021 right. For that you might want to twerk the XLOOKUP formula a little bit so let's try that XLOOKUP lookup value which is the same and comma now where you have to look for the array that is lookup array this one and the return array 
which happens to be this one and next you can find the exact match for this one so that's all right exact match and here comes the important part where you have to search last to first by default xlookup searches for first to last that is like this in the starting place to the last place so that's the reason why we had emily as intern so now if we give last to first then it retrieves the latest data where emily will be shown as developer now select that and now you can close the brackets and press enter so let's add that to all the rows there you go now you can see emily clark peter and james all they have got their updated job profiles as you can see in the original data Emily is a developer now, so is Clark, who was originally a tester and he got promoted to development team in 2021. Similarly, Peter became a senior finance executive in 2021 and James, the manager of sales. Now, let's try to find out the bonus for all these employees based on their salary. So, this one is quite simple. So, X lookup. Now, the lookup value is their existing salary, comma, and the bonus part. So the lookup array is the salary range. Then here is another important point. So here you might want to find the exact match, but finding an exact match will not help you here. You might want to declare another type of value where you can get exact match or next smaller item. So you'll understand it why I'm selecting that. So now let's close the bracket and enter. So so now we have the bonus values. Now let's add the bonus value to all the factors, all the rows, I mean. So you can see we have different variety of salaries, that is 38,000, 22,000, 39, etc. But here in the ranges, we have provided 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. So what if the value is between 30 and 20? That's when you want the less number, right? That's when you want the number which is equivalent to 30 or less than 30, which happens to be 15%. So that's how it has worked here. That is 0.15% bonus to the actual salary. Now we are on our Excel sheet. Here you can see the employee names and employee IDs of different employees from different zones. Let us imagine that the blue one is from east, green one is from west, and the black one is from or the purple one is from south, and the orange one is from north. So this data is a little small. But what if we had a data with hundreds or thousands of rows, including all the employee names, employee IDs, or another relevant data type like sales of an employee and his employee ID. And you were supposed to combine all the data from all the four different zones into one single sheet. It would consume a lot of time, right? So recently, Microsoft has released some latest updates based on arrays and datas. So one of those is vStack function in Excel. So how to use it? Since it is a latest function, I recommend you to go to the file menu and in the file menu, you can navigate to account and in the account, you can see the option of update options. Then you can select update now and your Microsoft Office will be updated to the latest version and you'll get access to the latest functions in Excel and all the other Office related things like PowerPoint presentation, etc. Now we are going to implement the vStack function in Excel. It is completely simple. All you need to do is equals to stack and then select the data. Remember to select the data from column A and cell 2 or the row 2. We are not selecting the employee name and employee ID. We are just selecting the data. Now separate them by comma. Then again, this one here, this set, and again, this one. And again, lastly, this particular last set. Now close the bracket and press enter. And there you go. You have all the employee names and their respective employee IDs all together in one data set. So this is how you use vStack function in Excel. And there are also a few more new updates from Microsoft Excel and we will discuss on them sooner. So the name itself conveys that it is something like a reference function, right? So it refers to a cell which is present in a particular sheet or the current sheet or it refers to a particular range in the current sheet or it can also refer to an entire workbook in a current window. 
right? So you can stay here on the sheet number one and you can refer something which is present on the sheet number 10 or 11. You can stay in this current workbook and refer to something which is around in a different workbook altogether. So that's exactly how the indirect function in Excel works. Okay, so I guess the definition was a little uh, difficult to get. Let me show you a simple demo here so that it becomes a little easier for you. So currently I'm in the cell number A2, right? Now here I will implement the indirect function. Press tab to select it. And now I'll refer to the cell C2. And let's enter. And there you go. Let me properly close the window. It's there. So let me implement the indirect function here. So equals to indirect and press tab to select. Now I'll be selecting the cell C2 and inside C2 we have E2 address. Now the formula is fine. I have implemented the indirect function and selected the cell E2. And now if I press enter, see the magic. There you go. So in the cell E2, we have the text hello world. So when I use the indirect function to refer, which is something in C2, it is indirectly referring to another cell address that is E2, which has the text hello world. Now this one was a little pretty simpler. Now let's check some complicated ones and we'll move to sheet number one. Here we have some student names and their, uh, you know, uh, marks on the individual subjects that is math, science, English, computer science. And here, and here you can see I'm selecting the student names and accordingly I'm getting their average score and the total marks obtained right seems interesting how did i do this so this is done exactly using the indirect function so let's do it again so this is how you do it now here i will be using okay before we get into this uh, we need to do some fundamentals before we do it right so the fundamentals are you need to name your individual columns so here i have brian and his marks so i'll select entire marks of brian so ranging from b2 to B4 right click and here you can see define name and I'll be naming it as Brian it's already named we might get an error so it's already named okay let's add another one maybe uh, Jennifer let's cancel this so let's uh, add Jenny and her marks will be 96 87 i'm selecting some random numbers here so 87 so we have the new column here now we need to name this column define a name and it's jenny so excel has automatically selected the name for this column so let's press ok now we have our columns ready now here if you see the drop down we have amy banner brian brock emily jenny john everyone over here right so the columns are named the individual columns are named so now the student name so here you can use some simple trick called the data validation here select the data option in the toolbar navigate to data tools here select data validation and uh, in this instead of any value select list and here give the source as this particular set press ok so that you get the drop down menu over here you can also type the individual names again when you type the individual names you might go wrong with the case or spelling right so it's better always to use this kind of list options which will make things easier for you now getting into the average calculation so here the average will be uh, equals to average press tab to select now the indirect function indirect of the cell address and close the bracket first you might get an error because currently it is empty so select some name and you'll get your average score now same thing applies to uh, you know total uh, you can press the sum function select the sum function and uh, type in the indirect function and uh, the cell v11 close the brackets and press enter so that's how you do it press web query in excel now you might be wondering what exactly is web query so you all know that excel is a brilliant data analytics and business intelligence tool right so it requires some data to be stored or some data to be analyzed right that creates as an opportunity for the sources 
So don't think that Excel is something where you just, you know, copy paste the data and that's how it stores or you need to manually enter the data. No, it can get connected to a various and wide variety of data sources ranging from a simple file, database, CSV and Microsoft Access, data analysis services and many more and including web, right? Now there might be a case where you are you know interested in getting the data from a direct web page which is dynamic for example you might be interested in stock market right and you wanted to you know take the data which is dynamic directly from the stock market right so is it possible for excel to take and store the dynamic data yes you can do it so now here we are on the stock market india website and let's get into the most active stocks table click on that And you are navigated to the most active shares in India currently. Now select the URL of this particular web page. Get back to your get back to your Excel. And here on the data button in the toolbar, you can see from text CSV from web, right? So let's uh, select the get data option from other sources from web. You can either choose this or feel free to choose this as well over here. So let's go to web, and here you might want to place your URL paste the URL and press OK and uh, you will have some time connecting to the server give it some time now while we are at it let me tell you guys that we have daily updates on Microsoft Excel and also a lot more technologies in the current IT industry so if you want to get updated on all the technologies in the current IT market then make sure that you subscribe to our channel and don't forget to hit that bell icon to never miss an update from Simply Learn. Now you can see that we are successfully connected to the data and you can see various data tables over here. So for example, let's select on the table zero. So all this data is the current active and dynamic data from the website we selected. So let's just press on load to load just one table as of now and see how it works. So the data is loading again. We might have to give a little time for the data to load onto the Excel spreadsheet. Now you can see the data has been successfully loaded and all the details that is the company name, highest price, lowest price, last price, change percentage and the value in crores. Everything has been updated, including the five day performance, right? Now you can, you know, hide this because it's a lot of information to grasp altogether. Now here you can see all the data has been currently stored onto the Excel spreadsheet. Now you might be wondering if this particular data is valid or if this particular data is really dynamic or not, right? So to answer that question, let's see to the data option again. And here you can see the refresh button. So click on refresh all and you can see there is a query running in the background from the web, right? So here you can see running background query. So this will run a query and the numbers will be updated. So let's remember any one of the numbers, maybe they might be, so I'll take a quick glance here and try to remember the numbers. You can take a screenshot and after the query has successfully run, you can see some changes in the numbers, right? So maybe some numbers are changed here since we have finished our query. So that's how the web query in Excel works with the dynamic data. That is user form in Excel. So what exactly is a user form? So user form is a graphical user interface that helps you have a live interaction with your worksheet which enables you to enter or eliminate data from your Excel worksheet through the graphical user interface. Now let's get into the practical mode and start the Excel workbook. Now we have launched our Microsoft Excel. So let us create a blank workbook for now. Now we have the blank workbook or worksheet. Now, before we get started with the user forms in Excel, the fundamental step is to enable the developer menu on the toolbar. Here you can find the developer menu. So basically, it will not be enabled as default. To enable that, you need to get into file menu. And inside the file menu, you can see the last menu that is the options menu. Select that and you will have a dialog box on your screen. And inside that, you need to go into the customize ribbon option. 
and inside the customize ribbon option you have the main tabs scroll through the main tabs and here you can find an option called developer by default it will not be enabled it will look something like this but to enable that you need to select the check option in this and click on that and select ok now the developer option will be enabled on your tool menu so now you have your developer option on your toolbar so to get started with user forms in excel click on the developer option and here you can see visual basic so click on that visual basic and now you have your new window opened right on your screen so this is the visual basics for applications so here is where you create your user forms now to create a user form just select on insert menu and you have the option called user form now a new user form will be created for you and that is user form 1 so this is the user form which you can design and enable to interact with your worksheet and help you insert data or eliminate data for now let's try to create a simple user form for employees now here you can see the controls option where you can find the various options to provide an object into your user form so it might be a label it might be a text box it might be a multi-page it might be a command button it might be a frame or a toggle switch many more for now let's make it simple let's create a label so this is our first label we have just dragged and dropped it and let us name it as okay so let us select it and rename it as employee id now let's insert another label drag and drop as simple as it looks select that and rename it as employee name now another one you can also copy that and paste it and this should be our employee phone number now we have our three labels on the screen let's try to insert the text box now this is our first text box for employee id now let's copy and paste it so another text box for employee name copy and paste again and the last text box for employee phone now let us try to insert the button so the first command button let us rename it as insert now let us relocate it to a little bit left now let us try to insert another button and here it is the second button would be refresh sheet uh, the refresh button will play the role of uh, clearing the text boxes in case if there is some data already entered if you want to clear that you can just press on refresh and it will be cleared now we have our user form so let us try to rename our user form so here you can see that we have the properties tab and inside the properties tab you can always rename it and to rename it let us go into caption and rename it as employee data and that's done so our basic user form is ready now let's get back to excel sheet so remember that we have created three labels employee id employee name and employee phone we need to create the exact same columns here so employee id let us expand the column a little bit now e m p l o y e e name let us also increase the width 
And finally, we have employee foam. There you go. Yeah, we have our three columns. Let us select all the three columns and uh, align to middle. You can also format your cells. Let us select the green color and text as white and let us bold. Yeah, pretty good. There you go. So we have created our sheet and it's ready now. Now, the last part remaining is we need to code this particular user form. So coding in the sense, we have two buttons over here, right? So those buttons should be performing some kind of operation. So for insert button, the operation should be inserting the data which we have entered into these text boxes. So to program it, just double click on the insert button and here eliminate everything and paste this code. So basically what we did is we had this particular code segment so this is the starting part of the code segment and this is the ending part of the code segment. So we are writing our code in between these two lines. So what did we write here? So end of the row is sheets of sheet name. So this is the sheet name. Right here we have our sheet name as sheet 1. So that is the sheet name where we want to perform the operations and range from A to rows count and Excel up row that is we are counting the number of rows here that particular statement will count the rows till the end of the sheet automatically and after that it will shift to text box value that is once the row number is counted that is from 1 to n it will start entering data from the first available row that is a column a column then once the a column is finished it will enter into B column and subsequently into C. And once the text boxes are entered the data, that is, let's come back to here. So once we have entered all the text, that is the employee ID, name and phone, after selecting the insert button, automatically these three text boxes should go blank again. You cannot have the same data again in your text box. So that is why we have included text box value 1 null text box value 2 null text box value 3 null so that was for command operation insert now we should program the command operation for refresh double click on that and you have the code option over here so this particular code will be automatically loaded from the click button 1 now for click button 2 you need to add some more data that is refreshing so whenever you press the refresh button the text should go blank for that we'll use the same code from the previous click button or the command button paste it over here and they should perform the clearing operation and it's done now close this so select the employee data user form and here you can see the run option so select that run option and the sheet has the user form here now let us enter the employee ID as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and employee name as J-O-H-N, okay caps lock is on, J-O-H-N John, employee phone as some um, 1800-231 and select the insert option and the data got inserted. Now let us try to insert another data, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6 employee name Wick and employee phone number 18003345 yeah by now you might have guessed I'm a fan of John Wick yes and yeah there you go we have entered the second data over here now let me show you another trick where you can place all this user form as a macro and replace this by just one single button so whenever you press that button this data form or user form will pop up and you can directly start entering data so for that let's get back to the visual basic and stop this particular execution and you got your user form back now 
you need to insert a model. Get into insert option and select the module or model. Yeah, it is module, not model. So inside this module, you need to write the command for macro. So here it is. So what we are basically doing is a m p l o y e e data dot show or we can use an underscore and get back to user form and rename this as data cool so what we are doing is entering the subject as enter employee details this will be the macro name and when this macro is called the employee data user form should be shown and once it is shown the code should be ended that is end subject now we have designed our module now let's get back to the sheet and here go to the developer option go to the insert menu and select button and draw the button somewhere and now you can select the enter employee details macro and press ok and now you have a button here now you can edit this edit it as press to enter enter employee details and there you go done so now whenever you press this particular button the user form will activate okay and you need to play this okay the error was related to the employee data sheet name we had to rename the employee data from user form to employee data initially it was just user form we have renamed that to employee data and now the code is fine so let's get back to the sheet now if you press this button the user form will automatically start now let us try to enter the data again one two three four five seven this time and uh, some name let's enter as jennifer and her phone number would be one eight double zero three four five zero nine eight some random number and select insert and the data has been inserted here so this is how you work on user forms in excel now at times you might be working on a really important spreadsheet on your excel or you might have the sales data of your company or some confidential data of your organization and you might have shared the file with your junior or you might face some packet issue and you forgot to save or you missed to save your data and what to do if you cannot save your data and how can you recover it right so this might be a really big hassle Today we are exactly going to discuss the same and see how to do it in multiple ways. So Excel comes up with an option to automatically save the data. Also, it will try to warn you that your data is not being saved. Would you like me to save it or not? Right, so we'll do the first one. So here you have the auto save option. You can either say okay to it or you can ignore it in case if you ignore it, if you choose to ignore it or if you choose to manually save it, and then if you want to close the file remember we haven't saved the file if you wish to close it excel will automatically come up with a dialog box asking you want to save your changes to your data.xlsx that means it is asking you if i have to save it or not let's try to ignore this and forcefully let's try to close it you can go to task manager option here we are trying to simulate the option of packet issues so we are forcefully closing Excel without saving any data. So we have closed it. Now here you can see we do not have Excel running in the background. Now, when you directly open or try to start Excel, when you get the power backup again, and if you want to open that same data file, it will ask you the document recovery option. It says you have closed the file without saving the changes and you can choose to, you know, come back from the same place where we left last time okay now that was the packet issue and now let's see uh, another way okay let's imagine that somebody uh, eliminated few important data files from your uh, organization's confidential data employee id employee name etc and again uh, let's simulate the force uh, close of the excel now we are closing it again without saving no data was being saved 
now it will also ask the same uh, data it has another version here the original one which wasn't saved so here you can recover the same file again however it was initially so you can save it and it will get back to the original place so this was one way also we have another few multiple ways just we have to navigate to file and here you can open and in the open menu you have a button called recover unsaved workbooks not just the current workbook it will also have all the remaining files which are related to excel that are not saved so here you have a few workbooks which was not saved this is one option and we also have another option we can just navigate to info and there you have another option called manage workbook and in the manage workbook you have another option called recover unsaved workbooks which will also redirect you to the same file that is microsoft office unsaved files and you'll have all the unsaved workbooks which are related to excel so this is how you can recover the unsaved data in excel using multiple ways first thing excel will automatically ask you if you have to save the file or not and in case if you forget to save it you can directly recover it by default by excel it will automatically show that some folder was not saved on the left side of your excel spreadsheet by default and in case if you missed out on that one you can manually go to file and you can either choose open option or info option to recover the unsaved folders from your default file location from your pc that is microsoft office unsaved files etc which will have all the list of all unsaved workbooks related to excel let's see what is a project plan project plan is a basic thing that is needed to execute a project according to project management book of knowledge a project can be defined as an approved elaborative document that guides the team during project execution and project control when we are making a project plan a project plan must answer several questions for us these questions are like what are we expecting our project to deliver how are we expecting to get our deliverables within the desired time who all will be a part of our project and what tasks they will have in the project when will the project start and when it is expected to end that is the deadlines of the project now let us learn about project management in excel microsoft excel is one of the most common application these days it is used in both offices and at homes microsoft excel is an easy project management tool that allows the team members to easily see the tasks in a project develop a plan and track its progress before we learn more about project management in excel let's first have a look why do we use excel Microsoft Excel is an easy tool to plan a project so it can be used by people who are beginners in terms of project management in excel one can find several analytical tools like concatenate len and counter so this makes data analysis easy and effective as the entry of data is easy same is tracking and controlling of project status then there are several project management templates in excel that help us to have an effective distribution of project data we will be checking several project management templates towards the end of this video now let's have a look at the process of making a gantt chart in excel before we begin this it's important we know what is a gantt chart a gantt chart is like an horizontal bar chart that is used for project management with the help of a gantt chart we can check the status of the task the date they start the date they end and their dependencies on each other gantt chart helps in coordinating and monitoring different tasks in a project now let's have a look at the steps that will help us in making a gantt chart first step we have is make a project table we have several rows and columns like here we have three columns in the first column we have the tasks in the second we have our start date and in the third column we have the duration or tenure of the task the second step is to make a bar chart in excel for this we will select the entire second column then we will go on the insert tab and click on the bar graph chart there we can select stacked bar graph in 2d bar charts as a result we will have the entitled bar graph on the screen in the third step we will add the duration to the bar graph we will right click on the chart and in the menu that appears we will select select data option a window that appears on the screen in that window we will select add option as shown we can also see the start date is already in the entry section then in the dialog box that appears type tenure in the series name and click on the range selection icon that's shown in the figure now select the relevant data from the tenure column and click on okay now we can see a bar graph that has two colors on the screen this bar graph now has the duration of the tasks the fourth step we have is adding description to the gantt chart now we will open the box again and in that box we will select the edit option as shown in the figure then we will select the tasks as we had selected the duration of the tasks before and click on okay 
We can now see the tasks have appeared towards the left side of the Gantt chart. The fifth and the remarkable step will help us convert this bar graph into a Gantt chart. We will now click on the bars and select the Format Data Series option from the menu that appears. Then in the Format Data Series dialog box, we will select No Fill option. We can find our Gantt chart on the screen now in accordance with the data that we had entered. Now we can see the tasks on the left side are in the reverse order. So what we will do next is, we will click on the task panel, then go to the Format Access dialog box and select the Categories in Reverse Order option. Now we can find our tasks in the right order. One more thing we can notice is, Gantt chart is starting with some other date and not with the dates that we had entered. So for this, we will copy the first date in some other cell, then clicking on the copied cell, we will go to the home menu to select the dialog box as shown in the figure. Then in that drop down menu, we will select the number option. We can now find a value displayed in the copied cell. We will copy that value, click on the dates on the chart and as the format access dialog box opens, we will paste that value in the box that says minimum shown in the figure. As a result, we will have our final Gantt chart on the screen. In the last step, we can give several designs to a Gantt chart, change colors and make it more presentable for us. Now when we know the basic steps of making a Gantt chart, I will show that practically to you in Microsoft Excel. Our first step is to open Microsoft Excel and in Microsoft Excel, we will make a project table. In a project table, we will have three columns. The first column will be task, the second column will have the start date, the third column will have tenure or the duration of the task. So beginning with tasks, we have task 1. In task 1, we have 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, then comes task 2. In task 2, we have 2.1, 2.2, 2.3 and 2.4. Then we have task 3. In task 3, we will have two subsections, 3.1 and 3.2. Then we will start with the starting dates. In starting dates, we will put 1st January, the task 1, 1.1 will be 1st of January. Then this will be 4th January, let's say this is 5th January. Then we will put this as 11th of January and this will be again 11th January only. This will be 15th January, let's put this as 17th January. Let this be 19th January, task 3 begins on 23rd January and it the 3.2 section begins at 26th of January. Now let's put the tenure or the duration of the task. We will begin with task 1. It takes 12 days, then 1.1 takes 7 days, we say this takes 4 days and this takes 8 days. Then for task 2, it again takes 12 days, it takes 5 days, 5 days and let's say this takes 6 days and this takes 4 days. Then we come to task 3. This takes 8 days and let's say this takes 6 days and the 3.2 section takes 5 days. So this is how our project table is ready. In the second step, we will select the entire second column. After we have selected this column, we will go to the insert tab. In the insert tab, we will go to the bar columns and in this we will select 2D stacked bar charts. Now we have the entitled bar chart in accordance to our data on the screen. Then comes the third step. We will add the duration of the tasks to the bar graph. We will click on the chart and after we click on the chart, we will select Select Data option. In the Select Data Source dialog box, we find the start date is already there. Now we will click on Add and after we click on Add, in the Series Name section, we will put Tenure. Then in the Series value, we will click on this icon and select the entire Tenure series and click on OK. So this is the bar graph that we have now. This is now in two colors the orange color and the blue color. This bar graph now has the duration of all the tasks in our project table. Now in the fourth step, now it's time for us to add description to our Gantt chart. Instead of this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we will put task 1, task 2 and the subtasks. So what we will do is, we will again go to that box, we will left click on the Gantt chart, select the select data option and then we'll go to the start date. Here, we'll select the edit option in the edit option, we will select all the tasks and click on OK. Now we can see all the tasks are aligned towards the left of the bar chart. As we can see, this is a bar chart or a bar graph and not a Gantt chart. The next step we have is converting this bar graph into a Gantt chart. So we will click on the bars and select the format data series option from the menu that appears. Here we have this format data series option. Now we can see the dialog box on the screen. Here, we'll go into the color section, 
fill section and then we will select no fill. Now we can see the blue lines have disappeared. So this looks like a Gantt chart. So now when we have a Gantt chart on the screen, we can notice that the tasks here are in the reverse order. So what we will do is we will click on these tasks and select the format access option. Here we will select categories in reverse order. We can see our Gantt chart is now in order like we have a task 1 on the top and task 3 at the bottom. The dates are starting from 11th of December but the dates we have provided are from 1st of January. Now we will copy this cell then go on the dates box here we will go to format access. In the format access we can see minimum. In this minimum we will paste this value and press enter. As we press enter we can see our Gantt chart starting from the date that we wanted to start and that too in the correct order starting from task 1 to task 3. Now as a result we have our final Gantt chart on the screen. In the last step what we can do is make our Gantt chart more representable. We can change the color of these bars, we can give them shapes and we can do many other things to make it more presentable. We will first select the bars like what we will do is we will select task 1 and let's say we give it the color blue. Then task 2 we will give it color green and in task 3 we will give it, give it the color black. So here the subsections will give different colors to the subsections as well. Then we come to task 2.1. This is how we can change the color of these cells or apart from changing colors we can select a bar graph and do the gradient fill. So this is how we can make a Gantt chart more presentable. After changing the colors or changing the shapes we have our final Gantt chart on the screen. Finally, let's have a look at some Microsoft Excel templates for project management. Microsoft Excel templates help in collecting data, putting them into order and check their dependencies with each other. With the help of these templates, we can monitor the status of the tasks and we can also check the progress our project has made. Moving forth, we will check some important Microsoft Excel templates. The first template we have is Excel Project Review Template. This template helps us have an overview of the project. We can have a clear understanding of all the tasks that are planned and that are completed. This helps project managers to measure the progress of the project and take further steps accordingly. Second template we will check is Excel Budget Template. In this template, we can monitor all the expenditures of our project. It helps us in managing the budget of our project and also helps in comparing the budget of our project at different phases. Let's have a look at the budget template in Excel once. We can download this template from officetimeline.com. The Gantt chart towards the right is in accordance with the dates towards the left. If we fluctuate the date, we can see the template working. The start date for task 1 could be changed to 10th June. If we change this date to 10th June, we can see the fluctuation in the Gantt chart. So this is how we can use this template directly. Let's have a look at the third template now. Third template we will see is Excel Sprint Project Tracker Template. This template is used majorly in Agile projects where the project is made in several sprints or sessions. This template includes the start date, the end date and the duration of each task. We can also see the percentage completed of each task. Let's have a look at this sprint project tracker template as well. We can see the Gantt chart towards the right and the data towards the left. So if we change any data, we can see the Gantt chart changing. For example, we can change the data in sprint 2 feature 3. Let's change the start date to July 2nd. We can see the Gantt chart changing. This is how we can use this template directly to track our sessions. Let's have a look at the fourth Excel template. This template is Excel Project Tracker. In this template, we have the data of all the tasks with their status and owners. We can track the percentage of tasks completed and also compare the planned duration of the task to the actual duration of the task. After the critical part tracker, let's check the Excel Project Schedule template. This template helps in effective management of the project as it helps in monitoring the time that each task of the project takes. It provides a clear view of all the work associated with the project. Let's have a look at this template in Excel once. We can see the Gantt chart in accordance to the data. If we change the estimated hours at two places, let's say at the design review we make it 15 hours instead of 5 hours and at the create staffing plan we make it 2 hours instead of 20 hours. We can see the Gantt chart fluctuating. This is how we can use this template to manage the schedule in a project. Moving forward, the next template we will see is Excel Project Status Report Template. This template helps us having a list of project deliverables and the risks associated with that project. This template helps the project managers about different crucial activities involved in a project. After this, we have Excel Milestone Tracker. 
The milestone tracker helps us in tracking or monitoring different tasks in a project. Project managers use this template to monitor the project performance with respect to the timelines. The last template we will see is Excel Project Planner. Excel Project Planner includes a list of tasks with the respected owners along with the start date and the end date of that task. This helps in monitoring each task and comparing the estimated task date with the actual ones. Let's have a look at this template in Excel. We can see the Gantt chart with respect to the data entered. Let's make changes at several places in the data. We can make this 22 to 24. We will make this 23 go to 2 and we can make this 5th September go to 15th September. And when we make the changes, we can realize the Gantt chart is fluctuating. So this is how we can use this template to plan a project effectively and efficiently. So first, let's understand what exactly is MIS report in Excel. So MIS stands for Management Information System. MIS reports provide data on different categories for accurate decision making. So MIS in Excel is a procedure to create interactive report using Microsoft Excel. So, MIS reports help management to access the performance of organization and allow faster decision making. So, if you know to create the MIS reports using various business intelligence tools such as Excel, then you might find a very good job opportunity in a well established company. Now, let us try to learn how to create MIS report using Excel in a practical mode. So, let's get back to the Microsoft Excel. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. So here you can see that I've got some sales data of various car manufacturing companies and I've also got some slices. So using these slices, I can get the real-time information from the dashboard. So I'll select an year from the first slicer and I'll go into the second slicer and I'll select a company. Now I'll select BMW and SUV type. So we have the data of all the SUV types cars manufactured by BMW car manufacturing company in the year 2018. Now let's start and create something similar to this one. So how did I create this MIS report? Let's go through this in a step by step way. So on my screen you can see that we have created a completely new Excel workbook and we have some sample data with 5 rows and 20 columns. So this particular data is based on the manufacturer year and the car manufacturing company and the type of the car manufacturer and number of cars manufactured in that particular year and also the price of that particular car. Now to create MIS reports we need to play around pivot tables. So we also have tutorials on pivot tables and you can go through that in our Simply Learn YouTube channel and also we will try to link those in the description box below. Now let's select the entire data and go into the insert ribbon and there you can see the first option that is pivot table. So after selecting the pivot table option, it will show this particular dialog box where it will ask you for the range of cells you need to select and the next one is to create the pivot table in the same sheet or a new sheet. So we'll take a new sheet here. Now select OK and there you go, you have the pivot table here. So first you have an empty pivot table and on the right side you can see we have pivot table fields. Now you can either drag these options into the rows and columns or you can also click it. So now let's drag and drop these. First we will select year and uh, car. Followed by that we will take type, quantity and price to columns. So there you go. We have our pivot table now. Let's select all the data in the pivot table. And again, let's get back to the insert option. And here you can see an option called pivot chart. Select that and you will have various pivot chart options here. Now you can select any one which you can prefer or which you like or whichever you think can represent your data in a best way possible. So now let's go with column chart first. Let's select OK and we have our column chart over here. Now this happens to be our first chart. Now let's create a few more charts. So to create few more charts, we'll go back to the same original data. Select again insert and pivot table. Now again a new worksheet. 
So here we have another empty pivot table. In the similar way, let's drag the same data into rows and columns. There you go. And again, we will select all the data and create a pivot chart. Go to insert option, pivot chart, and now let's try to select pie chart. Select OK, and we have our pie chart over here. Now let's try to create one more. Same procedure, select table, select pivot table, then create new worksheet for the new pivot table, and now drag and drop the data. Now let's go to insert again. Let's select all the data, go to insert option and pivot chart. Now let's try to select the bar chart. Select OK and there we have our bar chart. Now remember the first chart we created that is in sheet 2, this one. So we will try to move all the charts to this particular table or this particular worksheet. So let's get back to the sheet number three, right click and you can see an option called pivot chart analyze. So from here, you can move the chart, select the option of moving the chart and don't select the first one, select the object in option and select the sheet number to which you want to move this chart. For now, we want to move this chart to sheet number two, select that, press OK. Now we have the chart moved to the sheet number two and in the same way, Let's go to the sheet number 4 and let's move this particular chart to sheet number 2. There you go, the chart got moved to sheet number 2. Now you can insert the slices. So we have selected the third sheet or third chart and inside the pivot chart analyze option we have an option of inserting the slicer. Now we will insert the slicers for year, car and type. Now select OK and you will have all the three slices onto your sheet. Now let's rearrange them. So I'm just organizing them in a neat way. There you go. And you can also customize your designs for all the charts. So that they look a little more better. Now, if you see if I make some changes, only one chart will be interacting for this, right? So if I select Ferrari and year 2020 and uh, option as sports, you can see only one chart is interacting to these particular slices. Why? Because all these slices are connected to just one chart here. So you need to make sure that all these slices are connected to all the three charts what we created. So let's erase all the filters and select one slicer at a time right click and you will see an option of report connections select that and you see that the connections are only connected to the pivot table 3 so select the remaining pivot tables as well select ok and in the same way select the second slicer select the report connection option connect pivot table 1 and 2 and select ok and in the same way the third one so now all the slices are connected to all the pivot charts. Now if you make some changes here, they will respond automatically in the same way. Now let's select the Ford company, the year 2019 and hatchback option and you have all the cars which were made in the year 2019 from Ford company in the segment of hatchback.
So this was the sample data set that we worked on. Now you can also work on some complex data sets such as this Superstore data set. Now one thing you need to make sure that when you're working with Excel MIS, you need to make sure that all the macros are disabled on your data set and you convert the entire data into the regular table format of Excel. Right now, Excel is considering this particular data as a database. So for that, you need to select all the data, press Ctrl T, and then convert the entire data in the form of tabular data. And also, don't forget to click this icon, which reads, my table has headers. So the first row is the headers. Now let's select OK, and your entire data will be converted into tabular form. Now let's reset this to the normal type, which has the clear color not all the fancy colors now the entire data is converted from the dbms to the tabular form and now you can start implementing the mis reports and pivot tables and uh, so why exactly do we need to do time series analysis typically we would like to predict something in the future and uh, it could be stock prices it could be the sales or um, anything that needs to be predicted into the future that is when we use time series analysis so it is um, as the name suggests it is forecasting and uh, typically when we say predict it need not be into the future in machine learning and data analysis when we talk about predicting we are not necessarily talking about the future but in time series analysis we typically predict the future so we have some past data and we want to predict the future that is when we perform time series analysis so what are some of the examples uh, it could be daily stock price the shares as we talk about or it could be the interest rates weekly interest rates or sales figures of a company so these are some of the examples where we use time series data we have historical data which is dependent on time and then based on that we create a model to predict the future so what exactly is uh, time series so time series data has time as one of the components as the name suggests so in this example let's say this is the stock price data and uh, one of the components so there are two columns here column b is uh, price and column a is basically the time information in this case the time is a day so that primarily the closing price of a particular stock has been recorded on a daily basis so this is a time series data and the time interval is obviously a day time series or time intervals can be daily weekly hourly or even sometimes uh, there is something like a sensor data it could be every few milliseconds or microseconds as well so the size of the time intervals can vary but they are fixed so if i am saying that the, it is daily Daily data then the interval is fixed as uh, daily if I'm saying this data is an hourly data then it is uh, the data is captured every hour and so on so the time intervals are fixed the interval itself you can uh, decide based on what kind of data we are capturing so this is a graphical representation the previous one here we saw the table representation and this is how to plot the data so on the y-axis is let's say the price or the, the stock price and the x-axis is the time so against time if you plot it this is how a time series graph would look so as the name suggests what is time series data time series data is basically a sequence of data that is recorded over a specific intervals of time and based on the past values so if we want to do an analysis of time series past data we try to forecast a future and uh, again as the name suggests it is time series data which means that it is time dependent so time is one of the components of this data time series data consists of primarily four components one is the trend then we have the seasonality then cyclicity and then last but not least irregularity or the random component sometimes is also referred to as a random component so let's see what each of these components are so what is trend trend is overall change or the pattern of the data which means that the data may be let me just uh, pull up a pen and uh, show you so let's say you have a data set somewhat like this a time series data set somewhat like this all right so what is the overall trend there is an overall trend which is upward trend as we call it here right so it is not like it is continuously increasing 
there are times when it is dipping then there are times when it is increasing then it is decreasing and so on but overall over a period of time from the time we start recording to the time we end there is a trend right there is an upward trend in this case so the trend need not always be upwards there could be a downward trend as well so for example here there is a downward trend right so this is basically what is uh, a trend overall whether the data is increasing or decreasing all right then we have the next component which is seasonality what is seasonality seasonality as the name suggests once again changes over a period of time and periodic changes right so there is a certain pattern um, let's take the sales of warm clothes for example so if we plot it along the months so let's say January, February, March, April, May, June, July, and then let's say it goes up to December. Okay, so this is our December, a D. I will just mark it as D. And then you again have Jan, Feb, March, and then you get another December. Okay, and just for simplicity, let's mark these as Decembers as the end of the year, and then one more December. Okay, so what will happen when if you're talking about warm clothes, what happens? The sales of warm clothes will increase probably around December when it is cold and then they will come down. And then again uh, around December again they will increase and then the sales will come down. And then there will be again an increase and then they will come down. And then again an increase and then they will come down. Let's say this is the sales pattern. So you see here there is a trend as well. There is an upward trend, right? The sales are increasing over, let's say these are multiple years. This is for year one, this is for year two, this is for year three and so on. So for multiple years overall the trend, there is an upward trend. The sales are increasing, but it is not a continuous increase, right? So there is a certain pattern. So what is happening? What is the pattern? Every December the sales are increasing or they are peaking for that particular year right then there is a new year again when December approaches the sales are increasing again when December approaches the sales are increasing and so on and so forth so this is known as seasonality so there is a certain fluctuation which is uh, which is periodic in nature so this is known as uh, seasonality then cyclicity what is cyclicity now cyclicity is somewhat similar to seasonality but here the duration between two cycles is much longer so seasonality typically is referred to as an annual kind of a uh, sequence like for example we saw here so it is pretty much like every year in the month of december the sales are increasing however cyclicity what happens is first of all the duration is pretty much not fixed and the duration or uh, the gap length of time between two cycles can be much longer so the recession is an example so we had let's say recession in 2001 or 2002 perhaps and then we had one in 2008 and then we had probably in 2000 2012 and so on and so forth so it is not like every year this happens probably so there is a, usually when we say recession there is a slump and then it recovers and then there is a slump and then it recovers and probably there is another bigger slump and so on right so you see here they, this is similar to seasonality but first of all this length is much more than a year right that is number one and it is not fixed as well it is not like every four years or every six years that duration is not fixed so the, the duration can vary at the same time the gap between two cycles is much longer compared to seasonality all right so then what is irregularity irregularity is like the random component of the time series data so there is like you have part which is the trend which tells whether the overall it is increasing or decreasing then you have cyclicity and seasonality which is like kind of a specific pattern right uh, then there is a cyclicity which is again a pattern but at much longer intervals plus there is a random component so which is not really which cannot be accounted for very easily right so there will be a random component which can be really random as the name suggests right so that is the irregularity component so these are the various components of time series data yes there are conditions where we cannot use time series analysis right so is it can we do time series analysis with any kind of data no not really so what are the situations where we are 
uh, we cannot do time series uh, analysis. So there will be some data which is collected over a period of time, but it's really not changing. So it will not really not make sense to perform any time series analysis over it, right? For example, like this one. So if we take X as the time and Y as the value of whatever the output we are talking about, and if the Y value is constant, there is really no analysis that you can do. Uh, leave alone time series analysis, right? So that is one. Another possibility is, yes, there is a change, but it is changing as per a very fixed function like a sine wave or a cos wave. Again, time series analysis will not make sense in this kind of a situation because there is a definite pattern here. There is a definite function that the data is following. So it will not make sense to do a time series analysis. Now, before performing any time series analysis, uh, the data has to be stationary. And uh, typically, time series data is not stationary. So, in which case, you need to make the data stationary before we apply any models like Arima model or any of these, right? So, what exactly is stationary data? And what is meant by stationary data? Let us take a look. First of all, what is non stationary data, time series data? If you recall from one of my earlier slides, we said that time series data has the following four components. The trend, seasonality, cyclicity, and random, random component or irregularity, right? So if these components are present in time series data, it is non-stationary, which means that typically these components will be present. Therefore, most of the time, a time series data that is collected raw data is non-stationary data. So it has to be changed to stationary data before we apply any of these algorithms. All right, so a non-stationary time series data would look like this, which means like, for example, here, there is an upward trend, the seasonality component is there and uh, also the random component and so on. So if the data is not stationary, then the time series forecasting will be affected. So you cannot really perform a time series forecasting on a non-stationary data. So how do we differentiate between a stationary and a non-stationary time series data? Typically or technically, one is of course you can do it visually. In uh, non-stationary data, the, the data will be more flattish. The seasonality will of course be there, but the trend will not be there. So the data may, if we plot that, it may appear somewhat like this, right? It's a horizontal line. Along the horizontal line, you will see. Compared to the original data, which was, there was an upward trend, so it was changing somewhat like this, right? So this is non-stationary data, and this is how a stationary data would look visually. What does this mean? Technically, this means that the stationarity of the data depends on a few things. What the mean, the variance, and the covariance. So these are the three components on which the stationarity of the data depends. So let's take a look at what each of these are. For stationary data, the mean should not be a function of time, which means that the mean should pretty much remain constant over a period of time, right? So there is there shouldn't be any change. Uh, so this is how the stationary data would look. And this is how a non-stationary data would look, as shown in the previous slide as well. So here, the mean is increasing. That means there is an upward trend, okay? So that is one part of it. And then the variance of the series should not be also a function of time. So the variance also should be pretty much common or uh, should be constant rather. Uh, so this is a, if we visually we take a look, this is how time series stationary data would look where the variance is not changing. Here the variance is changing, therefore this is non-stationary and we cannot apply time series forecasting on this kind of data. Similarly, the covariance, which is basically of the ith term and the i plus mth term should not be a function of time as well. So covariance is nothing but not only the variance uh, at the ith term, but the relation between the variance at the ith term and the i plus mth or the i plus nth term. So as, as again, once again, visually, this is how it would look if the covariance is also changing with respect to time. So these are the three, all three components should be pretty much constant. And that is when you have stationary data. And in order to perform time series analysis, the data should be stationary. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the concept of uh, moving average or the method of moving average. Uh, and let's see how it works. We'll do simple calculations. So let's say this is our sample data. We have the data for three months, uh, January, February, March, the sales, in hundreds of uh, in thousands rather not hundreds thousands of dollars 
is given here and uh, now we want to find the moving average so how do we find the moving average we call it as moving average 3 so moving average 3 is nothing but you take three of the values or the readings add them up and uh, divide by 3 basically the way we take a mean or average of the three values so that is as simple as that so that's the average first of all so what is moving average moving average is if you now have a series of data you keep taking the three values the next three values and then you take the average of that and then the next three values and so on and so forth so that is how you take the moving average so let's take a little more detailed example of car sales so this is how we have the car sales data for the entire year let's say so rather for four years so year one we have for each quarter quarter one two three four and then year two quarter one two three four and so on and so forth so this is how we have sales data of a particular car let's say or a showroom and uh, we want to forecast for year five so we have the data for four years we now want to focus for the fifth year let's see how it works first of all if we plot the data as it is uh, taken the raw data this is how it would look and uh, what do you think it is is it stationary no right because there is a trend upward trend so this is not a stationary data so we um, we need to later we will see how to make it uh, stationary but to start with just an example we will not worry about it for now we will just go ahead and uh, manually do the forecasting using what is known as moving average method okay so we are not applying any algorithm or anything like that in the next video we will see how to apply an algorithm how to make it stationary and so on all right so um, here we see that all the three or four components that we talked about um, are there there is a trend there is a seasonality and then of course there is some random component as well cyclicity may not be it is possible that cyclicity is not applicable in all the situations for sales especially there may not be or unless you're taking a sales for maybe 20 30 years cyclicity may not come into play so we will just consider uh, primarily the trend seasonality and irregularity right so random it is also known as random irregularity right so we were kind of calling the random or irregularity component so these are the three main components typically in this case we will talk about so this is the trend component and um, we will see how to do these uh, calculations so let's take a look redraw the table including the time code we will add another column which is the time code and uh, this is the column and we just number it like 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 16. The rest of the data remains the same. Okay, so we will do the calculations now. Now let us do the moving average calculations um, or MA4 as we call it for each year. So we take all the four quarters and we take an average of that. So if we add up these four values and divide by 4, you get the moving average of 3.4. So we start by putting the value here. So that will be for the third quarter let's say one two three the third quarter then we will go on to the next one so we take the next four values as you see here and take the average of that which is the moving average for the next quarter and so on and so forth now if we just do the moving average uh, it is not centered so what we do is we basically add one more column and we calculate the centered moving average as shown here so here what we do is we take the average of two values and then just adding these values here so for example the first value for the third quarter is actually the average of the third and the fourth quarter so we have 3.5 now it gets centered so similarly the next value would be 3.6 plus 3.9 divided by 2 so which is 3.7 and so on and so forth okay so that is the centered moving average this is done primarily to smoothen the data so that there are not too many rough edges so that is what we do here so if we visualize this data now uh, this is how it looks right so if we take the centered moving average as you can see there is a gradual increase if this was not the case if we had not centered it the changes would have been much sharper so that is the basically the smoothening that uh, we are talking about now let's go and or uh, do the forecast for the fifth year so in order to do the forecast what we will do is we will take 
the centered moving average as our baseline and then start doing a few more calculations that are required in order to come up with the prediction. So what we are going to do is we are going to use this multiplicity or multiplicative model in this case and this is how it, it looks. So we take the product of seasonality and uh, the trend and the irregularity components and we just multiply that and in order to get that this product of these two we have basically the actual value divided by CMA. Yt value divided by CMA will give you the predicted value or Yt is equal to the product of all three components. Therefore, ST into Yt is equal to Yt by CMA. So this is like this is equal to Yt, right? So therefore, if we want ST into Yt, the product of seasonality and irregularity it is equal to Yt by CMA. So that is how we will work it out. I also have an Excel sheet of the actual data. So let me just pull that up. All right. So this is how the data looks in Excel. As you can see here, year one, quarter one, two, three, four, year two, quarter one, two, three, four, and so on. And this is the sales data. And then this is the moving average. As I mentioned, this is how we calculate. And this is the centered moving average. So this is the primary component that we will start working with. And then we will calculate since we want the product of SC into YT that is equal to YT by CMA. So if you see these values are nothing but the YT value divided by CMA. So in this case it is 4 by 3.5 which is 1.14 similarly 4.5 by 3.7 1.22 and so on and so forth. So we take we have the product ST into IT and uh, then the next step is to uh, calculate the average of um, respective quarters. So that is what we are doing here average of respective quarters and then we need to calculate the deseasonalized values. So in order to get deseasonalized value we need to divide YT by ST that was calculated. So for example, here it is 2.8 by 0.9. So we got the deseasonalized value here and uh, then we get the trend and then we get the predicted uh, values. So in order to get the predicted value, which is basically we predict the values for known values as well like for example year one quarter one we know the value but now that we have our model we predict ourselves and see how close it is so we predicted as 2.89 whereas the actual value is 2.8 then we have 2.59 the actual value is 2.1 and so on just to see how our model works and then continue that into the fifth year because for fifth year we don't have a reference value Okay, and if we plot this, we will come to know how well our calculations are, how well our manual model. In this case, we did not really use a model, but we did on our own manually. So it will tell us the trend. So for example, the predicted value is this gray color here. And you can see that it is actually pretty much following the actual value, which is the blue color. Right? And the gray color is the predicted value. So the wherever we know the values up to year four, we can see that our predicted values are following or pretty much very close to the actual values. And then from here onwards, when the year five starts, the blue color line is not there because we don't have the actual values, only the predicted value. So we can see that since it was following the trend pretty much for the last four years, we can safely assume that it has understood the pattern and it is predicting correctly for the next one year, the next four quarters, right? So that is what we are doing here. So these four quarters, we did not have actual data, but we have the predicted values. So let's go back and see how this is working in this using the slides. So this is, we already saw this part and uh, I think it was easier to see in the Excel sheet. So we calculated the ST, IT, the product of ST and IT using the formula like here, Y by YT by CMA, we got that. And then we got ST, which is basically YT. So this is the uh, average of the first quarters for all the four years. And uh, similarly, this is the average of the second quarter for all the four years and so on. So these values are repeating. These are, they are calculated only once. They get repeated as you can see here. And uh, then we get the deseasonalized uh, data and that is basically YT by ST. So we calculated ST here and we have YT. So YT by ST will give you the deseasonalized data. And uh, we have got rid of the seasonal and the irregular components so far. Now what we are left with is the trend. And uh, before we 
start the time series forecasting or time series analysis, as I mentioned earlier, we need to completely get rid of the non-stationary components. So we are still left with the trend component. So now let us also remove the trend component. In order to do that, we have to find the or we have to calculate the intercept and slope of the data because that is required to calculate the trend. And uh, how are we going to do that? We will actually use um, what is known as a regression tool or analytics tool that is available in Excel. So you remember we have our data in Excel. So let me take you to the Excel. And uh, here we need to calculate the intercept and the slope. In order to do that, we have to use the regression mechanism. And in order to use the regression mechanism, we have to use the analytics tool that comes with Excel. So how do you activate this tool? So this is how you would need to activate the tool. Uh, from Excel, you need to go to options. And uh, in options, there will be add-ins. And uh, in add-ins, you will have um, analysis tool pack. And you select this and um, you just say go. It will open up a box like this. You say analysis tool pack and you say okay. And now when you come back into the regular view of Excel in the data tab, you will see data analysis activated. So you need to go to file, options and add-ins and then analysis tool pack. Typically, since I've already added it, it is coming at the top, but it would come under inactive application add-ins. So when you're doing it for the first time. So don't use VBA, you just say analysis tool pack. There are two options, one with VBA, like this one, and one without VBA. So just use the one without VBA. And then instead of just saying, okay, just take care that you click on this go and not just okay. So you say go, then it will give you these options, only then, you select the, just the analysis tool pack and then you say okay all right so and then when you come back to the main view you click on data okay so this is your normal home view perhaps so you need to come to data and here is where you will see data analysis available to you and then if you click on that there are a bunch of possibilities what kind of data analysis you want to do if there are options are given right now we just want to do regression because we want to find the slope and the intercept so select regression and you say okay and you will get these options for input y range and input x range input y range is the value yt so you just select this and you can select up to here and press enter and input x range you can for now you start with uh, the baseline or you can also start with the deseasoned values so you can just click on these and say okay i have already calculated it so these are the intercept and the coefficients that we are getting for these values and we will actually use that to calculate our trend here right so this is, which is in the j column so our trend is equal to intercept plus slope into the time code so the intercept is uh, out here as we can see in our slide as well so if you see here this is our intercept and the lower value is the slope. So we have calculated here and it's shown in the slides as well. So intercept, so the formula is shown here. So our trend is equal to intercept plus slope into time code. Time code is nothing but this one, T, column A, one, two, three, four, okay? So that's how you calculate the trend and that's how you use the data analysis tool from Excel. Using these two, we calculate the predicted values and using this formula which is basically trend is equal to intercept plus slope into time code and then we can go and plot it see how it is looking and therefore so we see here that the predicted values are pretty close to the actual values and um, therefore we can safely assume that our uh, calculations which are like our manual model is working and hence we, we go ahead and predict for the fifth year so till four years 
we know the actual value as well so we can compare our model is performing and for the fifth year we don't have reference values so we can use our equations to calculate the values or predict the values for the fifth year and we can go ahead and safely calculate those values and when we plot for the fifth year as well the predicted values we see that they are pretty much they captured the pattern and we can safely assume that the predictions are fairly accurate as we can also see from the graph in the excel sheet that we have already seen okay so let's go and plot it so this is how the plot looks this is the cma or the centered moving average the green color and then the blue color is the actual data red color is the predicted value predicted by our handcrafted model okay so remember we did not use any regular forecasting model or any tool we have done this manually and uh, the actual tool will be used in the next video this is just to give you an idea about how behind the scenes or under the hood how forecasting works or time series analysis how it is performed okay so it looks like it has captured the trend properly so up to here is the known reference we have reference and from here onwards is purely predicted and uh, as i mentioned earlier we can safely assume that the values are accurate and predicted properly for the fifth year so let's go ahead and implement a time series forecast in r first of all we will be using the arima model to do the forecast of uh, this time series data so let us try to understand what is arima model so arima is actually an acronym it stands for autoregressive integrated moving average so that is what is arima model and it is specified by three parameters which is p d and q p stands for autoregressive so let me just mark this so there are three components here autoregressive integrated moving average okay so these three parameters correspond to those three components so the p stands for autoregressive d for integrated and q for moving average so let us see what exactly this is so these three factors are p is the number of autoregressive terms or ar we will see that in a little bit and d is how many uh, levels of differences that we need to do or differentiation we need to do and q is the number of lagged forecast errors so we'll see what exactly each of these are so ar is the number of autoregressive terms and which is basically denoted by the p and then we have d which is for the number of times it has to be differentiated and then we have q which is for the moving average so what exactly ar terms so in terms of the regression model autoregressive components uh, refer to the prior values of the current value well, what we mean by that is here when we talk about time series data focus on the fact that there is regression so what exactly happens in regression we try to do something like if it is simple linear regression we do some equation like y is equal to mx plus c where there are actually there are two variables one is the dependent variable and then there is an independent variable let me just complete this equation as well mx plus c right so this is a normal regression curve or a simple regression curve now here we are talking about auto regression or, or auto regressive so auto regressive as the name suggests is regression of itself so which means that here you have only one variable which is your maybe the cost of the flights or whatever it is right and the other variable is basically time dependent and therefore the value at any given time and that we will denote as yt for example so there is no x here there is only one variable and which is y and we say yt which is basically the predicted value at a time interval t for example is dependent on the previous value so for example there may be a1 and then yt minus 1 and then there will be like plus a2 and right plus a2 and yt minus 2 and uh, all right and then plus a3 into yt minus 3 
All right. So basically here what we are saying is there is only one variable here, but there is a regression component. So we are doing a regression on itself. So that's how the term auto regression comes into play. So only thing is that it is dependent on the previous time values. So there is a lag, let's say this is the first lag, second lag, third lag and so on. So the current value which is yt is dependent on the previous time lag values. So that is what is auto regression component. So this is what is shown here. For example, in this case, instead of y, we are calling it as x. So that's the same. And this is represented by some equation of that sort, depending on how many lags we take. So that is the AR component. And the term P is basically determines how many lags we are considering. So that's the term P for. Now, what is D. D is the degree of differencing. So here differencing is like to for the non-seasonal differences, right? So for example, if you take the values like this, which are given for 5, 4, 6 and so on and so forth. If you take the differencing of one after another, like for example, 5 minus 4 or 4 minus 5, the next value with the previous value. So 4 minus 5. So this is known as the first order differencing. So the result is minus 1. Similarly, 6 minus 4 is 2. 7 minus 6 is 1. So this is first order differencing and uh, here we call it as d is equal to 1 okay and same way we can have second order third order and so on then the last one is q q is the actually by we call it moving average but in reality it is actually the error of the model so we also sometimes represent as et all right so now arima model works on the assumption that the data is stationary which means that the trend and seasonality of the data has been removed. That is correct. Okay. So this we have discussed in the first part. How, what exactly is stationary data and how do we remove the non-stationary part of it. Now, in order to test whether the data is stationary or not, there are two important components that are considered. One is the autocorrelation function and the other is the partial autocorrelation function. So this is referred to as ACF and PACF. Right. So, what is autocorrelation and what is the definition? Autocorrelation is basically the similarity between values of a same variable across observations, as the name suggests. Now, how do we actually find the autocorrelation function, the value, right? So, this is basically done by plotting and autocorrelation function also tells you how correlated points are with each other based on how many time steps they are separated by and so on. That is basically the time lag that we were talking about and it is also used to determine how past and future data points are related and the value of the autocorrelation function can vary from minus 1 to 1. So if we plot this is how it would look autocorrelation function would look somewhat like this and there is actually a readily available function in R so we will see that and you can use that to plot your autocorrelation function okay. So that is ACF and we will see that in our R studio in a little bit and similarly you have partial autocorrelation function. So partial autocorrelation function is the degree of association between two variables while adjusting the effect of one or more additional variables. So this again can be measured and it can also be plotted and its value once again can go from minus 1 to 1 and it gives the partial correlation of time series with its own lagged value. So lag again we have discussed in the previous uh, couple of slides. This is how a PSCF plot would look in R Studio. We will see that as well and once we get into the R Studio. And with that let's get into R Studio and take a look at our use case. Before we go into the code, let's just quickly understand what exactly is the objective of this use case. So we are going to predict some values or forecast some values and we have the data of the airline ticket sales of uh, the previous years and now we will try to find the, or predict the, or forecast the values for the future years. All right. So we will basically identify the time series components like trend, seasonality and uh, random behavior. We will actually visualize this in our studio and then we will actually forecast the values based on the past values or history data, historical data.
So these are the steps that we follow. We will see in our studio in a little bit. Just quickly, let's go through what are the steps. We load the data and it is a time series data. If we try to find out what class it belongs to. The data is actually air passengers data that is already comes preloaded with uh, our studio. So we will be using that and we can take a look at the data and then what is the starting point? What is the end point? So these are all functions that are readily available we'll be using. And then what is the frequency? So it's basically frequency is 12, which is like yearly data, right? So every month the data has been collected. So for each year it is 12. And then we can check for many missing values if there are any. And then we can take a look at the summary of the data. This is what we do in exploratory data analysis. And then we can plot the data, visualize the data, how it is looking. And uh, we will see how the data has some trend, seasonality and so on and so forth. All right, then we can take a look at the cycle of the data using the cycle function and uh, we can see that it is every month that's the cycle and of every 12 months a new cycle begins so the each month of the year is uh, the data is available and then we can do box plots to see for each month how the data is varying over the various uh, 10 or 12 years that we will be uh, looking at this data and uh, from exploratory data analysis we can identify that there is a trend there is a seasonality component and how the seasonality component varies also we can see from the box plots and we can decompose the data we can use the decompose function rather to see the various components like the seasonality trend and the irregularity part okay so we will see all of this in our studio this is how they will uh, look this is the once you decompose and uh, this is how you will actually you can visualize the data this is the actual data and this is the trend as you can see it's going upwards this is the seasonal component and this is your random or irregularity right so we call it irregularity or we can also call it random as you can see here yes so the data must have a constant variance and mean which means that it is stationary before we start any analysis time series analysis and uh, without so basically yeah if it is stationary only then it is easy to model the data perform time series analysis so we can then go ahead and fit the model as uh, we discussed earlier we'll be using arima model there are some techniques to find out what should be the parameters so we will see that when we go into our studio so the auto arima function basically tells us what should be the parameters right so these parameters are the p d and q that we talked about that's what is being shown here so if we use auto arima it will basically take all possible values of this p d q these parameters and it will find out what is the best value and then it will recommend so that is the advantage of using auto arima all right so like in uh, this case it will tell us what if we use this parameter trace we set the parameter trace is equal to true then it will basically tell us what is the value of this aic which has to be minimum so the lower the value the better so for each of these combinations of p d and q it will give us the values here and then it will recommend to us which is the best model okay because whichever has the lowest value of this AIC, it will recommend that as our best uh, PDQ values. So once we have that, we can see that we will basically, we can potentially get a model or the equation. Model is nothing but the equation and based on the parameters that we get. And we can do some diagnostics. We can do some plotting to see how whether there is a plot for the residuals. So which shows the stationarity and then we can also take a look at the ACF and PACF. We can plot the ACF and PACF and then we can do some forecasting for the future years. So in this case we have up to 1960 and then we can see how we can forecast for the next 10 years which is 1970 up to 1970 and once we have done this can we validate this model yes definitely we can validate this model and uh, to validate the findings we use uh, junk box uh, test and this is how you just call box.test and then you pass these uh, parameters and you will get the values that will be returned which will tell us whether this how accurate this model is how accurate the predictions are so the values of p are quite insignificant in this case we will see that and that also indicates that our model is free 
theory of autocorrelation and that will basically be it so let's go back and into our r studio and uh, go through these steps in uh, real time so we have to import this library forecast package is not installed you have to go here and install the forecast package okay so that's the easy way to install rather than to so click on this install i will not do it now because i've already installed so the first time that's only one time then after that you just have to load it into memory and then keep going so we will load this data called air passengers so by calling this data method and if you see the the data air passengers is loaded here and if we check for the class it is a time series data ts data so we can check for the dates we can also view the data in a little bit and the start date is 1949 and january and our end date is 1960 december and the frequency is 12 which is like collected monthly so that is the frequency which is uh, 12 here and then we check if there are any um, missing values there are no missing values and then we take a look at the summary of the data this is all exploratory data analysis and then if you just display the data this is how it looks and then we need to decompose this data so we will kind of uh, store this in an object ts data and then use that to decompose and store the new values so let me just clear this for now and uh, if we decompose basically as we have seen in the slides decomposing is breaking it into the trend seasonality and the irregular or random components then you can go ahead and plot it so when you plot it you can see here let me zoom this this is our original plot or observed value as it is known as then we have decomposed the three parts which is basically the trend as you can see there is a poor trend then the seasonal component so this is a, some regularly occurring pattern and then there is a random value which is basically you cannot really give any equation or function or anything like that so that's what this plotting has done and then you can actually plot them individually as well so these are the individual plots for the trend for the seasonal component and the random component all right so now let's Take a look at the original data and see how the trend is in a way. So if we do this linear regression line, it will show that it is going upwards. And we can also take a look at the cycle that are there, which is nothing but we have a frequency of 12, right? So the cycles will display that it is January, February to December, and then back to January, February, and so on and so forth. And if we do box plots, for the monthly data, you will see that for each of the months, right? And over the 10 years that the data that we have, we will see that there is a certain pattern, right? This is also in a way to find the seasonality component. So while January, February sales are relatively low, around July, August, the sales pick up. So especially in July, I think the sales are the highest. And this seems to be happening pretty much every year, right? So this is every year in july there seems to be a peak in the sales and then it goes down and slightly higher in december and so on so that is again part of our exploratory data analysis and once again let's just plot the data now as i said in order to fit into an arima model we need the values of p d and q now one way of doing it is there are multiple ways actually of doing it the earlier method of doing it was you draw the autocorrelation function plot and then partial autocorrelation function plot and then observe that and where does this change and then identify what should be the values of p and q and so on now r really has a very beautiful method which we can use to avoid all that manual process that we used to do earlier so what r will do is there is a method called auto arima and if we just call this auto arima method and it will basically go and test the arima model for all possible values of these parameters pdq and then it will suggest to you what should be the best model and it will return that best model with the right values of pd and q so you we as data scientists don't have to do any manual you know trial and error kind of 
uh, stuff okay so we got the model now and uh, this is the model it, it has pdq values are 211 pdq and this is the seasonal part of it so we can ignore it for now and so if we want to actually understand how this has returned these values 211 as the best one there is uh, another functionality or feature where we can use this trace function or trace parameter so if you pass to auto arima the trace parameter what it will do is it will show you how it is doing this calculation what is the value of the aic basically aic is what you know defines the accuracy of the model the lower the better okay so for each combination of pdq it will show us the value of aic so let's run it before instead of me talking so much let's run this if we run auto arima with trace you see here there is a red mark here that means it is performing it's executing this and here we see the display right so it starts with certain values of uh, pdq and then it uh, finds that value is too high so it starts with again with some 0 1 1 0 and so on and so forth and ultimately it tells us okay this is our best model you see here so it says this is our best model 2 1 1 let's go back and see did we get the same one yes we got the same one when we ran without trace as well right now why is 2 1 1 let us see where is 2 1 1 here is our 2 1 1 and if you come compare the values you see that 1017 is pretty much the lowest value and uh, therefore it is saying this is our best model all other values are higher so that's how you kind of uh, get your model and uh, now that you have your model what you have to do you need to predict the values right so before that let us just do some test of these uh, values so for that you install t-series again if you are doing it for the first time you would rather use this package and install and say t-series and install it and then you just use this library function to load it into your memory all right so now that we got our model using auto arima let us go ahead and forecast and also test the model and also plot the ACF and PSCF. Remember we talked about this, but we did not really use it. We don't have to use that, but at least we will visualize it. And uh, for some of the stuff, we may need this T-series library. So if you are doing this for the first time, you may have to install it. And my recommendation is don't use it in the code. You go here and install T-series and i will not do it now because i have already installed it but this is a preferred method and once you install it you just load it using this library's uh, function and then you can plot your residuals and uh, this is how the residuals look and you can plot your acf and pscf okay so this is how your pscf looks and this is how your acf looks for now, there is really nothing else we need to do with ACF and PSCF. This is just to visualize how that how it looks. But as I mentioned earlier, we were actually using these visualizations or these graphs to identify the values of P, D, and Q. And how that was done, it's uh, out of scope of this video. So we will leave it at that. And uh, then we will forecast for the next 10 years. How do we forecast that? So we call forecast and we pass the model and we pass what is the level of accuracy that you need which is 95 percent and for how many periods right so basically we want for 10 years which is like 10 into 12 time periods so that's what we are doing here and now we can plot the forecast value so you see this is the original value up to i think 62 or whatever and then it goes up to 72 this blue color is the predicted value let's go and zoom it up so that we can see it better so from here onwards we are forecasting and you can see that it looks like our model has kind of learned the pattern and this pattern looks very similar to what we see in the actual data now how do we test our model so we can do what is known as a box test and we pass our model here residuals basically with different lags and from those values here the p values here we find that they are reasonably low the p values which means our model is fairly accurate we'll be creating two dashboards using a sample sales data set so if you want to get the data and the dashboard file that we'll be creating in this demo then please put your email ids in the comment section of the video our team will share the files via email now 
Let's begin by understanding what is a dashboard in Excel. A dashboard is a visual interface that provides an overview of key measures relevant to a particular objective with the help of charts and graphs. Dashboard reports allow managers to get a high-level overview of the business and help them make quick decisions. There are different types of dashboards such as strategic dashboards, analytical dashboards and operational dashboards. An advantage of dashboards is the quick detection of outliers and correlations. With comprehensive data visualization, it is time-saving as compared to running multiple reports. With this understanding, let's jump into our demo. For creating our dashboards, we'll be using a sample sales dataset. Let me show you the dataset first. So here is the sales dataset that we'll be using for our demo. So this dataset was actually generated using a simulator and is completely random. It was not validated, though we have applied certain transformations to the data using Power Query features. So this data, as you can see, has 1000 rows. So using the simulator, we had generated 1000 rows of data. Similarly, if I go on top, you can see this data set has 17 columns. Now let me give you a brief about each of the columns. So first we have the region column. So we have Middle East and North Africa, this North America, Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa and others. Similarly, we have the country names from which the item was ordered. The third column is the item type. So we have different items, cosmetics, vegetables, there's baby food, cereal, fruits, etc. Then we have the representative's name or you can see this as the customer name who ordered the product. Then we have a sales channel column. So there are basically two channels, whether the item was sold offline or online. Next, we have the order priority column. Now here C stands for critical. Then we have H which is for high priority orders. Then we have M for medium priority orders. And finally, we have L which is for low priority orders. You can see the order date column. Then we have the order ID, the ship date. Next we have units sold, which is basically the total number of units sold for each item. Then we have the unit price column. This is the price at which each product was sold. Then we have the unit cost column, which is basically the production cost for each of the items. Next, we have the total revenue. The total revenue is actually the product of unit sold and unit price. Then we have the total cost column. Now the total cost column is actually the product of unit sold and the unit cost. Similarly, we have the total profit column. So total profit is the difference between total revenue and the total cost. And finally, we have created two more columns that is order year and then we have order month. Now these two columns were actually generated using the Power Query features. So we used the order date column, which is this column and extracted order year and order month. So first we are going to create a revenue dashboard where we'll focus on generating reports for revenue by order year, revenue by year and region, revenue by order priority and much more. We'll create separate pivot tables and pivot charts and format them to make them look more interesting and presentable. We'll add slices and timeline to our dashboards in order to filter it based on specific fields. Now let's create our first report to see the total revenue generated each year. So we need to create a pivot table for this. I'll click on a cell in my data set and then I'll go to the insert tab. Here we have the option to select the pivot table. I click on this. You can see my table range is selected. Next, I want to place my pivot table in a new worksheet and let's just click on OK. There you go. So we have a new sheet where I can place my pivot table. So first, I need to find the total revenue generated by each year. So what I'll do is, I'll drag my order year column under rows and then I'll select the total revenue column under values. You can see I have my pivot chart ready. Now if you want you can sort this. So from the data you can see we have order year from 2010 to 2017. Now based on this data let's create our pivot chart. So I'll click on any cell 
go to insert and here you have the option to select recommended charts i click on this now actually i want a line chart so i'll click on line here and select ok there you go so we have successfully created our first pivot chart now let me show you how you can format this chart to make it more readable so first let me delete these so i'll right click and select hide all field buttons on the chart so this will delete the buttons present on the chart now let me go ahead and edit the chart title so the title i want is total revenue i'll type it down by year all right next let's do a few more transformations so if i click on this plus sign which is actually for chart elements we have some options like to add axis axis titles chart title data labels this grid lines legend and others okay so let's remove the legend now you can see the total legend is gone now let me add axis titles so we we'll label our x axis and y axis so here under x axis i can write it as year similarly on the y axis i'll put revenue okay now you can move a bit all right now let me select this chart style option and go to colors first here i'll select yellow color okay and then let me go back to style let's select a new style from this list i want this style okay now you can also add data labels i'll expand this and under category i'll select custom now here we'll give a format code which is a bit different so this is actually a kind of a formula so i'll write if my revenue value is greater than let's say 9 lakhs 99000 let me make sure there are six nines here so 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 okay we are good to go i'll close the bracket i'll give a hash give two commas so if the revenue is greater than 9 lakhs 99000 i'll put it in the format of millions so within double quotes i'll write m i'll give a semicolon followed by another hash and if the value is less than the desired number it should be 0 million let me click on add all right you can see how nicely we have formatted our data and you see here we have added the new format which is in millions all right now if you want you can go ahead and adjust the boxes let me move this a bit up i'll delete this now if you notice this line chart you can make a few conclusions for example if you see here in 2010 the total revenue generated was nearly 175 million now this came down to 150 million in 2011 then the revenue constantly grew from 2011 till 2014 it reached 195 million and after 2014 it again came down to 180 million and the revenue dropped significantly between 2016 and 2017 in 2017 the revenue was just 96 million now before moving ahead to my next chart let me just rename this sheet so i'll write it as revenue by year all right now let's analyze the revenue generated each year in different regions so for this we'll create another pivot table let me close this i'll click on any cell 
go to insert and select pivot table i'll just click ok so that my pivot table is placed on a new sheet all right now this time we want the revenue by each year and region so first of all let's drag region to columns then let's drag the order year column under rows and then i'll select total revenue onto values so here you can see we have the pivot table ready so for 2010 you can see in asia this was the revenue generated similarly if you see for 2013 this was the total revenue generated in europe and we have for other years as well now let's create a line chart based on this pivot table so i'll select any cell in the pivot table i'll go to insert and i'll click on recommended charts from this list i'll select my line chart and click on ok there you go so we have our next pivot chart ready so on the right you see the different regions that are present in different colors let me just expand it so that you can see all the regions we have so in total we have seven regions and each of the regions have been represented in different colors so if you notice this graph for the sub-saharan african region in 2012 sub-saharan africa made the highest amount of sales now from the sample data you can also tell that the revenue for north america has been significantly low compared to other regions similarly if you see for europe this was the revenue trend between 2010 and 2017 so if you see here in 2011 the sales were at this level then it significantly dropped in 2012 then in 2013 there was a huge spike and then in again came down in 2015 and so on so you can make your own conclusions by looking at these line charts now let's format this chart so first of all let's delete the field buttons present on the chart and we'll also delete the legend all right now let me just reduce the size of the chart next we'll add a chart title so we'll give the title as revenue by year and region okay you can also format the y-axis in terms of millions so I'll right click on this axis and I'll select format axis I'll scroll down and here we have the number drop down let me scroll again under category I'll select custom and we'll use this format that we created for our previous chart there you go you can see our access labels have been changed in terms of millions now so let's close this and let me save it now you can reduce the font size or increase the font size let me just show you suppose you want to increase the font size of the chart title so you just select it and from here you can either reduce or you can increase you can see now it's 12 if you want you can make it 16 similarly you can also edit the access labels also by selecting the chart title you can also move it to left or right or you can place it in the center as well for the time being let me just keep it to the left all right now we'll see the revenue and total cost by each region and we'll create a combo chart for this so let me show you how to do it i'll go to my data sheet i have my cell selected i'll go to insert and click on pivot table let me just click on ok all right so for this i'll select my region onto rows and then i'll have two columns under values the first one is going to be total revenue and the next column will be the total cost column all right 
so here we have the pivot table ready now based on this pivot table let's create our pivot chart so i'll go to recommended charts and if you see below at the bottom we have combo chart so this is the preview of the combo chart all right now let me just click on ok there you go so we have a nice combo chart ready here now the way to look at it is the bars represent the total revenue which is this column now the line represents the total cost so let me go ahead and edit this chart a bit so first of all let's delete the field buttons all right and let's also remove the legend from here next we'll add data labels so i'll click on data labels here okay so these are the data labels for the bars or the revenue column now let's format the data labels in terms of millions so i'll click on this arrow go to more options if i scroll down i have number from here i'll select custom and i'll choose my type that is in millions all right so you can see we have formatted our data next thing we'll add a chart title so here i'll write as revenue by region it's actually revenue and total cost by region before moving ahead let me rename the sheets as well i'll write revenue and total cost similarly sheet 3 also i'm going to rename it as revenue by year and region so this makes your sheet more readable all right now moving ahead next we are interested to get the revenue generated by order priority and for this we are going to create a pie chart so let's go to the data sheet and create our pivot table first i click on okay now i'll select order priority under rows and under values i'll select total revenue so this is a very simple pivot table so you have your order priority so c is for critical h is for high l is for low and m is for medium now based on this let's create a pie chart so i'll go to recommended charts and here you have pie chart i want to select this 3d type of pie chart and i'll click on okay all right so we have our pie chart ready let me just resize it and from here i'll remove the field buttons and i also don't need the legend so i'll delete this as well all right now let's give a chart title so this is going to be revenue by order priority now let's add our data labels i'll check this option okay now let's again format this in terms of millions so here i'll click on the last option i'll go to numbers under category i'll select custom and my type is going to be in terms of millions there you go let me close this i'll just move this to the center all right now if you want you can change the color of the text as well so let's have it in white color and see how it looks okay so this looks pretty decent cool now moving to our next report so this time we are going to find the total revenue by countries so we have multiple countries present in our data set we want to visualize the revenue generated in each country so for this we are going to create a horizontal bar chart so let me show you how to do it 
But before moving ahead, let me just rename this sheet. So I'll write revenue by, I'll just put OP which stands for order priority. Alright. Now, let's create our horizontal bar chart. I'll go to insert, click on pivot table and select OK. So I want my revenue based on different countries. So I'll select country and put it under rows. And then I'll choose total revenue and place it under values. So here you have the different country names. We have Afghanistan, this Albania. Let me scroll down. You have Bangladesh. There are a number of countries. You have Czech Republic, there's Estonia, France, Gabon. Similarly, if you scroll down, we have India, there's Jamaica, Italy. And all the way to the bottom, if we go, we have New Zealand, there's Netherlands, Philippines, Portugal. We also have Singapore, lots and lots of countries. We have the UAE, United States of America, Zimbabwe, and others. Alright, let me go up. So based on this pivot table, let's create our pivot chart. So I'll go to insert and select recommended charts. From here, I'm going to select the column chart. You can see the preview here and let me click on OK. Alright, so here you can see the different country names at the bottom and the revenue for each of the countries. Let's go ahead and edit this chart. So first of all, I'll delete the field buttons. Okay, and let me also remove the legend. Here, I'll write revenue by countries this is going to be my chart title okay let's format this chart a little more so I'll click on this option and we'll select a new style let's say I'll select style 6 okay and let me now go under colors and we'll select the color of the bars so let's choose this color okay so you have a horizontal column chart ready and at the bottom you can see the different country names and we have the revenue cool now let me go ahead and rename this sheet. So I'll write revenue by countries and hit enter. Okay. And finally, we'll create another report which is going to be part of our revenue dashboard. And this is revenue by items. So we'll visualize our revenue for different items present in the table so if you see this we have cosmetics vegetables cereal fruits there's cloths snacks households and other products as well so let's check the revenue for each of these items so we'll continue the same drill I'll create my pivot table on a new worksheet and this time I'm going to drag item type under rows and will have the total revenue under values so here on the left of the table you can see we have the different item names and then we have the total revenue so let me just short this total revenue from largest to smallest so you can see here office supplies made the highest amount of revenue followed by household then cosmetics and fruits made the lowest amount of revenue I'll click on this go to insert and select recommended charts this time I'm going to create a bar chart so this is how my bar chart is going to look like I'll select OK alright now let's format this chart a bit I'll delete the field buttons and I'll delete the legend as well and Let's edit the chart title. So this is going to be revenue by items. Cool. 
we also want to change the color of the bars so i have selected all the bars i'll go to my home tab and here let's say i want to select green color all right i've edited my chart a bit now let's make it 14 and i'll remove the bold okay here if you want you can change the font also let's keep it in blue color all right finally let's rename this sheet so i'll write revenue by items cool finally now it's time for us to merge all the charts that we have created to our dashboard so let me show you how you can create the dashboard i'll create a new sheet and first thing i'm going to do is i'll click on the view tab and uncheck grid lines so this will remove the grid lines present in the worksheet next i'm going to insert an image so we'll have a background image on our dashboard so the way to do is i'll go to the insert tab and under illustrations i have the option to select pictures or insert pictures so i'm going to insert picture present on the device that is my computer i'll go to desktop and here i have a folder called excel dashboard files and i'll select this dashboard background and hit insert so this is going to insert an image now let me just drag this image so it covers a fair enough portion so i'll hit shift and i'll drag it all right so you can see i have successfully added a background image if you want you can still expand this background image a bit to the right cool now the next thing is going to be the title of the dashboard so i'll click on insert and here i have the option to select a text box so i'll click on a text box and i'm going to place a text box in the middle and i'm going to name this text box as excel revenue dashboard on sales i'll center line it let's do some more formatting so i'll select this text box on the top you can see shape format here i'm going to expand this shape fill and i'll select no fill so my text box is transparent now and i'll also remove the outline all right now let me just double click on the title of my dashboard and i'm going to select a font you can select whichever font you want let me stick to britannica bold and i'll increase the size to let's say 30 all right i'll just drag the text box i'll make the text as white instead of black all right so we have our title of the dashboard ready now if you want you can also insert some icons to this dashboard so i'll go to insert and i'll click on illustrations again and select pictures i'm going to add this two pictures which is of a store and a cart to make it look visually appealing so i'll place the icons here and similarly let me just copy it and i'll place the cart and the store to the right as well all right next 
the idea is to bring in all the charts that we have created and place it on the dashboard so let me copy each of the charts and place it on the dashboard so i'll hit ctrl v to paste it and we'll resize this as well all right Similarly, let me bring in all the other charts as well. Alright, so now you can see I have added all my charts and graphs to this dashboard. So you can see here we have our line charts, our column charts, the combo charts, the spy chart and others. Now let me go ahead and format these charts a little more. So you can see this looks a bit cluttered. So let's adjust the labels. Let me bring this down. Similarly, I'll bring 190 million a little below. All right, this looks fine now. One more thing we are going to do is we'll remove the white background from each of the charts and make it transparent. So let me show you how to do it. So I'll select this chart then I'll right click and go to format chart area here on the right you see we have an option called no fill so if I select no fill you can see the white background is gone now similarly let me also remove the grid lines so I'll select the grid lines and hit delete so you have also removed the grid lines from here now let's also remove the white outline that we have so I'll select this chart go to format and here I'll go to shape outline and I'll select no outline you see this so we have our total revenue by year which is a line chart and this is completely transparent now now what I'm going to do is I'll place this chart over a box so I'll go to insert and in insert we have the option to create a shape so I'll click on illustrations and here I'll choose a shape and let me select a rectangle so I'll just create a rectangle here alright and now what I'll do is I'll select this and bring this to front I'll right click and choose bring to front and I'll place this shape below it alright now the next thing is to edit the shape so first I'll change the color of this box so let me select this blue color and and let me increase the transparency so I'll right click and go to format shape here I'll increase the transparency let's keep it to 25% or let's say 20% alright next thing we'll just convert all the font to white color including the axis labels the chart title will also convert all the axis labels to white color so it looks better now we'll just adjust our chart over here next thing let's just remove the outline so I'll go to shape outline and I'll select no outline you see we have now formatted our chart let's just pull this a little up all right now we'll add this blue background to all the other charts so we'll first add the background make it transparent and then we'll convert the font text to white color to make it more readable and visible so for the time being I'll just pause the video and come back again alright so now you can see on your screens we have nicely formatted our dashboard so I've added a few logos for each of the charts you can see the logos here so for revenue by countries we have a globe then if you see here this is kind of a map or a location similarly we have all formatted the color of the bars 
then we have also formatted the labels in terms of millions if you look on the y-axis even the revenue for year and region are all formatted in terms of millions if you want this you can also format the total year by revenue in terms of millions so the way to do is you can select this graph right click and go to format axis here if I scroll down you have numbers and under category I'll select custom then I'll select my type as this format which is in millions and you see here we have successfully formatted our y-axis labels alright so the next thing is to add slicers and timelines to our dashboard now slicers are used to format your data based on a particular column suppose if you want to see revenue by certain items you can add item as a slicer and you can view the entire dashboard similarly for timelines you can add date columns so if you want to see what was the amount of sales or revenue generated on a particular year or a particular month you can do that using a timeline so I'll select one of the charts and then either you can go to the insert tab and here you can see under filters we have slices and timeline or if you go to the pivot chart analyze tab here also you have insert slicer and timeline option so I'll select insert slicer here first now it's giving me the list of fields present in the data set so I'll select country region and let's say we want to know by item type and sales channel so these are going to be my four slicers I'll click on OK you can see it here we have our four slicers here and these are the list of values under region we have Asia this Europe North America and others similarly we have the different country names for country slicers and then for item type also we have all the items that were present in our data set now moving ahead we need to connect all the slicers to a dashboard so what I'll do is I'll right click on this option and I'll go to report connections okay so under report connections you have all the pivot tables that we created you currently see only one of the pivot table is selected so we need to select all the pivot tables so let me check all the pivot tables present in this workbook and click on OK alright now that we have connected one of our slicers we'll now connect the other remaining slicers so I'll right click on this go to report connections and I'll check all the pivot tables present in this worksheet click on OK similarly let's do it for the country slicer I'll go to report connections and let me select all the pivot tables and finally we have the item type so I'll right click go to report connections and then I'll select all my pivot tables and let's hit OK alright now let me just organize this a bit so I'll place my pivot tables to the right I'll just reduce the size let me scroll down now I'll add my region slicer here similarly I'll add my final slicer that is sales channel now in our next dashboard which is going to be the profit dashboard I'll show you how to add a timeline alright now I have arranged all my slicers so let's say you want to find the revenue that was generated for an item type let's say beverages so you can just select beverages here and all your charts show the respective revenues so you have the total revenue by year for beverages only 
Similarly, here you can see the revenue by year and region only for beverages item type. If I scroll down, now this chart represents the revenue that was generated in each of the countries only for item type beverages. Let me just uncheck it. Alright. Let's say you want to see the revenue generated for a country like India. So I have selected India here and now you can see my graph has changed only for country India. You can see here it is showing only for India now. Now similarly you can also filter your revenues based on the different regions. Let's say you want to know the revenue generated based on sales channel so we have two sales channel that is offline and online suppose you want to know the revenue generated offline so i'll just select offline you can see the values have changed so these were the revenues generated for each of the items only for offline if you see here now these were all the offline sales for the different regions so this is our entire Excel revenue dashboard on sales. We created multiple charts and graphs. Then we applied different formatting. We added different icons. Then we formatted the labels also. Next, we added slicers. And finally, we saw how we could filter our data based on these slicers. Likewise, now we are going to create a profit dashboard based on the same data so before moving ahead let me rename this sheet as revenue dashboard i'll write rev dashboard okay now we'll move to our data sheet and start creating our pivot tables and pivot charts for the profit dashboard all right so let me go ahead and create my first pivot table so I'll create a new worksheet. This time, I'm going to create a line chart to visualize the profit for each year. So I'll drag my total profit column to values and my order year to rows. So here you can see we have our pivot table ready. Now you can sort this data to get an idea as to which year had the highest profit and which year had the lowest profit so from this pivot table you can see since I've sorted this data in descending order so 2014 had the maximum amount of profit and 2017 had the least amount of profit I'll just do control Z to undo it all right now based on this pivot table let me go ahead and create my pivot chart so I'll go to recommended charts and click on a line chart so this is the preview of the chart I'll click on OK. Let me close this. Similarly, we are going to edit this chart now. So first I'll hide all the field buttons present on the chart and I'll rename the chart title as Total Profit by Year. Next, I'm going to remove the legend. So I'll delete this. Let's do some more formatting. So I'll go to style and this time I'm going to select my style type. Okay. And if you want, you can choose the colors as well for the time being. Let's have this yellow color. Next, let me add the data labels. So again, if you see here, this is not formatted properly. So let's go ahead and format the data labels. So I'll click on number and I'll select custom here. And the type I'm going to select is in millions and I'll click on close. So here you can see we have our line chart ready which shows total profit by year. Let's rename this sheet as profit by year 
All right. Now let's move back to our data sheet again. Next, we are going to show the total profit by countries. For this, I am going to create a map. So let me first create my pivot table. So I'll go to insert and I'll click on pivot table. Let me click on OK. Since I want the country name, so I'll select country under rows and then I have my total profit under values. The next thing I'm going to do is I'll just rename the row labels as countries and then I'm going to delete the grand total which you can see at the bottom. So here we have the grand total. Let me just delete the grand total. So I'm going to select this pivot table, go to the design tab. Here we have subtotals and grand totals. I'll switch off the grand total. Let me just verify it again. I'll scroll down. You see the grand total has gone now. All right. Now we want to create a map out of this. The way to do is I'm going to select my data, copy it. I'll go on top and I'll paste it here. Using this data, I can create my field map now. So I'll go to insert here we have the option to create a field map. There you go. You can see we have our map ready. I can expand this. Now, as you can see, our map has a color scale which comes from light gray color to dark blue color. So the countries that are in gray or you can say light blue have the lowest amount of profit while the regions or the countries that have been shaded in dark color a dark blue color have highest amount of profit. I will go ahead and delete this scale. Okay. Next, we need to connect this map to the original data source. So what I will do is, I will right click on this map and I will go to select data. Here instead of the previous range, I will give my new range now. So my new range will be my original pivot table that I had created. I'll go on top and click on OK. So we have our map ready now. Now if you want, you can change the color of the shade. So I'll just go to colors and let's say we'll keep green color. So the countries that are shaded in dark green have the highest amount of profit while those which are highlighted in light green color are, are the countries that made least amount of profit. Okay, now moving on, next we want to create a pivot table that will show us the profit by year and sales channel. So for this we are going to create another line chart. So I'll go to insert and click on pivot table. So I'll select new worksheet. Here since I want to know the profit by year, first of all I'll drag my order year column to rows. And then I'll choose my total profit column under values. Next, I'm going to select my sales channel under columns. There you go. So we have our pivot table here. Now based on this pivot table, let me create my pivot chart. So I'll go to recommended charts and I'm going to create a line chart. I close this. You see here, based on this chart, you can tell the profit generated with online sales were actually lower than that of offline. So here the blue line represents offline profit and the orange line represents online profit. If you mark clearly in year 2012, the online profit was actually higher than the offline profit. So let me go ahead and edit this chart a bit. So we'll delete the field buttons. I'll also delete the legend for now. Let me go ahead and add a chart title so i'll write profit by year and sales channel okay so this is my second report before moving ahead let me just rename this sheet so i'll write profit by 
countries similarly let me rename this sheet as profit by year and let's say sc for sales channel okay moving ahead now i want to create a pie chart based on a pivot table that will show the profit by sales channel only so this is going to be a simple pie chart so i'll first go to insert click on pivot table and click on ok so i'll drag my sales channel under rows and then we'll have the total profit column under values so this is my simple pivot table now let's create our pivot chart which is going to be a pie chart let me explore the other types of pie charts we have okay so i'm going to select a donut chart here i click on okay let's edit this chart i'll remove the field buttons let me now remove the legend as well i'll just resize it and this is going to be profit by sales channel okay let's also add data labels and here again i'm going to format this label i'll select the category as custom and my type will be in millions okay let me just move this to the left and this to the right okay let's also delete the lines cool now let me just rename this sheet so i'll write profit by let's say sc which stands for sales channel cool finally i'm going to create a report that will show the revenue and profit by items so i'll go ahead and create my pivot table first this time i'll choose my total profit under values and we'll also have the revenue column so i'll put my revenue at the top then i'm going to select item type under rows so here is my pivot table based on this pivot table let me now create a combo chart so you can see the preview of the chart the blue bars represent the total revenue and the orange line represents the total profit i'll click on okay let me close this first let's remove the field buttons let's also remove the legend here then we'll add a chart title i'll name it as revenue and profit by items okay if you want you can also go ahead and change the color of the bars so let me just select one of these colors okay all right so we have our five reports ready that we are going to use for our profit dashboard next let's create a new sheet and we'll get started with building our dashboard so i'll click on a new sheet let me just rename this as profit dashboard all right we'll continue with the previous drill so first of all let's go to the view tab and remove the grid lines now we'll insert a background image like we did for our revenue dashboard so i'll go to insert under illustrations i'll click on pictures and select this device i'm going to have the same background i'll click on insert all right so you can see we have a picture of a company or you can say an organization let's just drag this a bit to the right we'll adjust the size also all right now let's copy the title of my profit dashboard so here you can see i have brought my revenue dashboard and i'll copy 
the title and the logos that we used for the revenue dashboard i'll paste it on my new dashboard let's just align it in the center all right the next step let me now go ahead and edit the title so this is actually going to be excel profit dashboard instead of revenue now we'll copy each of the charts that we just created for example the revenue and profit by items then we had profit by sales channel all this we are going to copy one by one and put it on the profit dashboard so let me just copy a few now i'll paste it here and later on we can make the adjustment we'll copy this as well similarly i'll bring the other three charts on to my sales dashboard okay so here on my profit dashboard i have added all the charts and have aligned and reshaped it so that it looks good i have also made some formatting for example i have reduced the size of the chart title now let me go ahead and show you a few more formatting that we also did for the revenue dashboard first let's remove the white background from all the charts so i'll select the first chart i'll right click and i'll click on format chart area here under fill i'll select no fill next i'm going to remove the grid lines so i'll just delete it let me close this now we also have a outline so i'll go to design actually format and i'll remove the outline next i'm going to add a blue box at the back like how we did for the revenue dashboard so let me select a blue box from here and i'm going to paste it here okay now let me just select the chart and i'll bring this to front and i'll move this to the back next i'm going to change the font color all to white so that it's clearly visible and it's more readable i'll do it for the x axis as well okay so here i have my first chart ready the same i'm going to do for the rest of the charts okay so now you can see here i have formatted all my charts i have also added a blue background you see here i have also formatted the y labels in terms of millions which is actually the profit similarly here i have added the data labels this is for revenue some of the charts also have the data legends so here you can see the blue color represents offline and the red represents online similarly here you have the legends i have also formatted the map as well okay now the next thing is to make this dashboard more interactive so we'll add our slicers as well as timeline first let me show you how to add a timeline so i'll select one of the charts and i'll go to insert under insert i have the option to create a timeline so i'll just click on timelines so timeline is actually based on date columns so since in our data set we only have two date columns one is order date and one is ship date so excel has only shown us two columns so i am going to create my timeline based on order date so i'll select my order date column and i'll click on okay you can see here this is called a timeline i can expand this now this timeline is based on months now and if i scroll this timeline you can see here i have my order year 2010 and i have all the 12 months similarly we have for 2011 then we have for 2012 all the way till 2017 now you can filter this in terms of years quarters months or days let me just select year now so i have years from 2010 till 2017 let me just squeeze this and i'll place it somewhere here on the right 
Now let me go ahead and create a few slicers for my profit dashboard. So I have selected one of the charts. Under insert, I will click on slicer. You can see it gives me the list of columns from which I want to create slicers. So I will create a region. Let me also select country. Let's say I want the representative's name or the customer's name and I'll click on OK. So here I have created three slicers. Let me first resize it and I'll place it on the right. Similarly, I'll place the country column also. Then we have the region slicer. I'll resize this and I'll bring it here. Okay. The next thing we need to do is I have to connect all the slicers and the timeline to the pivot tables for the profit dashboard. So I'm going to click on the multiple select option and go to report connections. Here I'm going to select all the pivot tables that are related to profit. So here I have selected four and I need one more which is pivot table number 10 i click on ok similarly let's create or connect my region filter to all the pivot tables so i right click go to report connections here i'll choose all my pivot tables which are based on profit i'll click on ok let's do it for the country slicer as well I'll click on ok and similarly, I'll connect my timeline as well. I'll go to report connections and I'll select all the pivot tables related to profit. Then I'll click on OK. Let me now go ahead and create another slicer based on sales channel. So I'm selecting one of the pivot charts. I'll go to insert, click on slicer and I'll select sales channel and hit OK. So I have my sales channel slicer. Now let me connect it to all the respective pivot tables that are based on profit. Click on OK. Now let me just bring it here. All right. The next thing I want to show is how are we going to use the timeline first. So you see we have all the years here from 2010 till 2017 now suppose you want to know the profit that was generated in the year 2012 so i'll just click on this range and now you can see our charts only show information for 2012 so this dot represents there was 51 million profit in the year 2012 similarly you can see here the profit by sales channel for 2012 from the map you can see the different countries and the profit each of these countries made in 2012 if i scroll down you can see the revenue and profit by items now if i select another year let's say 2013 i can just drag this to the right and now you can see our profit by year and sales channel for offline and online you can see the map or the line chart for total profit by year so in 2012 it was 51 million and then it went up to 54 million in 2013 similarly our map has also changed now this is a sort of an information that we have you can click on this and check the information that excel has prompted all right so this is how you can use a timeline now as I said, we checked by years, you can also see it for months and quarters as well. Let me just uncheck it. I'll send it back to the place where it was and I'll reduce the size. Okay. Now suppose you want to check the profit made by different representatives. You can select them one by one. Let's say Adam Churchill. This is the 
profit generated by Adam Churchill. Similarly, you can select multiple persons as well. Now suppose you want to see the profit by different countries, so you can use the country slicer. Let me just bring this to the middle and let's expand our chart a bit. Okay, so here you have the profit by different countries chart. I'll just bring this to the front so that you can see it clearly. Okay, now here suppose you want to see the profit generated in let's say United Kingdom. You can select United Kingdom. So this is the map of United Kingdom and it tells you the total profit that was generated in United Kingdom. And below you can see the revenue and profit for all the items that was sold in United Kingdom. So you had beverages, clothes, household, office supplies. So you can see clearly office supplies item made the highest amount of profit in United Kingdom. Now you can also select multiple countries let's say i want to know for france as well so my map will change accordingly so now i have united kingdom and france selected and the other charts present in my dashboard change accordingly now i have my country selected as india you can see the map of india here and these were the respective profit values now one thing to note here is this is actually not millions that should be in k that is thousands so please mark this as thousand and not in millions even for this this is actually k and not million all right so we have successfully created our second dashboard that is on profit let me just resize this a bit and we'll place it where it was earlier cool so we saw how to create different pivot tables in pivot charts and then we formatted our pivot charts based on our requirement we saw how to edit the colors now let me show you one more thing you can also change the look and feel of the dashboard by going to the page layout tab under page layout you have themes so here you can select different themes currently we are with the office theme now let me just select another theme let's say face it you see the colors have changed and it looks really beautiful similarly let me try out another theme let's say organic you see our chart has changed let me just delete this okay so now once you change the theme the text also change a bit you can see the slicers are in a different font let me explore one more theme let's say this time i'm going to choose depth and this is more of a green type of color you can play around and select whatever theme suits the best all right now let me just move back to my revenue dashboard and see how it looks there you go so since we changed our theme even our revenue dashboard is also impacted so this is how it looks now you can always go ahead and play with different themes colors fonts and effects all right so in this demo we saw how to create a revenue dashboard so we created line charts this combo chart pie chart horizontal and vertical bar charts and then we learned how to add slicers and connect it to different pivot tables and we filtered our data to see revenue as well as profit by items by countries by different regions sales channel we learned how to create a map and lots more we will learn some of the important features and functionalities of power query in excel also we'll be doing an extensive hands-on demonstration using various data sets so if you want the data sets and the demo files then please put your email ids in the comment section of the video our team will send you the files over email let's begin 
So what is Excel Power Query? Power Query is an advanced feature of Microsoft Excel that allows you to prepare your data for analysis. You can perform numerous text computations and numerical analysis to make your data more powerful and informative. Excel Power Query is a data preparation and transformation engine. It allows you to carry out the extract, transform and load operations on the datasets from multiple sources. Now, let's look at the challenges solved by Power Query. Earlier, in Excel there was difficulty in data connections. Now, using Power Query, you can connect to a broad range of data sources such as relational databases, web files, text, CSV, JSON files and even fetch data in the cloud. Volume, variety and velocity are the characteristics that define big data. It was a major problem to handle such data. Now Power Query enables you to transform your data to an appropriate size. It also allows you to work on any shape of data from any source. Earlier, updating your data and refreshing it in real time was an issue. Using Power Query, a repeatable process query is adopted to update the data in real time and in the future. In Excel, it was not so easy to reshape, transform and manipulate data. But using Power Query provides a highly interactive experience and sophisticated tools to prepare your data. Now, from Excel 2016 onwards, Power Query on Windows has been fully integrated into Excel. But in Excel 2010 and 2013 for Windows, Power Query is a free add-in. You can go ahead and download the link. Once installed, the Power Query tab will be visible in the Excel ribbon. Now coming to the features of Power Query. So Excel Power Query allows you to clean, transform, manipulate and process your data for analysis. It helps you to automate repetitive tasks that you want to do it over and over again. You can search for data sources and make connections as and when you want. Power Query helps you to prepare and shape the data in the right format for performing analysis. And finally, once your data is ready, you can share your findings or use your query to create interactive reports and dashboards. Now let's have a glance at the demo that we are going to work on in this video. So we'll look at how to load data from different sources. You will understand how to extract tables from web files. So we'll extract tables present on Wikipedia pages. Then you'll learn how to sort and filter data. Up next, you'll see how to group your data, how to split a column into multiple columns, and then pivot and unpivot your table. Then you're going to work on date columns and make some transformations. Understand how to append tables and merge tables vertically and horizontally. Now let's open MS Excel and start with importing a simple text file. So you can see here I have my Excel file opened and in the middle you can see I have my employee TXT file. Now this is a comma separated file meaning that the values are separated by commas as you can see it here. The columns have been separated by commas and all the values have a comma between them. Now this text file has information about the name, age, company and the city to which the employee belongs to. Let's see how easily you can import this EMP text file into MS Excel. Here I'm using Excel 365 or Office 365 where Power Query on Windows has been fully integrated into this version of Excel. So what I'll do is first let's go to the data tab and you have this section called get and transform data so i'll click on get data under get data i'll go to from file and select from text slash csv once i click on it it will ask me to give the location where the file is there so my file is on desktop i'll click on power query files and here you can see i have my employee txt file you can see the type here it says text document click on EMP and hit import now this will take some time to import the file onto Excel it's establishing a connection you can see there you go so here you can see the file name emp.txt you can see the file origin as I said the delimiter is comma and we have the data type detection and here you can see we have our text file so Excel Power Query feature has automatically detected the column names so we have name, age, 
company and city as our columns and these are the values now let's hit load so this will load all the rows and the columns onto excel there you go it was really quick excel has automatically loaded our text file now you can see here we have another tab called queries and connections so we have made one query and have loaded the employee data it gives a preview also you can see it here and if needed later you can go to edit and change some values that we'll see later now you can use this data to create simple visualizations so let me show you how to do it so let's first select the data and we'll go to the insert tab under insert tab I'll click on recommended charts let's say I want to know how many employees belong to a particular city so I'll click on the second chart which says the count of name by city and I'll click on OK here you can see we have a nice clustered bar chart and you can see in Bangalore there were five employees in Hyderabad we had two and in Nasik we had one you can see the count here this is a pivot table if you go back to our actual data here you can see in Bangalore we had Vidya, Sonam, Avinash, Varun and Himani and there were two more people from Hyderabad and one from Nasik so you can use the Excel Power Query feature to import data onto Excel and make some visualizations now if you want to fetch some data that is present on the web or on the internet Excel Power Query features and functionalities can help you import those data as well. We will now see how to import data, specifically a table that is present on the web. Here, I will be using a Wikipedia article on the list of European Cup and UEFA Champions League finals. Let me show you the page first. So this is my Wikipedia page on the list of European Cup and UEFA Champions League finals. If I scroll down, you can see all the details here and I would like to import this table which has the list of all the finals so we have columns like season, winners, scoreline, runners-up, venue and attendance let's import this table onto Excel so I'll copy this URL first now let me open a new sheet I'll go to sheet 1 and then on the data tab under the get data section I'll go to from other sources and here I have from web which allows me to import data from the web either you can follow this path or if you see here there's an option to get data from the web if I click on this it is asking me to enter the URL so I'll paste the URL of the Wikipedia page here and let's click on OK now it's navigating and OK you can see Power Query feature in Excel has given us a list of tables which you can see here we have something called as document there's a key table and here you can see there's one table which was extracted from the Wikipedia page and the table which I am interested in is this table which has the list of European Cup finals you can see it here Excel Power Query feature has automatically detected these rows and it has given a list of columns as well you can see these are the columns now we'll explore the transform data tab present in the Power Query now if I click on transform data it will take me to the Power Query editor let me just click on refresh now this is the most important section now using the Power Query Editor, you can clean your data, filter your data, manipulate your data and make it ready for analysis. Now let's explore a few tabs available here. So we have a Home tab that has a Query section. You can see you can reduce rows, manage columns, sort the data, transform the data, combine different tables. Now there's another tab called Transform which allows you to select your data type, transpose your rows and columns, pivot and unpivot your columns and here you can see 
you can find out some summary statistics and you can manage your date values as well now if you want to add some new columns to your data you can do that as well and you also have a view tab now here if you see the first two rows the values are the same you can see season season these are all repeated which we actually don't need and these are pretty similar to our column names similarly if I scroll down you see there are some rows which have null values so actually these rows do not add up any value or do not add any value to our data so we'll clean this data first so let's see how to do it now if you want to remove certain rows in the table what you can do is go to the home tab and under reduce rows click on remove rows and then choose remove top rows if I select remove top rows it will ask me how many rows do you want to remove from the top you can see it here I'll give I want to remove the top two rows now let's click on OK you will see that the Excel Power Query editor has removed the first two rows and on the right you can see the steps that were applied you can see it here previously we had these two rows which were redundant and once we applied the step it has removed the first two rows similarly let's go down and remove the last one two three four five so we are going to remove the last seven rows from the table so again I'll go to reduce rows and click on remove rows now this time I'll select remove bottom rows and here I'll choose I want to delete seven rows from the table from the bottom I click on OK if you see the last seven rows have been deleted now let me show you the last row which is this one so the last season of UEFA Champions League was held in 2020 which is this year and Bayern Munich won the Champions League against a French team that was Paris Saint Germans by a score of 1-0 now if you see the last value that is the attendance you can see the value is 0 which means there were no spectators in the stadium it was because of the COVID conditions now let's do some more manipulation to our data suppose this time I want to add a new column let's say a stadium name by extracting values from the venue column so let me just show you the venue column so this is our venue column so the first value is the stadium name then we have the city in which the stadium is there and finally we have the country name so I want to extract only the stadium name so you can see we have some stadiums like Santiago Bernabeu there's Wembley, San Siro and other stadiums so I want to extract only the stadium names so let's see how to do that I'll click on the venue column and go to add column tab under add column here you can see we have extract if I click on this drop down there is an option to select text before delimiter so if I choose text before delimiter here I'll give my delimiter as comma so everything before the first comma will be considered as the stadium name now let me click on OK now here you can see under applied steps it says inserted text before delimiter if I scroll to the right you can see the last column has our stadium names let me double click on this and change this to stadium name column and hit enter even this step is applied here you can see renamed columns similarly let's explore a few more features now I want to add a new column called stadium city so if you consider this venue column 
whatever is there between the two commas is the stadium city so for example santiago bernabeu is in madrid similarly wembley stadium is in london san siro is in milan so these medial values i want to extract into a new column called as stadium city so let's see how to do it so i'll click on the venue column and go to extract and again i'll select the extract tab and here now i'll choose text between delimiters and my first delimiter i'll give is a comma and a space you can see here all the values have a comma and a space and my end delimiter will be another comma then i'll click on okay this will add a new column to the extreme right of the table you can see here we have text between delimiters and it has extracted the stadium city let me go ahead and rename this column as stadium city and hit enter you can see the applied step here now i want to split the score column into two columns so here we have the score column and the left value presents the number of goals that were scored by the winning team and the right value presents the number of goals that were scored by the losing team so here i'll split the column into two columns as winner score and loser score so what i'll do is select this column and go to the home tab under the home tab we have split column i'll select split column and then choose by delimiter so automatically excel power query detects that this dash is my delimiter and i'll split at each occurrence of the delimiter let's click on okay now you can see the score column has been split into two it has renamed the column as score dot 1 and score dot 2 what i'll do is i'll go ahead and we'll rename this column as winner score and this will rename it to loser score i'll hit enter and i have renamed it successfully next let's change the winners team and the runners up team values to upper case so suppose i want to change all the values or the club names of the winners team to upper case so what i can do is i'll select this column and go to the transform tab under transform tab i have this option called format so here i'll click on format and then you can see i can change the case to lower case upper case capitalize each word so here i want to make all the winner teams as upper case i'll select upper case there you go we have successfully converted all the winner team names to upper case similarly let's do it for the runner sub team as well so here i have my runner sub team i'll go to the transform tab click on format and select upper case now we saw how to do some simple manipulation of our data so we created a few columns split a few columns now to save all this i have to go to the home tab and then click on close and load this will take some time and load our data onto this excel sheet you can see here it's loading the data this will take a bit of time there you go excel power query feature has successfully perform some manipulations on our data some calculations on our data and then it has saved the final version and loaded it on to excel now using this clean data we can do some analysis let's say i want to find the seasons in which the winners team scored more than 3 goals so we have a problem statement at hand where we want to find the seasons in which the winner team had more than 3 goals scored so what you can do is select any cell in this data and go to the insert tab 
and click on pivot table here I'll click on existing worksheet and then I'll give my location I'll place my pivot table somewhere here and click on OK alright now since I want to know the seasons I'll drag season on to row and I'll also drag the winners team column on to rows then I'll choose my winner score under values here you can see we have the pivot table ready now we need to filter this table to see all the winning teams that scored more than three goals so what I'll do is I'll select this winner score column and place it under filters and here you can see I have my filter let me click on this drop down and I'll select multiple items from this multiple items I'll choose 4 5 and 7 because these values are greater than 3 and click on OK here you can see I have filtered my pivot table and to the left you can see the season and the winner team that had scored more than three goals in the finals alright similarly you can perform some more analysis suppose I want to know how many times Real Madrid won the championship so let's see I'll click on one cell in the data set go to the insert tab and click on pivot table I'll choose existing worksheet and give my location here let's say I want to place my pivot table here I click on OK alright so the question we have is how many times have Real Madrid won the championship so I'll choose the winners team column and place it under rows and let's say we'll select the winner score as well and let's convert this winner score from sum to let's say count and click on OK and since I want to check only for Real Madrid so what I'll do is I'll go to the insert tab and I'll insert a slicer here I'll choose winner teams as my slicer and click on OK and out of this I want to choose only Real Madrid so I'll select Real Madrid you can see it here Real Madrid have won the championship 13 times okay let's say you want to compress your data and remove unnecessary columns without losing any information you can do that using a feature in the Power Query editor called unpivot to perform this task we'll use a census data of India from Wikipedia so let me first show you the Wikipedia page so this is my Wikipedia article which says list of states in India by past population and if I scroll down you can see it here there's a table which says by past population from 1947 to 2011 so there are a few columns like rank this state or union territory and we have population starting from 1951 till 2011 which was our last census here you can see if I scroll further there are nearly 29 states and we have seven union territories so we will extract this table and load into Excel first okay so let me click on a new sheet and we'll follow the same drill I'll go to my data tab and click on get data under get data I'll go to from other sources and click on from web here it will ask me to provide the URL link of the Wikipedia page so I'll paste the URL here and click on OK now once I have done that it will load a few tables onto Excel you can see there are a few tables here I'll click on the first one so we have our table here now let's do some transformation to this data this opens in the Power Query editor okay I'll click on refresh first so it'll take some time to refresh the entire data okay we are done now if you see this data clearly the first row in this table is not necessary at all because these are our column names so we also have our column headers already present so let's go ahead and delete the first row so we'll go to the home tab 
under remove rows i will click on remove top rows now i'll give my number of rows as 1 so we want to remove the first row only i'll click on okay you can see the first row has been deleted if i scroll further i actually don't need the last row as well which is the total so what we can do is we can also remove the last row from the bottom so i'll select one click on ok you can see the step has been applied and you don't see the last row that was the total row anymore so the task that i want to do here is i want to compress all these columns which are basically the population columns so i'll select my state or union territory column and go to the transform tab and here i have the option to unpivot columns so i'll click on this drop down and select unpivot other columns you can see here the step has been applied and all the population column from 1951 till 2011 have been unpivoted if you want you can go ahead and rename these columns let's say i'll write it as population column and let's say this is i'll rename it to total population value all right now we are done with our preparation of data let's go to the home tab and click on close and load now this will take some time to load the data onto excel all right so we have our census data here so first you can see rank 1 is Uttar Pradesh and we have the population starting from 1951 till 2011 then we have for Maharashtra if I scroll down you can see the other states we have Tamil Nadu Rajasthan this Karnataka if I scroll further we have Odisha this Telangana Kerala now if you see here the population values from 1951 till 2011 for the Telangana state are all NA which means there was no data available now this is because Telangana was only formed in 2014 so there was no census for this state let's continue with our demo and let's explore a few more features and functionalities of Power Query Editor now the next table we are going to use is an AdventureWorks customer table now this data set is provided by Microsoft for practitioners who want to learn Power BI, Excel or similar technologies and want to do some manipulation, some calculation, some data analysis stuff. So let me go to a new sheet and let's import the AdventureWorks customer data set. It's a CSV file onto Excel first. So I'll go to my data tab and click on get data. From here I'll go to from file and choose from text slash CSV you can see it here in my Power Query files folder I have my AdventureWorks customer table I'll select this and click on import this will take some time to load the data set you can see the preview of the data set here so we have columns like the customer key we have the prefix of the customer name the first name the last name of the customer date of birth, marital status, if I go to the right we have annual income, total children, education level, occupation and homeowner column as well. So let's click on transform data. Here we'll learn a few more features of Power Query. Okay we have our data on our Power Query editor. So first what I'll show you is let's change the prefix column the first name column and the last name column to proper case so you can see it here the prefix first name and last name columns are all in upper case now if you want to change the values to proper case just hit control and select the three columns and go to the transform tab under transform tab you have format so if you click on format here you can see we have lowercase uppercase now proper case is to capitalize each word so I'll click on capitalize each word 
you can see it here now we have converted the prefix first name and last name column into prop case the next step i'm going to show you is let's merge all the three columns the prefix column the first name column and the last name column into one full name column so what i'll do is i'll select the three columns and then let's go to add column and under add column we have this option called merge columns let's hit merge columns okay now it's asking you to give the separator i'll select my separator as a space and click on okay okay so before click on okay i want to change my new column name from merged to let's say full name and now let's click on okay you can see here it says inserted merged column and if i go to my right you can see it here we have a full name column now if you want to shift the location of the full name column you can do that as well just hold this and keep on dragging to the left this will move the entire table to the right and you can place it wherever you want so i want to place it let's say here okay now actually i don't want all these columns so let's delete it so I'll click on this and i'll right click and click on remove you can see we have removed the prefix column similarly let's remove the other two columns you can either right click and do or go to the home tab and then select remove columns all right now let's say we want to add a domain name column from aws customers by extracting the characters between at the rate and dot com so actually i'm talking about the email address from this email address we want to create a new column called as domain name for that we'll extract characters that are present between at the rate and dot com so let's see how to do it i'll select the email address column and then i'll go to add column under add column i'll click on extract and this time we want to extract between two delimiters i'll so i'll select text between delimiters and i'll give my starting delimiter as at the rate and my end delimiter would be dot com now let's click on okay so this will insert a new column to the extreme right you can see we have our domain name let's go ahead and change the column name to domain name and hit enter all right you can see the step has been applied now we are done with our preparation of customers table let's just go to the home tab and click on close and load so all the transformation that we did in the power query editor will reflect here so you can see we have our full name column and if you see we have our domain name as well okay now using the power query editor you can perform some statistical analysis now let's explore those statistical features for this we'll be using another data set called adventure box product data set again this data set is also provided by microsoft so let's go to the new sheet and here I'll go to the data tab click on get data under from files I click on text slash CSV here you can see we have adventure works products I click on import let's click on transform data so we have our data loaded on to the power query editor the data is mostly clean so let's not alter this data let's straight away go ahead and explore some of the statistical features that we have here now let's say if you want to find the total number of product names in the product table we have this product name column and say if you want to find the total number of product names in the table 
how to do it. So what you can do is click on this product name column then go to the transform tab. Now in the transform tab you have an option called statistics. Click on this drop down and select count values. Now this will open another window that will return the total number of products in the table. You can see the value here it says 293. Now to move back to the query editor we have to cancel this step here. So let's just click cancel or close. You're back again. All right. Now let's say you want to calculate the average product price from the product table. So if I move to the right you have a column called product price. So let's see what is the average product price from the product table. So I'll select this product price column, go to the transform tab, under statistics, I'll select average. So this will give me the average product price which is 714.4373. You can consider any unit you want. Let's say this is in dollars. Now again, we have to cancel this step to move back. Okay. Now, if you want to find the maximum and minimum product price, you can do that as well. So, let me select my column product price and go to the transform tab. Under the transform tab, we'll click on this statistic drop down and let's say I'll select minimum. So, this will give me the minimum product price which is 2.29. Similarly, if you want to find the maximum product price, so select this product price column, go to the transform tab and then choose maximum. So this is the maximum product price in the product table we have. Let's cancel this step. Okay. Now you can also round the product cost and product price column to two decimal places. So if I show you both the columns, you have your product cost and you have the product price column. You can see the floating values or the decimal points are not constant, it's varying. So let's limit it to two decimal places. What you can do is select both the columns and then go to the transform tab. In the transform tab you have here rounding. I click on this drop down and select round. Now here I'll give my decimal places as two. If I click on OK you can see here both the columns the product cost and the product price column have been rounded up to two decimal places. I can scroll down you can see all the values have been rounded up to two decimal places. Alright. Now let's say you want to add a column called discount price column by multiplying 0.9 to the product price column. And let's say you also want to round that new column to two decimal places. So how to do it? So we want to give a discount of 10%. So I'll select this product price column, go to add column, and then I'll choose custom column. Here we'll write a formula. So I'll give my new column name as discount price. And my formula would be, I'll select product price, I'll click on insert and then I'll multiply this product price by 0 0.9. So this will give me my 10% discount on the product price and click on OK. You see here, we have our new column added which is discount price. So if the product price is 34.99. If you give a 10% discount, it's 31.491. Alright. Now the next question was to change the or round the decimal places to 2. So I'll go to the transform tab under rounding. I'll click on round. Let's say I'll give 2 and click on OK. So even this has rounded the discount price column to 2 decimal places. Now we are done with our mathematical operation on this product data set. So we saw how to find sum, average, count, how to round up values, how to add a new custom column. So let's go ahead and close it and load it onto Excel. 
you see here we have our new product table added here and the last column if you see it's the discount column that we added okay now it's time for us to explore another feature so we'll use a table called AdventureWorks calendar table which has basically a date column and let's see how using power query you can prepare that data as well and make some manipulations some calculations so let me go ahead and import AdventureWorks calendars table again this data set is provided by Microsoft so I'll go to my new sheet and I'll go to the data tab click on get data and from here I'll click on from text slash CSV and you can see I have my calendar table here I click on import now this will open in the query editor you see here this data set has only one column which is a date column so let's click on transform data okay now if you see here the first row is actually the column name so let's do the transformation here let's push this as the column name so I'll go to the home tab and under home tab you have this option called use first row as headers I'll select this you see here we have the column name as date now before making any operation let's see if all the fields are available you see here if I click on the date drop down year month quarter weekday day everything has been shaded out and I can't access this the reason is the date settings are not correct so we'll change the regional settings let me show you how to do it so we'll go to file and I'll select options and settings and go to query options under query options we have something called as regional settings here under regional settings we will select English United States instead of English India so I'll just scroll down and here we have English United States and I click on OK now once this is done I'll go to my data type and I'll select date as my data type I'll choose replace current OK now you can see my date column has been formatted if I go to the date tab you can see I have access to all this now let's do some operations on this date column let's say you want to find the earliest and the latest date from AW calendars table or the adventure box calendar table so what you can do is select this column go to date drop down under transform and here we have the option of earliest and latest so if I click on earliest this will show you the last date which was 1st of January 2015 let me close this similarly you can see the most recent date I'll go to the date drop down and click on latest and you have 30 June 2017 as the latest date I'll close this now let's add a new column say day name start of the week and others so I'll select my date column go to add column here under add column I have my option to select the day name the week name and others so I'll click on this date drop down and under day let's say I want to choose name of day this returns the day name similarly let's say I'll want to find out the start of the week you can see we have the start of the week column or start of week column now one thing to notice here is in this power query editor the week starts on a Sunday now suppose you want to start your week on a Monday you can do some transformations on this formula tab so here in the formula bar you can add a one here to make sure your week starts on a Monday so if I hit enter you will see all these 
values will change you can see it's 28 4 and 11 this will become 29 5 and 12 let's hit enter you can see it here your start of the week is on a Monday now there's another method to make sure your week starts on a Monday let's cancel this step okay I have to insert it once again so I'll go to date and here I'll choose start of week now the week starts on a Sunday so one more method is to add day dot Monday you can see automatically power query is giving me a suggestion so I'll hit tab to finish it and I'll hit enter now you can see the values have changed and our week starts on a Monday now let's say we want to add a few more columns like start of month name of month start of year and the year value so you can just click on the date column or select the date column go to the transform tab okay not the transform tab let's go to the add column tab and here let's say I'll choose year so we have all the year values and similarly let's say I want to know the start of the year now you can do a few more transformations let's say I want to know the month now here it gives us one which means January that's February March and so on and so forth let's say we'll do one more I click on this go to my date drop down and here I'll choose let's say I want to know the day of year all right now we are done with all our transformation and preparing our data on a date field so let me just go to the home tab I'll click on close and load now this will load the data set onto Excel you can see it here we have the data ready now you can use this data to make some analysis draw a pivot table draw a pivot chart and do a whole lot of things now while working on a project it is possible that not all your data will be in a single file it could be stored in multiple files so it's important to combine and bring all your data together now we will see how to join your data vertically I have my data present in a CSV folder so let me show you the folder first so this is my CSV folder let me open it and I have some files these are named as project 1 2 3 4 and 5 let me open just one of the project files it has a very small quantity of data you can see it has a month column and an amount column let me close this and let me show it to you again let's open project 4 all the files have the same number of columns you can see this also has a month column and an amount column now we'll combine all this data together and load it into Excel let's see how to do it so I'll open a new sheet and I'll go to my data tab and click on get data then I'll go to from file and this time I'll choose from folder now this will ask me to give the folder location or the path location where my CSV files are so I'll choose browse and here you can see I have my CSV file I'll just double click on it and click on open now it has selected my file path or the folder path then I'll click on OK you can see these are the files you have project1.xls project2.xls and so on I'll click on this combine drop down and I'll hit combine and transform now this will give you the preview of one of the data files you will see it now you can see it here it says sheet 1 ok now it's processing all the data files present in that CSV folder and this will be uploaded onto our Power Query Editor now you can see here on the Power Query Editor all my data files have been 
combined vertically here you can see the month column on the extreme right it's the amount column and to the extreme left we have the source name or the source file where the data came from so first is project 1 then we have project 2 if i scroll down we have project 3 files project 4 and similarly we have project 5 now this is one way in which you can merge your tables vertically so we are done with it let's just go to the home tab and click on close and load all the transformations that were applied you can see it here we have our final table and we have successfully combined five excel files again you can also join your data horizontally this would be like an sql join where the data is present in multiple files or sheets based on a common key column you can join the tables so you can perform a left join a right join an inner join based on the problem that you are trying to solve so let's merge two tables based on a column i'll show the data set first it's an excel file which has three worksheets so here is my excel file which we'll be using to merge our data horizontally you can see there are three worksheets the first one is year 11 which has data regarding the student name the gender of the student and the course the student had opted for similarly we have another for 2012 or year 12 we have the student name gender as well as the course and finally we have a courses table or a courses sheet which has all the details regarding the course so we have the course name the teacher who teaches or teacher who taught that course we have the lesson type the number of credits and the assignment type now we'll use this data sets to load it onto excel using power query so i am on my excel sheet let's just open a new sheet i'll go to the data tab and here i'll click on get data and this time i'll choose from excel workbook and i'll select my file which is students and courses i click on import so we'll just see how to import two tables and join them horizontally so let me first select the courses sheet and i'll click on transform data now this has loaded the courses table onto power query editor the table looks fine we have the course column teacher everything is fine now let's load one more table and then we'll merge it so here under the home tab you have a section called new source i'll click on file i'll again select my students and courses and click on import and this time let's choose another table let's say year 11 which has the column name as student gender and course i click on ok now it has successfully loaded this table onto power query editor now if you say this the first row is actually our column names so i'll go to the home tab and select use first row as headers so this will push the first row to the column names you can see we have done it successfully we have my student name the gender column and the course column now let's merge it so if you see here in the home tab we have a section called merge queries let's click on this drop down and select merge queries here i have my table which is year 11 and let's choose one more table that is courses now the kind of join i'll choose as left outer join which means it will take all the rows from the first table and matching records from the second table here i need to select the common key column so if you see both the tables we have the course column as the common key column so i'll select this and now you can see there's a tick mark which means it has selected the rows and the column successfully you can see it says the selection matches 175 or 175 rows from the first table and let's click on ok 
let's just expand this and click on ok if i scroll to the right you can see i have successfully merged both the tables now if you want you can remove unnecessary rows or columns suppose if you see i have the course column from the year 11 table and here also i have the course column now this is redundant let's just remove one of the columns i'll just select this column i'll go to remove columns and i'll select remove columns okay the rest looks fine we have successfully merged both the tables by using a left outer join let's just click close and load now this will take some time to load our data onto excel you can see it here we have successfully loaded it onto excel now we are done with our demo part now let's just see what all we have done in our demo so i'll go to my first sheet here you can see we had imported a simple text file first and then we plotted a graph which is a pivot chart then you saw how to upload a file from the web so here we imported a uefa champions league table which was present on wikipedia and then we plotted some graphs and charts you can see we made some analysis using pivot tables and then we imported another web file which was based on a population data and we used the unpivot option or the unpivot feature in the power query to reduce the number of columns then we made some calculations to our customer table which was from adventure works then we used another table called the products table here we saw some statistical calculations and we added a column called discount price where we used conditional operations and then you saw how we manipulated a date column and then we saw how to append and merge multiple tables so on my screen you can see an example excel budget template theme so on my screen you can see a column where you have the debit amount so in the i column we have all the debit amount what we are spending for a month and on the right column will be the balance amount or the running balance of that for example you can see that there is a row number five where the debit amount is eight thousand for a jeans levi's and it is done through upi payment now if i change this value of eight thousand to four thousand something then you can see that the running balance will automatically change you can see that currently the running balance is 73,000 and if I change this value from 8,000 to 4,000 then all the debit amount in January and what is the running balance that is the total available balance after 1 lakh has been debited into the account in the month of February as February income. Now the current available balance is 1 lakh 13,200 and the total expense in February is 1 lakh 4,500 right. How am I doing all this? looks so much interesting right now let's do this practically so for that i have already created a new sheet and i have included all the data that we have used previously the income of that particular month and all the expenses of that particular month now without further ado let's begin to implement the excel budget template now our first step happens to be converting all the data into a natural table so you know that in excel all the data values are stored in the form of a database by default so it happens to be our duty to convert the database type table into the pure table type table so for that select all your data and press ctrl t and there you go you have an option to convert this data into a table and remember to check this particular checkbox and tell your excel that your table has headers so we do have headers here so now press ok and your table will be converted into a natural table now let's type in the formulas so now let's select the cell j2 and type in the formula so what are we doing here is 
we are trying to add the sum of j2 plus h3 so which is this particular cell and removing i3 that is this particular debit amount so this formula is used for checking the running balance let's press enter and there you go so it means that you received 1 lakh rupees in the month of january and out of that 1 lakh you spent 15000 rupees for something maybe your educational loan or something and then the remaining running balance out of 1 lakh rupees is 85000 rupees now let's copy the same formula to all the cells and there you go now the running balance has been calculated for all the cells here now remember the monthly income available balance and debit for january and final balance now let's try to calculate that for all the three months so here we have three months that is january february and march now let's do a simple calculation to find out the available balance of that month and the total debit made by that person in that particular month the formula is really simple all you have to do is use a sum function and calculate the sum of all these values and done right there you go so the total expense of the month january is 93800 rupees now let's calculate the total debit of february month same formula that is calculating the sum of all the expenses made in the month of february Day. Now let's also calculate the sum of all the expenses in the month of March. Done. So we have the final values of all the total expenses made in those particular months. Now let's calculate the final balance. Now I think I forgot one important thing. So before we calculate the final balance, we need to find out the available balance that is the available balance after 1 lakh rupees is credited into our account and along with the savings that you have from your previous month right for that we have a simple formula now which all we are doing is just adding the uh, income cell with the balance cell that's all there you go now after crediting 1 lakh rupees and adding up the uh, balance of that particular month that is we have 13,200 remaining from the month of January and the month of February we have income of 1 lakh so the total amount is 11,300 and no 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 it is 1 lakh 13,200 yeah now we have the final balance that is the difference between the available balance and the debit made in that particular month so in the month of february we had a total balance of 1,13,200 and the total debit of 1,4,500 so the final remaining balance is 8,700 similarly the same formula has been applied for the month of march and the final balance we have is 37,300 so that's how you implement budget template in excel all simple formulas and you have all the numbers at your fingertips so here i'll be discussing some important questions that you will come across when you face interview for excel and uh, we will start with the basics the beginner level and uh, most of them will be discussed here will be the beginner level at the beginning and then we'll discuss it for at the further level okay so if the first question that you might get asked is what is a cell address in excel so a cell address is a combination of column, letter and a row number that identifies a cell on a worksheet. Basically each cell will have an associated column number, column letter and a row number. So you have to keep in mind it will be always be a column letter and a row number. Each excel sheet will have, suppose for instance if you take row 5 
rows will be in numbers and the columns will be in letters column a column b column c column d and so on and the numbers will be for the rows so for instance if you take this particular uh, cell the cell address is d5 row column d and row 5 so this is the cell address now let's move on to the next one now you will be asked what is relative cell referencing and absolute cell referencing in excel so relative cell referencing is usually the relative references change when a formula is copied to another cell depending on the destinations row and column okay so this is called relative cell referencing absolute cell referencing irrespective of the cell you know you don't have to depend on the value of the cell destination there is no change when a formula is copied so this we i'll explain it in the uh, next slide the basic difference is this type of referencing is there by default in excel relative cell referencing you just insert the formula you don't need to put a do dollar sign in the formula whereas absolute cell referencing if you don't want to change in the formula when it's copied across cell then absolute cell referencing requires you to add a dollar sign before and after the column and row address so see for instance this is relative referencing you know if you see this this particular cell is having a we put the value as a3 into b3 so what it will do is it will multiply a3 and b3 and it will give the product this is relative cell reference whereas absolute cell referencing is again the same thing but you have to put a dollar sign before the column and the row number so here you are uh, specifying this as a3 into b2 okay a3 into b2 and it will give you this particular answer irrespective of that it will give you it will calculate what is there in this and it will give you the answer okay now we next move on to the next point is basic question when you go scroll across an excel sheet sometimes you have a header on the first row and if you scroll down you will not be able to see the first row so there is a process uh, or the there is a trick to freeze the panes in the excel so you just need to have the rows locked so how do you freeze paint this is the question so what you need to do is you need to select the view tab go to the view tab and go to freeze paints it's a basic thing and you will see this if you see here select the third row and click freeze paints so you just select this and click freeze paints okay so you're going here and you're going to the third row and you are going to view tab and you are selecting free spin. So what happens is first two rows will be locked. Okay. These two rows will be locked. Similarly, for uh, if you want to freeze the columns. Okay. It's the same thing. I am going to select this particular column and then click on view and then click free spin. So what happens is the first two columns are locked A and B will be locked and if I scroll right you will always see the uh, customer name and category column. So these two we have locked and the next will be scrolled. So this is the function of freezing panes. Okay. Now coming on to the next one and you will be asked and you have an excel sheet or a spreadsheet and you want to restrict you want to protect the data for from anyone or from someone cop from copying the cell for your worksheet so how do you do that you need to select that particular data that you want to protect and then click control shift f and then you will see the protection tab okay you just need to go to the protection tab and select lock okay and you will be asked to put a password wherein you will be getting the review tab where you, you, you need to select the sheet put a password and just save it so i will show you across one of the examples here 
so this is particular uh, data that you have and you need to protect you select it so here as i said i selected it and then i just press Control shift f so here you see the protection tab click the protection tab and then click select and then uh, lock and then click ok and then you need to go to the review tab and then click on the protect sheet and you are having the you need to select this protect worksheet and contents of locked cells so you are selecting these and you are protecting the content and you just need to uh, put some password okay and then click okay okay so this is how you protect the data on a worksheet and you are selecting this area control shift f and just put up a password and select lock sheet so this is how you protect the sheet from anyone to copy it the content now the next question that you might be asked is what is the difference between a function and a formula in excel so you will be asked this question and you need to remember this formula is like an equation which is typed in by the user you are typing it suppose a1 plus b2 you are typing this formula in one particular cell okay whereas function functions are predefined calculations it is like a formula which is already there in excel and you can use it so as it says here it uh, consumes more time and it has to be typed in manually you this is as per the need basis and this is particularly it's very quick and very efficient you have inbuilt formulas in excel the sum and multiplication product and various other things that you will come across so this is the basic difference between a formula and a function in excel okay the now the next question that you might be asked is uh, or you need to know basically is uh, the order of operations used in excel while evaluating the formulas so what is the order you need to remember this acronym pedmas p e d m a s or in other simple terms you can use this also please excuse my dear and sally so these are the acronyms p e d m a s now let's see what happens first and you uh, in math when you do some calculations you have order of operations okay board mass is the one of the order of operations now in excel similarly in excel when you put up a formula you excel will calculate it in a particular order and this is called the order of operations and the order of operations is first it will calculate what is there in the parenthesis it will perform this function and then it will see if there are any exponents in it and if it is there it will do that calculation the next and after that it will see if there is any multiplication or division so p e d and then it will see if there is any addition okay and then the last one will be the subtraction so excel knows this and you have to know this so that when you put up a formula you will know what is going to happen first and you will not mess up with your formula okay this is the order of operations it is one of the important questions in the interview for a beginner excel level now the next one is uh, how will you write the formula for following multiply the value in a cell a1 by 10 and add the result by 5 and divide it by 2 it is quite simple okay so i'm just giving it an example in this slide and you might be asked something else so you will be given a task to calculate or put up a formula for this so when you are asked multiply the value in a cell by of a1 by 10 so this is particularly thing okay a1 is the particular uh, cell that is being given and you are multiplying it okay you put it in parenthesis and then add the result by 5 so it will calculate the parenthesis first okay and if it sees if there are any exponents you have to think in that way if there are any exponents in it or not and then first it will see the parenthesis and then exponent there are no exponents here and then it will do the multiplication and then the addition and the division okay so you will get this particular answer and if you put it simply in this way your answer is wrong because it will multiply it into 10 add 
5 and divide by 2. So you have to check which one is right and you have to make sure that you are putting the right parenthesis. Okay. So this is the formula for it. Okay. The next question is uh, there is a difference. What is the difference between count, counter and count blank? These are three particular important things that you need to. These are similar, but they are quite different when you actually see it. Okay. So first we will see what is count. Count is basically it counts the number of cells which have numeric values. As the name suggests, it is count. It will count the number of cells which has numeric values. Okay. If you see per this uh, column and uh, we are at A11, we are putting it as uh, count equals to A10 to a2 to A10. So you're taking this range and you're finding out what are the number of cells which have numeric value. If you see this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 5 cells have numeric value. It counts the cells which has numeric value. And the next thing is the counter. Okay. What counter does? It counts the number of cells which has any form of content. It can be anything. It can be a number. It can be a alphabet it can be anything it will see what are the uh, number of cells which has any form of content okay for example this is the same example we here taken here and we have put the function as counter a2 to a10 now see 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 so it sees that there is uh, seven cells have some content in it it is numbers and letters it can be anything but it has some content so counter is the function for this now the next one is count blank okay as the name suggests it will count the number of blank cells only so again the same examples count blank a2 to a10 okay it will see what are the number of blanks okay if you see this is blank and this is blank so two cells are blank so it will count the number of blank cells only okay now the next one is uh, what is the shortcut to add a filter to a table why do we use filter and it is one of the basics uh, function in the excel where you need to do some sorting and it can be done by using a filter what is the shortcut key it's very simple control shift and l this is the key that is used to put up a filter you just press this control shift l all together and you will find the filter and you can sorted now the next question that you will come across is uh, how do you create a hyperlink in excel so it's quite simple there is a simple shortcut control k you press these two together and you will get the option you will select the it will select the cell where you have to insert the hyperlink hyperlink basically it redirects to any other document it can be a web page it can be a word document it can be another excel sheet or so on okay so these are the things okay now another important question uh, that is uh, how to merge multiple cells text strings in a cell so how do we merge the text strings in multiple cells into one cell there is one particular uh, simple function that you can use which is called called as concatenate concatenate function is used to merge text strings present in multiple cells okay and uh, it's a very simple thing you just need to put this equals to concatenate and then if you if, for example this is the formula concatenate text 1 text 2 text b or this is uh, concatenate a1 comma b1 comma c1 this is the data in our uh, three cells excel is one in a1 b1 and c1 so now if you want to put them all in one and you can merge it in one cell using the concatenate function and it's very simple concatenate and parenthesis a1 comma b1 comma c1 okay and you will get it all merged in one particular cell okay so this is how you use the concatenate function and you can also use the and operator to combine cell values it is the same thing you can use the and operator instead of commas okay and i will show it to you in the example here okay now we have this i'll just copy this thing to yeah okay 
and let's make it simple and now i want to put this here equals con concatenate and a1 comma b1 comma c i just close it and i put enter so you see this this all the the different text is merged in one particular cell and it will you can perform various merge functions using the concatenate function it's a very simple thing and it is a frequently asked questions in the interview okay the next question uh, it is very a very important one again and a very basic as well so how can you split a column into two or more columns you have some particular uh, text or a sentence written or data written in your uh, cell or a column and you want to put them across in two or more or many number of columns so how do you perform this function it's very simple again you need to select that particular cell so for instance we have it here is india is a democratic country india space is space a space democratic space country so the it's a different text here and you want to split this particular sentence into different columns okay you need to select that cell and then go to the data tab and then choose text to columns there will be an option wherein you need to select text to columns okay and you will see this screen okay and you need to select the choose the delimiter here and what we are specifying here is uh, first it is uh, said a delimiter and then we are selecting a delimiter as space because we see that it is space here which is very common and we want to split it so you will see a preview here which shows what your output will be like india in one column is a democratic country so the delimiter is space here and t you need to select this and then click next okay so you will see the options select the columns data format and choose the destination now you see the data preview and you need to select the destination where you want to put this output as so you select that and then click finish and this one what it does it it's it splits the text into multiple columns okay so you see this you have selected this as the output and it starts here india is a democratic country so uh, you will come across some data which is uh, you know huge and uh, there are spaces or obliques or anything that is uh, differentiated it with and you need to put them in different rows or different columns so this is the function uh, that you need to use to split the text into different or multiple columns okay okay the next uh, question can be a very simple one or most widely used in fact and what is the use of VLOOKUP and how do we use it? So, what is this particular thing in Excel? VLOOKUP function is used for looking up a piece of information in a table and extracting some corresponding data or information. So, you have some set of values in one particular column and you want to retrieve or extract the data corresponding to that particular column or a cell in the whole sheet okay so the syntax is something like this it is you need to go to one particular uh, cell where you want the output as and you type the function v lookup and you are selecting the value where is the cell exactly where you want the output to be and you are selecting the table here and the you are specifying the column index and range lookup so value this indicates the value that you have to look for in the first column of a table okay and then the table table basically this refers to the table from which you have to retrieve a value we will show this in the example in the next slide and the column index column index it provides the column in the table from which we are to retrieve a value okay you will specify the column index which one you are looking for the next thing is range lookup which is optional true with uh, if you put true it is approximate match which is default and false if it is exact match if you are looking for the exact match so what is the use of vlookup and how do we 
do it okay so find the product related to a customer name richard okay you have this sheet and in this one you want to see what richard has bought okay what is the product that he has bought and you can do this with the vlookup function okay so you just go here and you type in the function vlookup you are naming it as richard and uh, first thing is the value it is h4 okay and then the next thing is the table okay table is a2 this this is the table okay and you're looking for customer name richard okay and then you are selecting this the whole column index which is e15 that means you are selecting this whole table then 15 okay e15 you are selecting this and then the next thing is optional which is giving you the uh, range lookup okay what it does is it's optional it is you are looking for an exact value or an approximate by default it is approximate map so how it performs the function okay so it gives you the answer as camera it goes and lookups for richard in this particular it will give you the output here and the a2 is the table that it will look for the customer name and it will search for richard and then it will give you the output as camera now the next thing will be we look up different from lookup function how different they are VLOOKUP lets the user look for a value in the leftmost column of a table. So as we've seen in the example, it uh, allows you to look for a data in the leftmost column of the table and returns the value in a left to right way. Okay, it sorts in left to right way. Well, lookup function lets the user look for data in a row column and returns the value in the another row or column. It will give you the lookup function in the next row column. Okay not very easy to use as compared to the lookup function okay as we see uh, it's a bit complicated when you compare it to the lookup function it's quite simple and it is used to replace the vlookup function okay so this is the different lookup and vlookup function now uh, excel is basically used for reporting mainly used for reporting to management you have to extract different kinds of uh, reports and what are the report formats that are available in excel this is one of the uh, important questions again uh, for a beginner level and there are three formats basically compact form outline form tabular form okay these are the three formats uh, that are available report formats that are available in excel okay the next question is about a function which is how does if function work in excel okay the if function in excel it actually performs a logical test and you will give a condition it performs the test and returns a value if the test evaluates to true and another value which you again will specify if the test result is false okay for instance we have here a simple example which is shown in the slide and what we are doing here is uh, written record is valid if age is greater than 20 we have age here specified and salary is greater than 40,000 else return the record is invalid so we are giving two conditions and it actually checks and evaluates whether these conditions are met and it will give you an output whether record is valid or invalid based on the two conditions that are specified okay and f2 to axis which is this this uh, column we are specifying it should be greater than 20 and g2 to g6 which is the salary column and we are specifying the condition to be greater than 40,000. so based on this two things it will check and perform if these conditions are uh, met then it will give the desired result okay so this is the function that is used in excel if function okay the next thing is sum if function okay again the sum if function adds the cell value specified by a given condition or a criteria so you are giving a condition and you are actually doing another function which is performing the addition okay it will add the cell values based on a condition again it is shown here 
the total sum of salary where salary is greater than 75,000. Again, for example, the salary column is G2 to G6 and we are doing a sum if function. What the result will be? It will perform the addition of salaries which are greater than 75,000. So, it will see which values are greater than 75,000 and then, then the, the output will be, it will be adding these salaries which are greater than 75,000. Okay. Now, coming to the next uh, slide, we will discuss uh, another important function, counter, and we will find the data um, result based on the data that we have and the counter function. So, we have a slide, uh, the data here, and using the COVID data, find the number of days in which the number of deaths in Italy has been greater than 200. Okay, it's not uh, shown here for some reason, but I will show you in the Excel sheet. Okay, so this is the data that we have and we will try to find the function. So, we will use the counter function and counter function is again simple counter. You are specifying the column that is the uh, source that you are looking for that is G2, the column G and it is 2. It starts from 2, row 2, G2 till G3577 which is the end of the column. And what you are looking for is Italy, you are specifying it in quotes. Italy and then the next column that it will look for is the E column, the number of cases. Okay, here we have the number of cases E22. Again, we are specifying the range and what we are looking for is number of cases which are more than 20. So, we will perform this function and it will show you the output. Okay, I will show you to you in the Excel. So, here is the sheet and I will uh, try to get the answer here and uh, the so we are performing count f okay count f and we are giving the brackets parenthesis g2 which is the countries column okay countries column here we are specifying the whole range three five triple seven it is basically uh, a long a long list of uh, data and you are specifying the range and what you are looking for is particularly uh, any country you can pick up like uh, Algeria okay Algeria and you specify it in quotes okay comma then what is the next target that you are looking for is the column E where is it is mentioning the number of cases okay so you specify the column range for the number of cases which is again e and then uh, the three five triple seven i mean it's a basically a long list of data that you're looking for and then you are what is the condition that you want to know and you have to specify it in quotes and what you're looking for is number of cases which are more than can you hit enter Okay, so it gives you the output as 143. So there are 143 days in which the number of cases were more than 20. So let's uh, refine our search further. Let's see 30 and it gives 140. Uh, so another example that you can take is let's pick Afghanistan. Afghanistan and hit. So there are 119 days that. Uh, you will see the number of cases were more than 30 and this can be done with the count if function. So the next question is uh, about the pivot table. So what is a pivot table? It basically is a summary of table of the data set. I mean the data that is there that can be you know multiple number of rows and columns which has different uh, data that has to be uh, that is there in the reports and you need to analyze those trends and you need to create a report and basically present it to the management or in a presentation so pivot table is a summary of table you know whatever data is there you can put it in a summarized format they are useful if you have long rows or column that hold values you need to track okay so you have long list of data and you need to summarize it and put it in a uh, presentation or a 
you need to track the values. So it's very simple. You have to select the data and then go to the insert tab and select pivot table. Okay. And then it will show up like this. And you need to uh, select the table, which is a uh, table or range. And then you need to specify where you want to put up this pivot table. Okay. And it's quite simple. And I can show it to you in one of the examples. Okay. So what you need to do is you need to select this and once you generate or as we have seen in the previous slide, you need to select this and you need to uh, select the output where you want to put the pivot table. And then once you do that, you will see something like this and you need to select these particular fields and put it in value. So it will, for example, you need to select the death number of death. You can just simply say, click this, select this, drag and drop it in the values. Okay. So these are the different fields that can be put up in the table. Okay. We can show it to you in the example here. So this is our data and we need to say, show it in a pivot table. Okay. Select this and then go to the insert tab and click pivot table. Okay. Select that and it will show you the uh, table or the range and now where you want to put it okay i will put it in the existing worksheet okay and i'll just select which color i'll put it here for example and it will show you this and click okay so this is the table and now you need to select the fields that you want to show in the table for example we need to see the continents the number of cases as per the continents okay i selected and put it in the row and we see the immediately we see it in a table where you see the number of names of the continents and now i want to see the number of cases and i simply select it and put it across in the value so this is quite simple and very informative very short and crisp form of presenting the data in a pivot table okay so this is how it is being used and it is being presented. You just need to go to the insert tab, pivot table and it will generate the table and then you can select the fields. All right. So the next question here is uh, how do we create a drop down list in Excel? This is particularly useful when you need to sort uh, particular data with the drop down list where a number of uh, different variables are there and you need to select one particular uh, field and sort the data so you can do this by creating a drop down list using the data validation option presenting the data tab it's quite simple you select the data and you go to the data validation tab in the data and click select data validation so once you select that, it will ask you to specify a range. So you need to select what data you need to sort and put a drop down. So you need to select this and click data validation and you select the list option, which shows you that there is a different option. Okay. I'll show it across in the Excel. For example, what we have here is uh, some particular data and we have different uh, variables. We need to sort or put a drop down list. So just go to data as in, as said in the slides and go to data validation and click data validation. Now, as you click it, it will ask you to data validation settings. Okay. And in the drop down, go and select list option. So it will ask you to specify the source. So when you ask uh, to specify the source, just click this particular column and click OK. So here, I'm mentioning the source is column B, okay, B3, T, B14, okay, click OK, and then it will give you the option. So here, you can, uh, you can put this in anywhere across the Excel and click the option, okay. So this is the way to drop down using the data validation option. So in the next example, we will see, so how do we apply advanced filters in Excel? You, we use the advanced filter option present in the data tab. So this is the scenario wherein you have multiple set of data 
and you need to sort it and it's, it's actually huge data and you need to sort a particular column or a field with this criteria and you can select it and specify the criteria and specify a range what you want to uh, select or based on what criteria the range can be specified and you can just get it in a single click so this is the option you have to go to data tab advanced and you have to apply the advanced filter and then you need to specify the list range that is the basically the source and then the criteria wherein you specify the criteria present here i mean you are specifying in this case we will take an example wherein we are trying to sort the data or the number of cases based on number of deaths and in a particular country and we are specifying the output we the copy to field is the output where you will see the output so i'll show it to you in the excel so here we have a spreadsheet wherein you will see all the uh, data covid data that we have and based on the countries and the continents and the number of deaths number of cases and so on okay and it's also as different fields like the date uh, year and month and all so so here i am going to sort the data which is particularly for europe and which has deaths of more than 200 in a day so how do we do it go to data advanced and the you need to select copy to another location okay and this is the list range so it's basically given in this countries okay and the criteria range you have to specify this so i am going to select this as my criteria okay and then i have to put the output in one particular cell so i need to select it again let's say here okay and then i just click okay see it's quite simple instead of running through the whole thing we can just do it with a simple function okay so it shows me the deaths which are more than 200 and for which particular country and for which particular uh, continents all right so this is basically made very simple with this option the next question is uh, you know you need to highlight some particular cells using a particular uh, criteria in this case we are trying to analyze or highlight those cells where the total sales is more than five thousand dollars so what we do is we use conditional formatting to highlight the cells based on the criteria it's a very useful tool in analyzing data and visually it helps you know you can have a look at the data in quick flash you will see the data and it's quite visible using the conditional formatting so how we do that is i will show it to you now so as said in the slide we have the data of the sales that is provided to us and we need to see who has done more sales which is greater than the five thousand dollars so just go to home and you need to say go to conditional formatting so for that you need to highlight or select this go home conditional formatting highlight okay and you have different options here you select greater than and you specify the value I here my criteria is five thousand dollars okay we can select which color so let's go for green okay see this you will immediately see the option you don't have to dig or look in deep into the data and find out which one is more than five thousand or any particular value okay so conditional formatting now moving on to the next question the index and match function you must be familiar with the index and match function and why it is used basically index uh, function is a very powerful tool wherein you know you for example you have a table of uh, planets in our solar system and you want to get the name of the fourth planet mars so you can do it with a formula using the index function and at the same time you can use the match function okay with the match function together you can play wonders with it okay match function is another uh, function that is designed to find the position of an item in a range for example you can use the match function to get the position of a word 
or uh, look or in this case uh, we have a name and we can use the index and match function to find the city how we do that is shown here okay it uh, it looks quite complicated here when you see the formula but uh, i can show it to you in the excel and explain it further okay so here i have and i want to know where these people are and where they belong to okay so let's see how it goes uh, we have seen it and we use the index function okay index okay now when i have to specify the range okay so the range is a2 and it shows it selects the name and i want to select it from a2 to a7 okay e7 sorry e called e7 okay so as you see it highlights the whole table okay now what i'm going to do is i want to match it okay match it with a condition i am i am specifying a condition a10 why because i have to specify a name here and it will show me the city where he belongs to okay where it shows is a2 okay if you see a2 it shows the name through a7 i have to specify the range here okay not just one name we are specifying the whole range as you see if you put the values it will show you the selection okay it's in and what it should be it should be the exact match so zero denotes the exact match parenthesis closed and i am putting another match condition okay what is this and this will give me the output what output is okay b9 okay this is my city b9 is the city where i'm trying to find from okay and what it should look for is a column a a1 through e1 okay it should select these this particular row and what it should be it should be the exact match again okay let's see how it goes it will give you an error because you haven't put the value here okay so let's see Andrew, okay, hit enter and you will see the city where he belongs to, okay. Now let's see where Anna belongs to. Enter and it shows Dallas, okay. So this is the one other function, index and match function being used, and it can be asked in frequently in the interview questions. Okay, the next question will be uh, how to find duplicate values in a column, okay. There are two ways that you can actually do this and uh, one is uh, basically the very simple one which is the conditional formatting and the other one is we have seen this before count if function okay how we do that you need to simply select the data and go to conditional formatting and select duplicate values and it's quite simple and there is another way which give you the color coded uh, conditional formatting Okay, and there is another way which is the count if function. How we do that is again the you have to put another column and put up a count if criteria, count if function, wherein you see that you are specifying the range and the the value which is being twice or enter duplicate, and you have to put up a condition. I'll show it to you in the X. So here we have the data and i need to find the duplicate values here so i just select this and as i said it's quite simple go to conditional formatting form and then go to conditional formatting and select highlight cell rules and simply go down and select the duplicate values okay it will give you which color you want you can simply select red or anything as you see the moment you select you will see the duplicate values highlighted okay so I just cancel this and there is another way then count a function so I'll put another column where it says duplicate names and I will put up a count a function here okay so let's see how a count a function works here to check the or find the duplicate name 
So as I said, I will put up a formula a uh, function here for the count if and we'll drag it to other cells. Okay, count if and uh, uh, since it's an absolute uh, reference, I have to put up a dollar symbol. Okay, my reference here it will be H the column here H two. Okay, and again dollar because I'm using it as an absolute reference colon through dollar symbol again nine okay so it drags till at the whole it drags till the all the names okay the h9 all right and then what i'll do is i'll put a comma in why i want to do is i have to select h2 okay this is my criteria i mean it is repeating twice all right and i have to close the parenthesis and if it is more than one okay so this is my formula i just put enter and it should say true so this is the condition and it is true okay i simply drag it the whole thing and whether events is uh, repeated yes it's true andrew it's a duplicate entry false emmy is a duplicate entry and it says true and as you see emmy and events are duplicate entries so this is how we use the countif function and the conditional formatting to sort duplicate entries in the data now let's move on to the uh, last question for the beginner level and since we have duplicate entries there is also a problem to remove duplicate entries so how can you remove duplicate values in a range of cells okay to simply do that you can delete the duplicate values in a column by simply selecting the highlighted cells and press the delete button so you go in each column and you see the duplicate values select it and delete it okay and this is one tedious way of doing it and you can also after deleting the values you can go to the conditional formatting choose clear rules to remove the rules from the sheet so this is one way okay the next thing is again a simple button that is there in the data tab that is the uh, is one of the tools present in the data tab which is simply called as remove duplicates it's quite simple and it's there in the data tools let me show you in the example so here we are and uh, we have this data and we need to check and remove the duplicate. So as I said, go to the data tab and simply click on remove duplicates. And when you click on it, it will ask you, you want to continue or expand the selection. I just say continue with the current selection and remove duplicates. Okay. Select all. Click. Okay. Two duplicate entries that were removed. Previously, we saw that events and uh, and over there, ME were there, so that has been removed. Okay, so that's it for the beginner level, and we'll go to the intermediate level in the next slides. Choose from over 300 in demand skills and get access to 1000 plus hours of video content for free. Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. So here we are at the intermediate level questions and these are like uh, higher level or intermediate level compared to the previous things that we have discussed with the basic level questions uh, for the Excel interview. So let's move on to the next thing. And so there are, there are some scenarios where you enter the date or uh, some dates in particular data sheet and you need to find out what is the day of the week okay so you might be asking a question how do you find out the day of a week for a particular date so that is the function we, we have a specific function and that is the weekday function to find out the day of the week for a particular date okay so as we know these are the seven days of the week and we just put the function as it says equals to weekday and we need to enter the column or the area or the cell address here so weekday is the function and it will give you the which which day it is of the week okay 
week um, as it says one it denotes sunday okay and three is again tuesday okay so this is the function that is used to find the day of the week so now we move on to the next one and there is a there might be a question what are the wild cards available in excel so basically excel supports three types of wild card which are uh, asterisk the star it represents any number of characters it can be used in different formulas and all like multiplication and all so it represents any number of characters okay the next one next wild card is the question mark it represents one single character okay you just need to memorize this in the back of your mind that it represents one single character okay whereas asterisk is uh, it represents any number of characters and the third one which is rarely used in excel it is the tilde it is used to identify a wild card character that is uh, tilde asterisk question marks in the text okay and it is very rarely used so do you need to memorize these three things that the, there are three types of wild cards we can see the functions of these in the later sessions okay the, the next one is uh, we have a question here what is the data validation illustrate with an example you might be asked this question and you have to know what is data validation what is what is it used for and you, you should know how to set up in an example okay data validation is a feature in excel that is used to control what a user can enter into a cell okay so you have with the data validation you are not allowing a data kind of data that should be input in the cell okay for example you have the authority uh, by setting up the data validation that you can enter either a number or a text or, or just a number and so on okay using the data validation and where is it available it is in the data tab okay select data validation option present under data tools okay and you just need to select the particular cells where you want to set up the data validation i'll show it to you in an example so this is how it looks like you just need to go to data tools and click on data validation and it will show you and you have the options here allow and if you click on the drop down you will see different options like i will show it to you in the example here okay for this particular thing if i want you know a, this column should have only names and it should have if you insert a number you will be thrown with an error okay you will get an error message saying that this is not a valid option okay so there are some uh, columns where you have to put only names or you have to put only numbers so you can set this up with the data validation technique okay you just allow it or customize it as per your requirement so this is how it looks like when you set up an error so here we have set up a data validation saying that it should not allow you to put any text okay so you will get an error when you put a number here the value does not match data validation restrictions defined for this cell okay so here as an example i have some data where i am putting the names here and i'll put the salary here i want to make sure that you know we cannot enter any numbers here okay it should be only text it should have only name so how do i perform that how do i restrict any user to that they should not be able to enter any number and you should only enter the text okay so there is a function okay so you just need to go to data validation click data validation and here in the settings i'll go to custom there are different options here you can you can choose whole numbers decimal list date time so you are, these are the options and i go to custom and i'm giving a particular formula here okay what is that it should be only text okay so it's a simple thing it should be text and i need to define the range okay so how i'll define the range i just select this okay and i select the range okay so i have selected the range here and if you go to input message and error alert you can customize it and here we are taking the default one and this is the input message if you want to set or customize something okay 
So let's see how it works. Okay, I have said this and then I try to put a number here and it throws me an error. The value you entered is not valid because we have set a restriction. A user has restricted values that can be entered into the cell. So this is how the data validation works. Okay, the next thing is uh, you will be given a situation wherein you have to uh, you will be given data and you have to uh, perform a function like uh, in this example we are taking a condition wherein you will have data and you have to specify the result based on the data you have to formulate it. Okay, so given below is a student table. Write a function to add pass or fail to the results column based on the following criteria. You will be given a criteria. So this is the student table. You are given the student names marks and attendance and then based on that you will have to specify a next uh, a, a formula wherein you will see the result okay based on the past uh, student data you have to put a pass fail results in the column based on the following criteria what is the criteria and for example here in this example what they're saying is uh, you have to say this the student is passed if his marks is more than 60 and the attendance is more than 75 percent okay so how we perform this function as it says you have to use the if function and check with the and condition to fill the results column okay so let's see this in the example here so here is the example and we will perform the if function and check with the and function so how we do that is here okay so I have to put the if function here, okay, and check with the and function, okay, and I have to specify the conditions. I have to specify where it should see the or check the conditions, okay. So we are checking the conditions here and the marks should be in row, I mean the column U and it starts with U5. So let's see u5 okay it will immediately go to column u and 5 row 5 okay and then what is the condition we are satisfying here it should be greater than 60 okay and the other condition is uh, the column v that is uh, the attendance column okay and what is the condition we are specifying v5 should be greater than 75 okay and we just close this conditions with the parenthesis and now we have to specify the result whether it is pass or fail pass comma in quotes again fail okay so let's see how this works okay okay see this works okay the marks is 50 and attendance is greater than 80. So he is uh, failed because his marks are 50. His attendance must be more than 75. But yes, he is. He has not scored marks more than 60. So we drag the same formula to the whole thing and you will see the result. Okay. This is quite simple and you will see this formula and using the if and check. And check with and condition okay now moving on to the next uh, question you might be asked to you know this is a simple function wherein you can you will be asked to calculate your age in years from the current date okay so how we do that there is a particular function and it's very simple use the year frac or dated if function to return the number of whole days between start date and the end date so you specify a start date which will be uh, today's date and the I mean the birthday and then the end day will be today's date for example okay and you will get to know the age using the year frac function and dated if function okay so here is a small example and this is how we use the year frac function okay you specify this uh, function and then specify the input dates, that is the today's date and the date of birth and the uh, today's date okay and this is one of the ways to get it and there is also dated f okay 
this again it is dated a function and you specify the input cells okay so let me show you an example for the same so here we are and uh, we have today's date that is 4th of may and date of birth for anything it could be so i will specify the year frac function okay equals year frac okay and then i should as soon as you enter you specify the start date and the end date okay and i will specify the start date as today's date that picks the column and then i put the comma and then the end date should be this thing okay and just close it and it will give you the age okay so this is the age for example if you want to find out my age i don't want to reveal my birthday but it's okay okay let's see if it calculates i'm 32 years old okay all right so this is one of the ways and similarly you can use the dated if function shown in the example all right now moving on to the next uh, question you have uh, nested if statements this is very important and you will definitely be uh, coming across this question how are nested if statements used in excel what are nested if statements the if function can be nested. I mean, it can be looped when we have multiple conditions to meet. Okay, it can be nested. The false value is replaced by another if function. Okay, you have specified some condition and you are uh, putting up a condition, and if that condition is not there or not met, then if it will be re replaced with another if function. So. Uh, the syntax uh, will be like this below is an example so we actually we use two if statements in conjunction okay so here is an example here we are specifying a condition wherein you know uh, the result is excellent if it is more than 80 and if it is less than 60 it is bad or average so this is very simple you are perform one if condition and if that is not met it will go for the next if condition so we are nesting two if conditions we are joining two if statements okay uh, i'll show the same example here in the excel so here we are we have some data and the students and their marks okay and we are specifying a condition wherein uh, if the result or marks are more than 80 the result is excellent and if it is less than 60 it is bad or average okay so how we get this is we use two if conditions if statements so uh, as we have seen it if if now the first condition is uh, our source or the source is b two okay so b two and what i'm specifying is it is, should be greater than 80 all right i just close this and the result should be excellent okay excellent if it is more than 80 and if this condition is not met it will go to the next if statement okay we are nesting another if statement what is the condition here for the next statement it will check b2 is less than or equal to 60 you can specify any marks all right so if it is less than 60 it should give the result as bad or average okay specify anything and you okay and just close the double parenthesis so let's see how it works okay see it works like this now let's pull up the same formula uh, the for the other results okay see if it is more than 90 it is 90 it is excellent so it is checking the first thing if it is greater than 80 it is excellent okay and now in this case for mark it is bad why because it will first see whether it's excellent or not if it is not excellent then it will check the 
other condition if it is less than 60 it will give you the bad result all right and similarly so on for the other marks all right so this is how we use the nested if statements you are adding two if statement the first condition and the second condition with another if statement okay okay when it comes to excel it is basically involves a lot of data and a lot of data to be analyzed and we have uh, some powerful tools which uh, are used in excel to analyze the data one such uh, important tool is descriptive statistics that is used to analyze the data so we might come across a question and you will be given a data or a table and you need to find the descriptive statistics of the columns using data analysis tool okay so you will be given a, maybe for example anything and you will have a lot of data you have to use the descriptive statistics option in excel for the data analysis okay how you do that is you have to add a pack okay you should be knowing that you need to add a pack which is called the analysis tool pack which you go to uh, file options and then just click on the add-in and select the analysis tool pack click uh, excel add-in and just click go then it will add the option and then when you select the data you have to go to the click on the data analysis option which will be which will show up when you select the add-in or when you add the add-in okay and then you need to select the descriptive statistics what we need to do is we need to analyze this data and it will show you the values like mean and the you can also customize you can you see you have this data and for you to check each and every row and find the mean the smallest the uh, maximum number and things like that so this can be easily done using the descriptive statistics for the data analysis uh, i'll show the same thing in the excel how it can be performed so here we are and i'll show you first how to add the option to it okay go to add and select analysis tool pack as shown in the slide and you need to click go if you just click okay it will not add so just click go and then you need to select analysis tool pack okay it will give you these are the different options uh, for now we are selecting analysis tool pack and then click okay as soon as you do that you will see the data analysis this option gets enabled when you add that pack so this is the data that you have you need to find or analyze using the descriptive statistics so as you see it click data analysis and click uh, select descriptive statistics okay and it will show up the option like this and you need to select the input range okay for some reason it's already there and if you want me to show i will show it to you across you have to select the whole data okay this is my input range and you need to select this labels in the first row so that you know it doesn't take the first row okay i'll show you okay and now i'm putting the output in another worksheet okay you can specify or you can press by a new worksheet and these are the options that you can select so you can you are getting a summary statistics which is the default and you can select the confidence level that is the mean value and you can set it up by whatever value percentage you want and you are selecting the largest one and the smallest number so all these data will get analyzed and it will open up in a new sheet and just click ok and you will see this so these are the if you see this is our data paid organic social and revenue so this is uh, uh, okay make it more precise okay so with a single click the, all our data is analyzed okay this is the mean value and this is the minimum is zero maximum is certain set this is the total and the number of counties thousand so you don't need to scroll down and check what is the largest uh, amount that is paid so this is the largest amount for the paid okay and so, so on so the largest revenue generated all these things are 
generated with a descriptive analysis okay descriptive statistics with a data analysis tool so the next question is about a pivot table and this is more refined or more uh, advanced uh, compared to the last one that we discussed in the uh, beginner level so here you are asked to create a pivot table to find the total cases in each country belonging to their respective continents you are giving you are being asked to uh, put up a table or pivot table with two variables basically each country and their respective continent so again we have the same data and we need to set up a pivot table which shows the continents and the countries with the respective continents the number of cases okay so let's see how we get this in the example so here we are we have the same data that shows the days months year cases countries and their continents okay continents here and so on okay so i am i'll go to the insert tab and select the pivot table okay again the same thing i will be asked to enter a input range okay so i select this and since it's huge i'll just put the number to be seven 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 okay let's assume now this is our input data and uh, where you want the output to be it's already selected you can put it anywhere i'm putting it here okay just click okay and it will give you the option to select the fields now what we want is number of cases okay which will show you the value and the countries and territories their respective continents so okay so this is how it looks like and we have to check now it is asking us to find the countries okay so with their respective continents you see this you see africa as a continent and you will see okay you will see africa if you just remove this you will see the number of con i mean the cases with the uh, respective continents and if you want to include these countries territories with their respective continents you will see as such if you just expand this you will see the countries that are having the cases in the continent africa okay so country wise sorted with the continents okay this is the other advanced step to get the data or show the data in the pivot table okay another question that you might be asked this is a basic uh, and we have already seen this in the previous example that i have shown how do you provide the dynamic range in data source of a pivot table you have to select a particular data source in your input table uh, for, to show up in the pivot table so you have to select the input range but how do you create or how do you create a provide a dynamic range in this data source so just need to create a name table to provide a dynamic range so where is the data of your table so as we have seen in the previous example you will be able to select the input range and you just need to put this value any number so that you know it will pick up the dynamic range for your input source for the table okay so now we move on to the next one and this is it about about the pivot table again is it possible to create pivot table using multiple sources of data yes yes you can create a pivot table from multiple worksheets sometimes you will have different data in different sheet can you create a pivot table for all the worksheet in a single pivot table yes you can but there is a condition there should be a common row in both the tables so you cannot have different types of data there should be a common row okay so then only it will act as a primary key for the first table and the foreign key for the second table okay so this is something that you have to remember and you need to create a relationship between the tables and then build the pivot table so you have to analyze what kind of data it is it should have a common row in both the tables on both the sheet and then you have to establish a relationship between this table and then build the table okay there is a visit for that well see that later now let's move on to the next question so the next question is again you know with the pivot table uh, 
wherein you will be asked to further refine or uh, you know refine your search and show it in the data so here we have with the covid uh, data example again you will be asked to create a pivot table to find the top three countries from each continent based on the total cases using the covid data. again uh, we have done this before we have created a pivot table for this and we need to further refine it showing the top three countries with the number of cases and i will show that same thing in the excel and we already have created a table and we'll refine it further to show the top three countries which are having the highest number of counts in the respective continents. so here we are we have the uh, table uh, already with us and i just click on the show field list it will show me the countries and territories what we are asked is you know to show the countries with the top three that is number of cases so you just need to go here and you need to select the value filter there is a filter which you can select with the value and now i select top 10 and what i need is top three it's very simple and you just need to know these things okay and based on the number of cases okay this is our field already then just click ok and it will show you the top three countries so it's quite simple and it is very important to know this uh, field and how you play with the value of the filters for each particular uh, field in the pivot table so it shows you these things all right and now you can refine it further with the continents and all okay so different continents and you can see this so you go there and there is a value filter you can set up all right we have set up a value filter okay okay now there is another one how do you create a column in a pivot table okay like you will be given a situation where you need to add one more column and show it in the pivot table with a particular calculation or with a particular value and you have you don't have that actual value in your uh, data but you have to calculate it and show it across in the table so there is another option which is called pivot table analyze and you need to create a calculated field from pivot table analyze option so when you go to your table and then go to pivot table analyze you will see the option to add a calculated field okay just go there and click select calculated field and you need to define so in this example we are going to define another column where we calculate the bonus of the sales and there is a particular formula the formula is you put an if and a statement and then you calculate the formula you specify what is the bonus and what is the way that you are calculating the bonus and it will particularly add it another column to your table so let's see how we do that in the table act so here we are we have this uh, table and i have inserted a, a pivot table and i am putting it in output here okay and then you will get the table okay now you need to select the customer name and the unit sold unit price sales okay so we'll add another column to it how we do that is this go to pivot table tools and then you go to analyze okay click on field items and set okay we need to select calculated field here select that and we are defining a new field here which is the bonus bonus and as i said we will put up a formula for this and we will define it how we calculate the bonus okay with an if and statement which we have seen before how we uh, put up a and if and statement okay now i'm going to say it as a like this sales my sales should be i'll specify a condition how they will calculate the bonus if sales is greater than 4000 and the unit sold okay i am trying to put it as a, the unit sold it also depends on the units sold is greater than 
thousand okay for example let's say thousand a person who is uh, able to do uh, sales of thousand uh, four thousand and the unit sold should be more than thousand then the sales what is this the bonus will be sales into that is the amount of uh, sales he has done into five percent okay let's say five percent bonus and sales is if it is two percent okay okay we are adding this field bonus and click add okay so we have added this and we have put up a calculation for the formula and you will see this in the so this is a simple way of adding the column to your existing data and we are doing the calculations and showing it up okay so this is one way go to pivot table analyze and field items and sets you can select this option and add it okay you can customize this as i said with adding different fields this is pretty handy in analyzing the data which does not exist in the table and you add some value to your pivot table okay the next uh, question will be about slicer you must be familiar with what a slicer is in a pivot table and how do you use it what are the purpose of using it and how do you put up a slider in the pivot table so how does a slicer work basically slicers are used to further filter data in the pivot table suppose you already have some data and it's for ease that you can do it by just adding a slicer you can select particular uh, data in or a field and you can see the output for that particular field that you have chosen in the slicer okay so it's very simple go to the insert tab and select slicer under filters okay and then it will be like this okay and here if for example you see this is our pivot table we have added two slicers to filter our table that is month and countries and territory so this will be the general pivot table that looks like and we have an added another two slicers that is month and country so if you go uh, for example if you want to see what is the number of cases and some of the deaths for a particular month and for a particular country you can just do it by a single click and it will show that particular data only in the table let's see and do this in our excel okay so there is a table or uh, pivot table already created for this and i want to add a slicer so how do i go ahead and do this is i go to the options and insert slicer okay at the moment you click on it you will see what are the options that you want to add you can select different fields and uh, select the slicer for it uh, for this example we are choosing month okay this is one of our sliders you can just put it here adjust into the and again this will be our slider okay let's add another slicer here okay and this will be the countries and territories okay click on that and you will see two simple badges here that you can choose from so if i want to know in the month of feb how many number of cases were there for particular let's see the moment i choose the month it will show that particular number of uh, the corresponding table for the whole and now i want to further refine it to a particular country so for example australia okay so there were total number of 18 cases and zero deaths at the same time if i go for algeria it is like this so as you see it goes like this okay so this is one of the very important tool that you can use to show the data in a much simplified manner and ease okay so the next question is about the pivot table again what is the percentage of contribution of each country and continents to the total cases again the same example for our code the covid one and this time we want to show the output as the percentage of contribution for 
each country and continents to the total cases. So we have the same data and we generate a pivot table and we should show it as the sum of the cases uh, to be percentage. Okay. And uh, this is how we do it. This is our uh, data and I'm going to create a pivot table for this. Okay, so it shows the table and uh, here I have to show what is the fields that we need to select. Okay, for ease we are just selecting the cases and the countries and territories. Okay, so cases to be the values. okay so this is how it looks like now when i see okay, let me show it to you see the, it shows the number of cases now if i just want to refine it further and see it as number of percentage percentage as the number of cases okay so how i do it show field list i go here and i go to value field settings okay then again the number format show the value as okay sorry show the value as you need to select this thing percentage of grand total and then just click okay and you will see this to be the percentage so it shows the data in the form of percentage okay this is very simple and you just need to remember as we have seen before show field and then value field settings okay this is the thing that you need to check okay grand percentage there are other options also and you can select from whatever you want to but in this case we are showing it to be the percentage okay okay guys now the next question is about uh, an, uh, a very important aspect of presentation when we come to pivot charts how do you create a pivot chart in pivot tables this is very basic or very you know important aspect of pivot tables that you can represent uh, data in a in a form of a chart and there are different types of charts which i'll show it to you in the uh, example okay so we have a data here and we want to show it at in, a, in right now it is in a tabular form okay we have uh, put up a pivot table for this and now if the same thing can be put up in a pivot chart okay so what you need to do go is uh, go to the insert tab and select the pivot chart it depends on different versions of excel that you have different uh, forms or different buttons so i will show it across to you and this is how it looks like okay it's very simple it can be a pie chart it can be a bar chart it can be different forms and we can see that in the example here okay so let's go to the example and so we have the uh, pivot table generated here already what you need to do is you need to select the table and go to insert and see the options there are there is a column chart there is a line chart there is pie bar area scattered and other parts Okay, there are different forms okay so right now what we do is we will select the column chart here okay you need to select the pivot table and click on the column chart again there are different forms which uh, can be seen uh, in some time now so this is the basic form okay and it will show you the countries I mean the and it will show it as a form of a chart okay again you can change the chart type you can change it to pi okay this personally is very good in presenting or doing presentation and you can select different forms different styles okay it will also show you the percentage so this is one form of presenting your table into a chart okay again bar type is also there 
So uh, this uh, won't suit here in our example. There are different ones. I'm just showing it to you as how it looks like. So depending on your, uh, um, I mean the aesthetic, you can see and select what kind of chart is best suitable. Okay. So this is how you put up a pivot chart in pivot tables. Okay. So this is when last for the intermediate level and uh, what are macros in Excel? Create a macro to automate a task. Basically, you have some daily tasks that you perform in Excel. Okay. And you can do this with quite ease using the macros. Okay. It basically is a program that resides within the Excel file and it is used to automate tasks in Excel. Some daily tasks that you run, like run uh, when you come across in any data, and you have to scrub that data, and you do some daily routines, and by removing some columns or adding some formulas, and you know, do, doing some adding some colors and changing the fonts or be it anything that you perform, and you have to do a repetitive task. So all that can be done by recording a macro and this is what macro is used for in Excel. So how you capture those steps in Excel is through a macro. To record a macro you can either go to the developer tab in the Excel and click on record macro or you can use or access it from the view tab. Okay. So these are the uh, ways to access macros. Okay. Just go to the developer tab and click record macro wherein you know when you click record macro it will record the steps that you are performing in each step and it will capture that and you can save that it is like a daily routine that you run and you can do all these multiple steps maybe n number of steps within a single click by running that macro later on okay so you record a macro and run that okay you do it through the developer tab go to developer tab and click record macro and it records all the steps that you are performing okay you need to name it and you just need to perform the actions and it will record the macro and you just save it later on whenever you come across the same daily task that you run you can just click it by running that macro okay wow well, so in a single click it will perform all the actions that you have done or steps that you have performed on that particular excel sheet or any other excel sheet okay this is very handy when you have similar data and you do the similar task each day okay so this ends the intermediate level and in the next uh, we slides we will see the advanced level so now we discuss the advanced level uh, interview questions for excel and when it comes to the advanced level you will come across definitely you will be asked about what if analysis how does it work how does it or how does what if analysis work in excel so what if analysis as the name suggests uh, you have to have an analysis done okay with the help of different complex mathematical calculations like formulas and using different formulas and calculations you can experiment with the data and you can analyze if this particular input changes what will be the scenario how will your output turn out to be so as you can see uh, it is about different variables to see how your changes would affect the outcome of a situation so this is what uh, what if analysis is and the same thing can be done with excel and how it is done is you need to go to the data tab and click on the what if analysis under forecast okay so there are three options and one is the scenario manager goal c and the data table so these are the three situations or three tools which are available in the what if analysis in the data tab okay so goal c is basically for reverse calculations okay and you have some idea you have some set goal in mind and you have certain variables and what you need to do and what you 
need to achieve to have certain set goals okay you have you will set a value for the goal and with the goal seek option you can get to know what value you have to achieve to come to that level okay so this is what goal seek is it is one of the simplest sensitivity analysis tool and uh, so for example you know that you know a single outcome you would like to achieve like you have a set goal that you have to achieve this particular grade okay and the goal seek feature in excel allows you to arrive to that goal by mathematically adjusting a single variable within that equation so you set the goal and you will do the what if analysis goal seek uh, option to know what you have to do or what you have to achieve for the set goal the next option is the data table and it is basically uh, used for sensitivity analysis okay so in this uh, scenario you the data tables allow the adjustment of only one or two variables within a data set but uh, each variable can have unlimited number of possible values okay so basically they are uh, used for side by side comparisons in, it makes it very easy to read the scenarios okay one but you need to set up the uh, data table correctly okay and what you do is uh, you give the input in the table and then you set up the formula and for instance you need to calculate the monthly payments for a loan okay you provide the principal amount like uh, whatever amount you're taking two lakhs three lakhs and you set the interest rate in a formula okay and uh, you set the term in and then you need to uh, provide different uh, input options like what loan amount that you're taking and you set the formula and go to data table and I mean go to what if analysis and select the data table stretches across and then you will see the monthly payment options or the monthly EMI that you can calculate. There are different uh, things that you can calculate. You can calculate the target or the sales bonus or things like that. Okay, giving different scenarios in the variables. Okay, but you need to set up a data table. It might be a little challenging, but yes, it is a very powerful tool. Okay, so the next one is the scenario manager. It is uh, a bit more complicated compared to the other two but then it is uh, more advanced than goal seek as it allows you the uh, to adjust the multiple variables at the same time okay and uh, this is very complicated compared to the other two and it is even i mean it gives more better output when it compares to the other two what if analysis tools so here when you go to what if analysis and the scenario manager you have to select the data and provide different scenarios that is different values for each scenario and then it will create a it will analyze calculate and create different scenarios okay so it becomes very easy for you to analyze what if you are changing the value of your interest amount or the uh, term of loan or your targets like uh, monthly targets or an yearly targets and things like that and you just have to uh, see what the scenario will be when you set this particular value for a table or for data whatever targets that you need to set you can use this uh, what if analysis in excel for the different scenarios and different calculations okay these are very powerful tools and you need to know this now as we move on to the next one you might be asked what is the difference between a function and a subroutine in a VBA okay even though these two are used quite frequently there is a pretty much different from each other okay so a function always returns a value of the task it is performing okay so when you are uh, writing a module you will have a function when you have a function it will always give you a value okay for example you are performing an addition it uh, using the function it will give you a value for sure whereas subroutine it does not return a value of the task it is performing functions are called by a variable okay 
you can uh, set up a variable and you can call the function okay but a subroutines can be recalled from anywhere in the program in multiple times okay in many different ways you can recall a subroutine like we have uh, seen uh, we write a subroutine and we put up a button and we can when you click the button it will recall the subroutine functions are called by variable okay you have to set up a variable and when you enter it it will come up okay functions are used directly in spreadsheets as formulas whereas sub cannot be used directly in spreadsheets as formula okay this is very important difference and the next thing is uh, the functions can be used to perform repetitive tasks and return a value whereas users must insert a value in the desired cell before getting the result of the sub so this is particularly limited okay whereas functions can be used to perform different repetitive tasks and return a value user input is not required whereas if you see the subroutines user must insert a value okay in the desired cell that too in a particular cell which is defined in the subroutine to getting the desired result okay so these are the differences between functions and subroutines now the next one is uh, what is the difference between this workbook and active workbook in VBA? so when you work on modules and different excel spreadsheets and workbooks you will have these different workbooks open and there is a particular difference and you might be asked what is the difference between this workbook and active workbook so as the name suggests this workbook refers to the name of the workbook where the code is actually running from okay you are running a code vba code and it is the actual workbook where you are running the code from and that is this workbook okay and you have multiple spreadsheets open and you are working on particular suppose for example you are working on uh, sheet x okay and you active workbook is the workbook that is currently active from the different open workbooks you have different open workbooks but you are working on one particular uh, workbook and that is called the active workbook so this workbook is the refers to the name of the workbook where the code is actually written whereas active workbook is the one that is currently open currently active okay so this is the difference between this workbook and the active workbook in vba as shown in the example this is a simple uh, sub that is written a code that can be written to find out which workbook is the uh, uh, it which workbook is the uh, this workbook in the vba and the active workbook as well okay so this is a simple thing that you can run to determine okay it shows the active workbook and the this workbook okay so as we move on to the next one so this is the question how will you pass arguments to a vba function okay there are two ways basically arguments can be passed uh, to a vba function as a value or as a reference so this is uh, an example that you can see it is by reference the key word for this is by reference okay so when you are passing an argument by reference the keyword should be by ref whereas uh, by value you are specifying a value and the keyword is by val value okay so these are the two ways that you can pass an argument in vba so when you pass an argument by reference in a procedure the variable itself okay the variable itself is accessed by a procedure and it is to the location or the address in the memory okay the value of the variable is changed permanently by the procedure in this case all right okay so to pass an argument by reference you should use by ref that is the keyword before the argument okay so in this example it is clearly shown what is the keyword that is being used okay and by reference is the default in the vba unless you specify something else which in this case is by value okay and as i said the keyword for by value passing the argument by value is by val okay so when you set the keyword by val the variable uh, what happens is the by value argument function or argument uh, uh, is passed through by value okay the number function is called here which means it assigns a value to the variable x here okay because the variable was passed by value in the function any change to the value okay any change to the value of the variable 
is only the current function. So it ends after it performs the function. Okay. Then it revert back to the value when it is declared again, where it is set to zero. So if the variable has been passed by reference in the function, then the variable would have permanently assumed the new assigned value. So this is the basic difference by reference and by value. So now we move on to the next one. So there might be a question that you will be asked that uh, how do you find the last row or a column in a VBA? Okay. So to find a, a last row, sometimes you have long list of uh, data and it has like n number of rows and n number of columns. So instead of scrolling down all together to find the uh, last row, you can use this uh, VBA code. You can write this code. It's a very simple one and it will give you the last row. It will, you will find the last row with a single click. Okay. Let's see it in the VBA. So here I have a sheet which, uh, you know, it has long list of uh, rows and instead of scrolling down, I can just find out the last row with this VBA code. Okay. I just click on this and as seen in the slideshow, I have just written it and you will see the you just run it and you will see the number of rows it will give you the last row in the sheet okay similarly we can do this for the column as well okay in case if you have long list of or la large number of columns instead of scrolling right you can just uh, run this vba and you can see you can know the num last number of column okay number of columns so as we've seen in the last row now we'll see the code for the finding the last column is the same thing uh, instead of row you will see it as column all right and it will when you run it you will give the it will give you the last column okay and with that we have reached the end of the session on microsoft excel full course hope the session was informative and helpful should you find any queries or need any resources used in the session like the ppt source code project links then do let us know in the comment section below and our team of experts will be more than happy to help resolve all your queries at the earliest. Until next time, thank you, stay safe and keep learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.